Chapter One of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter One Jonathan Harker's Journal. Kept in shorthand. Third of May. Bistritz. Left Munich at 8.35pm on the 1st of May, arriving at Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at 6.46, but train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place, from the glimpse which I had got of it from the train and the little I could walk through the streets. I feared to go very far from the station, as we had arrived late and would start as near as the correct time as possible. The impression I had was that we were leaving the west and entering the east. The most western of splendid bridges over the Danube, which is here of noble width and depth, took us among the traditions of Turkish rule. We left in pretty good time and came after nightfall to Klosenburg. Here I stopped for the night at the Hotel Royal. I had dinner, or rather supper, a chicken done up in some way with red pepper, which is very good, but thirsty. Mem, get recipe for Mina. I asked the waiter and he said it was called Paprika Hendel and that it was a national dish. I should be able to get it anywhere along the Carpathia. I found my smattering of German very useful here indeed. I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having had some time at my disposal when in London, I had visited the British Museum and made search among the books and maps in the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country could hardly fall to have some importance in dealing with a nobleman of that country. I find that the district he named is in the extreme east of the country, just on the borders of three states, Transylvania, Moldavia and Bukovina. In the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I was not able to light on any map or work giving the exact locality of the Castle Dracula. And as there are no maps of this country, as yet to compare with our own Ordnance Survey maps, I found that Bistritz, the post town named by Count Dracula, is a fairly well known place. I shall enter here some of my notes as they may refresh my memory when I talk over my travels with Mina. In the population of Transylvania, there are four distinct nationalities, Saxons in the south, and mixed with them the Wallachs, who are the descendants of the Dacians, Magars in the west, and Szekles in the east and north. I'm again among the latter, who claim to be descended from Attila and the Huns. This may be so, for when the Magars conquered the country in the 11th century, they found the Huns settled in it. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathian, as if it were the centre of some sort of imaginative whirlpool. If so, my stay may be very interesting. Mem, must ask the Count all about them. I did not sleep well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night under my window which may have had something to do with it, or it may have been the paprika, for I had to drink up all the water in my carafe and was still very thirsty. Towards morning I slept and was awakened by the continuous knocking at my door, so I guessed I must have been sleeping soundly then. I had for breakfast more paprika, a sort of porridge of maize flour, which they said was mammaliga, an eggplant stuffed with force meat, a very excellent dish which they call Implitata. Mem, get this recipe also. I had to hurry breakfast, for the train started a little before eight, or rather it ought to have done so. After rushing to the station at 7.30, I had to sit in the carriage for more than an hour before we began to move. It seems to me that the further east you go, the more unpunctual are the trains. What ought they to be in China? All day long we seemed to dawdle through a country which was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw little towns or castles on the top of steep hills, such as we see in old missiles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams, 
which seemed from the wide stony margin on each side of them to be subject to great floods. It takes a lot of water and running strong to sweep the outside edge of a river clear. At every station there were groups of people, sometimes crowds, and in all sorts of attire. Some of them were just like the peasants at home, or those I saw coming through France and Germany, with short jackets and round hats and homemade trousers. But others were very picturesque. The women looked pretty, except when you got near them, but they were very clumsy about the waist. They had all full white sleeves of some kind or another, and most of them had big belts with lots of strips of something fluttering from them, like the dresses in a ballet. But of course there were petticoats under them. The strangest figures we saw were the Slovaks, who were more barbarian than the rest, with their big cowboy hats, great baggy dirty white trousers, white linen shirts and enormous heavy leather belts, nearly a foot wide, all studded over with brass nails. They wore high boots with their trousers tucked into them and had long black hair and heavy black moustaches. They are very picturesque but do not look prepossessing. On the stage they would be set down at once as some old oriental band of brigands. They are, however, I'm told, very harmless and rather wanting in natural self-assertion. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistritz, which is a very interesting old place, being practically on the frontier, where the Borgo Pass leads from it into Bukovina. It has had a very stormy existence, and it certainly shows the marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made terrible havoc on five separate occasions. At the very beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of three weeks and lost 13,000 people. The casualties of war proper being assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Krona Hotel, which I found to my great delight to be thoroughly old-fashioned, for of course I wanted to see all I could of the ways of the country. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door, I faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual peasant dress, white undergarment with long double apron, front and back, of coloured stuff fitting almost too tight for modesty. When I came close, she bowed and said, The Herr Englishman? Yes, I said, Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in a white shirt sleeves who had followed her to the door. He went, but immediately returned with a letter. My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. I'm anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow, the diligence will start for Bukovina. A place in it is kept for you. At the Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you and will bring you to me. I trust that your journey from London has been a happy one and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. 4th of May. I found that my landlord had got a letter from the Count directing him to secure the best place on the coach for me. But on making inquiries as to details, he seemed somewhat reticent and pretended that he could not understand my German. This could not be true, because up to then he had understood it perfectly. At least he answered my questions exactly as if he did. He and his wife, the old lady who had received me, looked at each other in a frightened sort of way. He mumbled out that the money had been sent in the letter, and that was all he knew. When I asked him if he knew Count Dracula and could tell me anything of his castle, both he and his wife crossed themselves and saying that they knew nothing at all simply refused to speak further. It was so near the time of starting that I had no time to ask anyone else, for it was all very mysterious and not by any means comforting. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room and said in a very hysterical way, Must you go? Oh, young hare, must you go? She was in such an excited state that she seemed to have lost her grip of what German she knew and mixed it all up with some other language which I did not know of at all. I was just able to follow her by asking many questions when I told her that I must go at once and that I was engaged on important business. She asked again, Do you know what day it is? I answered that it was the 4th of May. She shook her head as she said again, Oh yes, I know that, I know that, but do you know what day it is? On my saying that I did not understand, she went on, 
It is the eve of St George's Day. Do you not know that tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you know where you are going or what you are going to? She was in such evident distress that I tried to comfort her, but without effect. Finally she went down on her knees and implored me not to go, at least to wait a day or two before starting. It was all very ridiculous, but I did not feel comfortable. However, there was business to be done, and I could allow nothing to interfere with it. I therefore tried to raise her up, and said as gravely as I could, that I thanked her, but my duty was imperative, and that I must go. She then rose and dried her eyes, and taking a crucifix from her neck, offered it to me. I didn't know what to do, for as an English churchman I have been taught to regard such things as in some measure idolatrous. And yet it seemed so ungracious to refuse an old lady, meaning so well and in such a state of mind. She saw, I suppose, the doubt in my face, for she put the rosary round my neck and said, for your mother's sake, and went out of the room. I'm writing up this part of the diary whilst I'm waiting for the coach, which is, of course, late, and the crucifix is still round my neck. Whether it is the old lady's fear, or the many ghostly traditions of this place, or the crucifix itself, I do not know. But I am not feeling nearly as easy in my mind as usual. If this book should ever reach Mina before I do, let it bring my goodbye. Here comes the coach. 5th of May, the castle. The grey of the morning has passed, and the sun is high over the distant horizon, which seems jagged, whether with trees or hills, I know not for it is so far off that big things and little are mixed. I am not sleepy, and as I am not to be called till I awake, naturally I write till sleep comes. There are many odd things to put down, and let who reads them may fancy that I dined too well before I left Bistritz. Let me put down my dinner exactly. I dined on what they call robber steak, bits of bacon, onion and beef, seasoned with red pepper and strung on sticks and roasted over the fire, in the simple style of the London cat's meat. The wine was a golden madayash, which produces a queer sting on the tongue, which is, however, not disagreeable. I had only a couple of glasses of this and nothing else. When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken his seat, and I saw him talking with the landlady. They were evidently talking of me, for every now and then they looked at me and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door, which they call by a name, meaning word bearer, came and listened and looked at me, most of them pitying me. I could hear a lot of words often repeated, queer words, for there were many nationalities in the crowd. So I quietly got my polyglot dictionary from my bag and looked them out. I must say they were not cheering to me, for amongst them were Ore Dog, Satan, Poco, Hell, Stregoika, Witch, Rolock and Vilkosak, both of which mean the same thing, one being Slovak, the other Serbian, for something that is either werewolf or vampire, Mem, I must ask the Count about these superstitions. When we started, the crowd round the inn door, which had by this time swelled to a considerable size, all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He would not answer at first, but on learning that I was English he explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me, just starting for an unknown place, to meet an unknown man. But everyone seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful, so sympathetic, that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse at which I had of the inn yard and its crowd of picturesque figures, all crossing themselves as they stood round the wide archway, with its background of rich foliage of oelander and orange trees and green tubs clustered in the centre of the yard. And our driver, whose wide linen drawers covered the whole front of the box seat, got so they called them, cracked his big whip over the four small horses which ran abreast and we set off on our journey. I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly fears in the beauty of the scene as we drove along. 
Although I had learned the language, or rather languages, which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might not have been able to have thrown them off so easily. Before us lay a green sloping land full of forests and woods, with here and there steep hills crowned with clumps of trees, or with farmhouses, the blank gable end to the road. There was everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit blossom, apple, plum, pear, cherry, and as we drove by I could see the green grass under the trees, spangled with the fallen petals. In and out amongst these green hills of what they call here middle land, ran the road, losing itself as it swept round the grassy curve, or was shut out by the straggling ends of pine woods, which here and there ran down the hillside like tongues of flame. The road was rugged, but still we seemed to fly over it with a feverish haste. I could not understand then what the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time in reaching Borgo Prunes. I was told that this road in summertime is excellent, but that it had not yet been put in order after the winter snows. In this respect it is different from the general run of roads in the Carpathians, for it is an old tradition that they are not to be kept in too good order. Of the old hospitals would not repair them, lest the Turk should think that they were preparing to bring in foreign troops, and so hasten the war which was always really at loading point. Beyond the green swelling hills of the middle land rose mighty slopes of forest up to the lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves. Right and left of us they towered, with the afternoon sun falling full upon them, and bringing out all the glorious colours of this beautiful range. Deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where grass and rock mingled, and an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags. Till these were themselves lost in the distance, where the snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountains, through which as the sun began to sink, we saw now and again the white gleam of falling water. One of my companions touched my arm as we swept round the base of a hill and opened up the lofty snow-covered peak of a mountain, which seemed as we wound on our serpentine way to be right before us. Look, Istanzek, God's seat, and he crossed himself reverently. As we wound on our endless way, and the sun sank lower and lower behind us, the shadows of the evening began to creep round us. This was emphasised by the fact that the snowy mountain top still held the sunset, and seemed to glow out with a delicate cool pink. Here and there we passed Czechs and Slovaks, all in picturesque attire but I noticed that the goitre was painfully prevalent. By the roadside were many crosses. As we swept by, my companions all crossed themselves. Here and there was a peasant man or woman kneeling before a shrine, who did not even turn round as we approached, but seemed in the self-surrender of devotion to have neither eyes nor ears for the outer world. There were many things new to me, for instance, hayricks in the trees, and here and there very beautiful masses of weeping birch, their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of the leaves. Now and again we passed a lighter van, the ordinary peasant's cart, with its long snake-like vertebrae calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On this were sure to be seated a group of homecoming peasants, the Czechs with their white and the Slovaks with their coloured sheepskins, the latter carrying lance fashion their long staves with axe at end. As the evening fell, it began to get very cold, and the growing twilight seemed to merge into one dark mistiness, the gloom of the trees, oak, beech and pine. Though in the valleys which ran deep between the spurs of the hills, as we ascended through the pass, the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of late-lying snow. Sometimes as the road was cut through the pine woods that seemed in the darkness to be closing down upon us, great masses of greyness, which here and there bestrewed the trees, produced a peculiarly weird and solemn effect, which carried on the thoughts and grim fancies engendered earlier in the evening, when the falling sunset threw into strange relief the ghost-like clouds, 
which amongst the Carpathians seemed to wind ceaselessly through the valleys. Sometimes the hills were so steep that despite our driver's haste, the horses could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up them as we do at home, but the driver would not hear of it. No, no, he said, you must not walk here. The dogs are too fierce. And then he added with what he evidently meant for grim pleasantry, for he looked round to catch the approving smile of the rest, and you may have enough of such matters before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was a moment's pause to light his lamps. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement among the passengers, and they kept speaking to him one after another, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed his horses unmerciful with his long whip, and with wild cries of encouragement urged them on to further exertions. Then through the darkness, I could see a sort of patch of grey light ahead of us, as though there was a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more level and we appeared to fly along. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side and to frown down upon us. We were entering on the Borgo Pass. One by one, several of the passengers offered me gifts which they pressed upon me with an earnestness which would take no denial. These were certainly of an odd and varied kind, but each was given in simple good faith, with a kindly word and a blessing and that strange mixture of fear-meaning movements which I had seen outside the hotel at Bistris, the sign of the cross and the guard against the evil eye. Then, as we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers, craning over the edge of the coach, passed eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or expected. But though I asked each passenger, no one would give me the slightest explanation. The state of excitement kept on for some little time, and at last we saw before us the pass opening out onto the eastern side. There were dark rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy oppressive sense of thunder. It seemed as though the mountain range had separated two atmospheres, and now we had got into the thunderous one. I was now myself looking out for the conveyance which was to take me to the count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of lamps through the blackness, but all was dark. The only light was the flickering rays of our own lamps, in which the stream from our hard-driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could see now the sandy road lying white before us, but there was no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sigh of gladness, which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was already thinking what I had best do, when the driver, looking at his watch, said to the others something which I could hardly hear. It was spoken so quietly and in so low a tone. I thought it was an hour less than the time. And then turning to me, he said in German, worse than my own, there's no carriage here, the hare is not expected after all. You will now come on to Bukovina and return tomorrow or the next day, better the next day. While he was speaking, the horses began to neigh and snort and plunge wildly, so that the driver had to hold them up. Then, amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants and a universal crossing of themselves, a caliche with four horses drove up behind us, overtook us and drew up beside the coach. I could see from the flash of our lamps as the rays fell on them that the horses were coal black and splendid animals. They were driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat which seemed to hide his face. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes which seemed red in the lamplight. As he turned to us, he said to the driver, You are early tonight, my friend. The man stammered in reply. The Herr English was in a hurry. To which the stranger replied, That is why, I suppose, you wished him to go on to Bukovina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are swift. As he spoke, he smiled, and the lamplight fell on the hard-looking mouth. 
with very red lips and sharp looking teeth as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered to another the line from Berger's Leonore. Then die Toten reiten schnell, for the dead travel fast. Strange driver evidently heard the words, for he looked up with a gleaming smile. The passenger turned his face away at the same time, putting out his two fingers and crossing himself. Give me the hare's luggage, said the driver, and with exceeding alacrity, my bags were handed out and put in the caliche. Then I descended from the side of the coach as the caliche was close up alongside, the driver helping me with a hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel. His strength must have been prodigious. Without a word, he shook his reins, the horses turned, and we swept into the darkness of the pass. A wild howling began, which seemed to come from all over the country, as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night. At the first howl, the horses began to strain and rear. But the driver spoke to them soothingly, and they quieted down, but shivered and sweated as though after a runaway from a sudden fright. Then far off in the distance, from the mountains on each side of us, began a louder and sharper howling, that of wolves, which affected both the horses and myself in the same way, for I was minded to jump from the caliche and run whilst they reared again and plunged madly, so that the driver had to use all his great strength to keep them from bolting. In a few minutes, however, my own ears got accustomed to the sound, and the horses so far became quiet that the driver was able to descend and stand before them. He petted and soothed them, and whispered something in their ears, as I have heard of horse tamers doing. And with an extraordinary effect, for under his caresses they become quite manageable again. But though they still trembled, the driver again took his seat and, shaking his reins, started off at a great pace. This time, after going to the far side of the pass, he suddenly turned down a narrow roadway which ran sharply to the right. Soon we were hemmed in with trees, which in places arched right over the roadway till we passed as though through a tunnel. And again, great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side. Though we were in shelter, we could hear the rising wind, for it moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of the trees crashed together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still. Fine powdery snow began to fall, so that soon we and all around us were covered with a white blanket. The keen wind still carried the howling of the dogs, and this grew fainter as we went on our way. The baying of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing on us from every side. I grew dreadfully afraid, and the horses shared my fear. The driver, however, was not in the least disturbed. He kept turning his head to left and right, but I could not see anything through the darkness. Suddenly, away on our left, I saw a faint flickering blue flame. The driver saw it at the same moment. He at once checked the horses and, jumping to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. I did not know what to do, the less as the howling of the wolves grew closer. But while I wondered, the driver suddenly appeared again and without a word took his seat and we resumed our journey. I think I must have fallen asleep and kept dreaming of the incident, for it seemed to be repeated endlessly. And now looking back, it's like a sort of awful nightmare. Once the flame appeared so near to the road that even in the darkness around us I could watch the driver's motions. He went rapidly to where the blue flame rose. It must have been very faint for it did not seem to illumine the place around it at all. And gathering a few stones, formed them into some device. Once there appeared a strange optical effect. When he stood in between me and the flame, it did not obstruct it, for I could see its ghostly flicker all the same. This startled me, but as the effect was only momentary, I took it that my eyes deceived me, straining through the darkness. Then for a time there were no blue flames, and we sped onwards through the gloom, with the howling of the wolves around us, as though they were following in a moving circle. At last there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had yet gone. 
During his absence, the horses began to tremble, worse than ever, and to snort and scream with fright. I could not see any cause for it, for the howling of the wolves ceased altogether. But just then, the moon sailing through the black clouds appeared behind the jagged crest of a beetling pine-clad rock, and by its light I saw around us a ring of wolves, with white teeth and lolling red tongue, with long sinewy limbs and shaggy hair. They were a hundred times more terrible in the grim silence which held them than even when they howled. For myself, I felt a sort of paralysis of fear. It is only when a man feels himself face to face with such horrors can he understand their true import. All at once the wolves began to howl, as though the moonlight had had some peculiar effect on them. The horses jumped about and reared and looked helplessly round with eyes that rolled in a way painful to see. But the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side, and they had perforce to remain within it. I called out to the coachman to come, for it seemed to me that our only chance was to try to break through the ring and to aid his approach. I shouted and beat the side of the caliche, hoping that by the noise to scare the wolves from that side so as to give him a chance of reaching the trap. How he came there, I know not, but I heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command, and looking towards the sound, saw him stand in the roadway, as he swept his long arms, as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacle, the wolves fell back, and back further still. Just then a heavy cloud passed across the face of the moon, so that we were again in darkness. When I could see again, the driver was climbing into the caliche, and the wolves had disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny, that a dreadful fear came upon me, and I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed interminable as we swept on our way, now in almost complete darkness, for the rolling clouds obscured the moon. We kept on ascending with occasional periods of quick descent, but in the main always ascending. Suddenly I became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle, from whose tall black windows came no ray of light, and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the moonlit sky. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued This of May, I must have been asleep, for certainly if I had been fully awake, I must have noticed the approach of such a remarkable place. In the gloom the courtyard looked of considerable size, and as several dark ways led from it under great round arches, perhaps seem bigger than it really is. I have not yet been able to see it by daylight. When the caliche stopped, the driver jumped down and held out his hand to assist me to alight. Again, I could not but notice his prodigious strength. His hand actually seemed like a steel vice that could have crushed mine if he had chosen. Then he took out my traps and placed them on the ground beside me as I stood close to a great door, old and studded with large iron nails, and set in a projecting doorway of massive stone. I could see even in the dim light that the stone was massively carved, but that the carving had been much worn by time and weather. As I stood, the driver jumped again into his seat and shook the reins. The horses started forward, and trap and all disappeared down one of the dark openings. I stood in silence where I was. I did not know what to do. Of bell or knocker there was no sign. Through these surrounding walls and dark window openings it was not likely that my voice would penetrate. The time I waited seemed endless, for I felt doubts and fears crowding upon me. What sort of place had I come to, and among what kind of people? What sort of grim adventure was it on which I had embarked? Was this a customary incident in the life of a solicitor's clerk, 
sent out to explain the purchase of a London estate to a foreigner. Solicitor's clerk, Nina was not like that. Solicitor for just before leaving London, I got word that my examination was successful and I am now a full-blown solicitor. I began to rub my eyes and pinch myself to see if I were awake. It all seemed like a horrible nightmare to me and I expected that I should suddenly awake and find myself at home with the dawn struggling in through the windows as I had now and again felt in the morning after a day of overwork. But my flesh answered the pinching test and my eyes were not to be deceived. I was indeed awake and among the Carpathians. All I could do now was to be patient and to wait the coming of the morning. Just as I had come to this conclusion, I heard a heavy step approaching behind the great door and saw through the chinks the gleam of a coming light. Then there was the sound of rattling chains and the clanking of massive bolts drawn back. The key was turned with a loud grating noise of long disuse and the great door swung back. Within stood a tall old man, clean-shaven save for a long white moustache, and clad in black from head to foot, without a single speck of colour about him anywhere. He held in his hand an antique silver lamp, in which the flame burned without chimney or globe of any kind, throwing long quivering shadows as it flickered in the draught of the open door. The old man motioned me in with his right hand, with a courtly gesture, saying in excellent English, but with a strange intonation, Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own free will. He made no motion of stepping to meet me, but stood like a statue, as though his gesture of welcome had fixed him into stone. The instant, however, that I had stepped over the threshold, he moved impulsively forward, and holding out his hand, grasped mine with strength which made me wince, which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed as cold as ice, more like the hand of a dead than a living man. Again, he said, welcome to my house. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. The strength of the handshake was so much akin to that which I had noticed in the driver, whose face I had not seen, and for a moment I doubted if it were not the same person to whom I was speaking. So to make sure, I said interrogatively, Count Dracula? He bowed in a courtly way as he replied, I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome, Mr. Harker, to my house. Come in, the night air is chill, and you must need to eat and rest. As he was speaking, he put the lamp on the bracket on the wall, and stepping out, took my luggage. He carried it in before I could forestall him. I protested, but he insisted. Nay, sir, you are my guest. It is late, and my people are not available. Let me see to your comfort myself. He insisted on carrying my traps along the passage, then up a great winding stair and along another great passage, on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. At the end of this he threw open a heavy door, and I rejoiced to see within a well-lit room at which a table was spread for supper, and on whose mighty hearth great fire of logs, freshly replenished, flamed and flared. The Count halted, putting down my bags, closed the door, crossing the room opened another door, which led into a small octagonal room lit by a single lamp, and seemingly without a window of any sort. Passing through this, he opened another door, and motioned me to enter. It was a welcome sight, for here was a great bedroom, well lighted and warmed with another log fire. Also added to, but lately, for the top logs were fresh, which sent a hollow roar up the wide chimney. The Count himself left my luggage inside and withdrew, saying before he closed the door, You will need after your journey to refresh yourself by making your toilet. I trust you will find all you wish. When you are ready, come into the other room, where you will find your supper prepared. The light and warmth of the Count's courteous welcome seemed to have dissipated all my doubts and fears. Having then reached my normal state, I discovered that I was half famished with hunger. So making a hasty toilet, I went into the other room. I found supper already laid out. 
My host, who stood on one side of the great fireplace, leaning against the stonework, made a graceful wave of his hand to the table and said, I pray you, be seated and sup how you please. You will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already and I do not sup. I handed him a sealed letter which Mr Hawkinson had trusted to me. He opened it and read it gravely. Then, with a charming smile, he handed it to me to read. One passage of it, at least, gave me a thrill of pleasure. I must regret that an attack of gout, from which malady I am constant sufferer, forbids absolutely any travelling on my part for some time to come. But I am happy to say I can send a sufficient substitute, one in whom I have every possible confidence. He is a young man, full of energy and talent in his own way, and of a very faithful disposition. He is discreet and silent, and has grown into manhood in my service. He shall be ready to attend on you when you will during his stay, and shall take your instructions in all matters. The Count himself came forward and took off the cover of the dish, and I fell to at once an excellent roast chicken. This with some cheese and a salad and a bottle of old Tokay, of which I had two glasses, was my supper. During the time I was eating it, the Count asked me many questions as to my journey, and I told him by degrees all I had experienced. By this time I had finished my supper, and by my host's desire had drawn up a chair by the fire and began to smoke a cigar which he offered me, at the same time excusing himself that he did not smoke. I now had an opportunity of observing him, and found him with a very marked physiognomy. His face was strong, very strong, aquiline, with a high bridge of the thin nose, with peculiarly arched nostrils, with lofty dome forehead and hair growing scantily around the temples, but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose and with the bushy hair it seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over the lips, whose remarkable ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. For the rest, his ears were pale at the tops, extremely pointed. The chin was broad and strong, and the cheeks firm though thin. The general effect was one of extraordinary power. Hitherto I had noticed that the backs of his hands as they lay on his knees in the firelight, and they had seemed rather white and fine. But seeing them now close to me, I could not help but notice that they were rather coarse, broad with squat fingers. Strange to say, there were hairs in the centre of the palm. The nails were long and fine and cut to a sharp point. As the Count leaned over me and his hands touched me, I could not repress a shudder. It may have been that his breath was rank, but a horrible feeling of nausea came over me, which, do what I would, I could not conceal. The Count, evidently noticing it, drew back and with a grim sort of smile, which showed more than he had yet done of his protuberant teeth, sat himself down again on his own side of the fireplace. We were both silent for a while, as I looked towards the window, I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. There seemed a strange stillness over everything. But as I listened, I heard, as if from down below in the valley, the howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, and he said, Listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression in my face strange to him, he added, Ah, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. And he rose and said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready. And tomorrow you shall sleep as late as you will. I have to be away till the afternoon. So sleep well and dream well. With a courteous bow, he opened for me himself the door to the octagonal room and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. I doubt, I fear, I think strange things, which I dare not confess to my own soul. God keep me, if only for the sake of those dear to me. 7th of May. It is again early morning, when I have rested and enjoyed the last 24 hours. 
I slept till late in the day and awoke of my own accord. When I dressed myself, I went into the room where we had supped and found a cold breakfast laid out, with coffee kept hot by the pot being placed on the hearth. There was a card on the table on which was written, I have to be absent for a while, do not wait for me, D. I set to and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I had done, I looked for a bell so that I might let the servants know I had finished, but I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering the ordinary evidences of wealth which are around me. The table service is of gold and so beautifully wrought that it must be of immense value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas and the hangings of my bed are of the costliest and most beautiful fabrics. They must have been of fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old. They're in excellent order. I saw something like them in Hampton Court, but there they were worn and frayed and moth-eaten. But still in none of the rooms is there a mirror. There's not even a toilet glass on my table. I had to get the little shaving glass from my bag before I could either shave or brush my hair. I have not yet seen a servant anywhere or heard a sound near the castle except the howling of wolves. Some time after I finished my meal, I do not whether to call it breakfast or dinner, for it was between five and six o'clock when I had it, I looked about for something to read. Well, I did not like to go about the castle until I had asked the Count's permission. There was absolutely nothing in the room, book, newspaper, or even writing material. So I opened another door in the room and found a sort of library. The door opposite mine I tried, but found it locked. In the library, I found to my great delight a vast number of English books, whole shelves full of them, with bound volumes of magazines and newspapers table in the centre was littered with English magazines and newspapers, though none of them were of very recent date. The books were of the most varied kind, history, geography, politics, political economy, botany, geology, law, all relating to England and English life and customs and manners. There were even such books of reference as the London Directory, the Red and Blue Books, Whitaker's Almanac, the Army and Navy Lists, it somehow gladdened my heart to see it. The lawless. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened and the Count entered. He saluted me in a hearty way and hoped that I had had a good night's rest. Then he went on. I am glad you found your way in here, for I am sure there is much that will interest you. These companions. And he laid his hand on some of the books, have been good friends to me, and for some years past, ever since I had the idea of going to London, have given me many hours of pleasure. Through them, I have come to know your great England, and to know her is to love her. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. But alas, as yet, I know only your tongue through books. To you, my friend, I look that I know it to speak. But Count, I said, you know and speak English thoroughly. He bowed gravely. I thank you, my friend, for your all too flattering estimate. Yet, but yet I fear that I am a little way on the road. I would travel, true, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I do not know how to speak them. Indeed, I said, you speak excellently. Not so, he answered. Well, I know that. Did I move and speak in your London? None there are who would not know me for a stranger. And it's not enough for me. Here I am noble. I am boyer. The common people know me. And I am master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. Men know him not. And to know not, is to care not for. I am content if I am like the rest, so that no man stops if he see me, or pause in his speaking if he hear my words. Aha, stranger, I have been so long master that I would be master still, or at least that none other should be master of me. You come to me not alone as an agent of my friend Peter Hawkins from Exeter, 
Tell me all about my new estate and land. And shall I thrust rest here with me a while, so that by our talking I may learn the English intonation, and I would that you tell me when I make error. Even of the smallest in my speaking, I am sorry that I had to be away so long today, but you will, I know, forgive one who has so many important affairs in hand. Of course I said all I could do about being willing and ask if I might come to that room when I choose. He answered, yes, certainly. And added, you may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, for of course you will not wish to go. There is reason that all things are as they are, and that you see with my eyes and know with my knowledge, you would perhaps better understand. I said I was sure of this. And then he went on. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways. And there shall be to you many strange things. Nay, from what you have told me of your experiences already, you know something of what strange things there may be. This led to much conversation, and it was evident that he wanted to talk, if only for talking's sake. I asked him many questions regarding things that had already happened to me or come within my notice. Sometimes he sheared off the subject or turned the conversation by pretending not to understand. But generally he answered all I asked most frankly. Then as time went on, and I got somewhat bolder, I asked him some of the strange things of the preceding night. For instance, why the coachman went to the places where he had seen the blue flames. Then he explained to me that it was commonly believed that on a certain night of the year, last night in fact, when all the evil spirits are supposed to have been checked its way, a blue flame is seen over any place where treasure has been concealed. That treasure has been hidden, he went on, in the region through which you came last night. There can be little doubt, for it was the ground fought over for centuries by the Wallachian, the Saxon and the Turk. Why, there is hardly a foot of soil in all this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men, patriots or invaders. In the old days there were stirring times when the Austrian and the Hungarian came up in hordes and the patriots went out to meet them, men and women, the aged and the children too, and waited their coming on the rocks above the passes that they might sweep destruction on them with their artificial avalanches. When the invader was triumphant, he found but little for what there was had been sheltered in the friendly soil. But how, I said, how can it have remained so long undiscovered when there is a sure index that if men will but take the trouble to look? The Count smiled, and as his lips ran back over his gums, the long, sharp canine teeth showed out. Strangely, he answered, because your peasant is at heart a coward and a fool. Those flames only appear on one night, and on that night no man of this land will, if he can help it, stir without his doors. And dear sir, even if he did, he would not know what to do. Or even the peasant that you tell me of who marked the place of the flame would not know where to look in daylight, even for his own work. Even you would not. I dare be sworn to be able to find these places again. There you are right, I said. I know no more than the dead were even to look for them. But then we drifted into other matters. Come, he said at last. Tell me of London and of the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my remissness, I went into my own room to get the papers from my bag. Whilst I was placing them in order, I heard a rattling of china and silver in the next room. As I passed through, notice that the table had been cleared and the lamp lit, for it was by this time deep into the dark. The lamps were also lit in the study or library, and I found the Count lying on the sofa, reading of all things in the world, an English Bradshaw's Guide. When I came in, he cleared the books and papers from the table, and with him I went into plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. He was interested in everything and asked me myriad questions about the place and its surroundings. 
had clearly studied beforehand all he could get on his subject of the neighbourhood, for he evidently at the end knew very much more than I did. When I remarked this, he answered, Well, but, my friend, it is not needful that I should. When I go there, I shall be all alone, and my friend Harker Jonathan, nay, pardon me, I fall into my country's habit of putting your patronymic first. My friend Jonathan Harker will not be by my side to correct and aid me. He will be in Exeter miles away, probably working at papers of the law with my other friend, Peter Hawkins. So, we went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate at Purfleet. When I told him the facts and he got his signature to the necessary papers and had written a letter with them ready to post to Mr Hawkins, he began to ask me how I had come across so suitable a place. I read to him the notes which I had made at the time and which I inscribe here. At Purfleet, on a by-road, I came across such a place as seemed to be required and where there was displayed a dilapidated notice that the place was for sale. It is surrounded by a high wall of ancient structure, built of heavy stones, and has not been repaired for a large number of years. The closed gates are of heavy old oak and iron, all eaten with rust. The estate is called Carfax, no doubt a corruption of the old Quatre Face, as the house is four-sided, agreeing with the cardinal points of the compass. It contains in all some 20 acres, quite surrounded by the solid stone wall above mentioned. There are many trees on it, which make it in places gloomy, and there is a deep, dark-looking pond or small lake, evidently fed by some springs, as the water is clear and flows away in a fair-sized stream. The house is very large, and of all periods back, I should say, to medieval times, for one part is of stone, immensely thick, with only a few windows high up and heavily barred with iron. It looks like a part of a keep, and is close to an old chapel or church. I could not enter it, as I had not the key of the door leading into it from the house, but I have taken with my Kodak views of it from various points. The house has been added to, but in a very straggling way, and I can only guess at the amount of ground it covers, which must be very great. There are but few houses close at hand, one being a very large house, only recently added and formed into a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the ground. When I had finished, he said, I am glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. The house cannot be made habitable in a day. And after all, how few days go to make up a century. I rejoice also there is a chapel of old times. We are Transylvanians. We Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may lie amongst the common dead. We seek not gaiety nor mirth, nor the bright voluptuousness of much sunshine and sparkling waters which pleasure the young and gay. I am no longer young, my heart, though weary for years of mourning over the dead, is not attuned to mirth. Moreover, the walls of my castle are broken, the shadows are many, and the wind breathes cold through the broken battlements and casements. I love the shade and the shadow, and would be alone in my thoughts when I may. Somehow his words and look did not seem to accord, or else it was that his cast of face made his smile look malignant and saturnine. Presently, with an excuse, he left me, asking me to put all my papers together. He was some little time away, and I began to look at some of the books around me. One was an atlas, and found it open naturally in England, as if that map had been much used. On looking at it, I found in certain places little rings marked, and on examining these, I noticed one was near London on the east side, manifestly where his new estate was situated. The other two were Exeter and Whitby on the Yorkshire coast. It was the better part of an hour when the Count returned. Aha, he said, still at your books. Good, but you must not work always. Come, I am informed that your supper is ready. He took my arm and we went into the next room where I found an excellent supper ready on the table. The Count again excused himself 
as he had guided out on his being away from home. But he sat as on the previous night and chatted whilst I ate. After supper I smoked as on the last evening, when the Count stayed with me, chatting and asking questions on every conceivable subject, hour after hour. I felt that it was getting very late indeed, but I did not say anything, for I felt under obligation to meet my host's wishes in every way. I was not sleepy as the long sleep yesterday had fortified me, but I could not help experiencing a chill which comes over one at the coming of dawn which is like, in its way, the turn of the tide. They say that people who are near death die generally at the change to dawn or at the turn of the tide. Anyone who has, when tired, and tied as it were to his post, experienced this change in the atmosphere can well believe it. But once we heard the crow of a cock coming up with pre-natural shrillness through the clear morning air, Count Dracula, jumping to his feet, said, Why, there is the morning again. How remiss I am to let you stay up so long. You must make your conversation regarding my dear new country of England less interesting, so that I may not forget how time flies by us. With a courtly bow, he quickly left me. I went to my own room and drew the curtains, but there was little to notice. My window opened into the courtyard. All I could see was the warm grey quickening sky, so I pulled the curtains again and have written of this day. 8th of May. I begin to fear as I wrote this book that I was getting too diffuse. But now that I am glad that I went into detail from the first. But there is something so strange about this place and all in it that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish I was safe out of it, or that I had never come. It may be that this strange night existence is telling on me. But would that that were all. If there were anyone to talk to, I could bear it, but there's no one. I have only the Count to speak with, and he, I fear I am myself, the only living soul within the place. Let me be prosaic so far as the facts can be. It will help me to bear up, and imagination must not run riot with me. If it does, I am lost. Let me say at once how I stand, or seem to. I only slept a few hours when I went to bed, and feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up. I'd hung my shaving glass by the window, and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder, and I heard the Count's voice saying to me, Good morning. I started, for it amazed me that I'd not seen him since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting, I'd cut myself slightly, but I did not notice it at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. But this time there could be no error, for the man was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The whole room behind me was displayed, but there was no sign of a man in it, except myself. This was startling, coming on top of so many strange things, was beginning to increase that vague feeling of uneasiness which I always have when the Count is near. But at the instant I saw that the cut had bled a little and the blood was tripping over my chin, I laid down the razor, turning as I did so half round to look for some sticking plaster. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demoniac fury and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away and his hand touched a string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, but the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe that it was ever there. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. And seizing the shaving glass, he went on. And this is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. Away with it. On opening the heavy window with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung out the glass, which was shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones of the courtyard below. Then he withdrew without a word. It is very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave, unless in my watch case or the bottom of the shaving pot, which is fortunately made of metal. 
When I went into the dining room, breakfast was prepared. I could not find the Count anywhere, so I breakfasted alone. It is strange that as yet I have not seen the Count eat or drink. He must be a very peculiar man. After breakfast, I did a little exploring in the castle, went out on the stairs, found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood there was every opportunity of seeing her. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. Stone falling from a window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green tree tops with occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forest. But I am not at heart to describe beauty. When I had seen the view, I explored further. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted. In no place, save from the windows in the castle, is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison. And I am a prisoner. End of chapter two. Chapter three of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued When I found out that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find. But after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. But when I look back after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time. But I behaved much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly. As quietly as I have ever done anything in my life. And began to think over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. Of one thing only I am certain. But it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, as he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it. He would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself, and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived like a baby by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits, and if the latter be so, I need and shall need all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut, and knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library, so I went cautiously to my own room, and found him making the bed. This was odd, because it only confirmed what I had all along thought, that there were no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door, laying the table in the dining room, I was assured of it. For if he does himself all these menial offices, surely it is proof that there is no one else to do them. This gave me a fright, for if there is no one else in the castle, it must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves as he did? by only holding up his hand in silence. How was it that all the people at Bistritz and on the coach had some terrible fear for me? What meant the giving of the crucifix, the garlic of the wild rose, the mountain ash? Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix round my neck, for it is a comfort and a strength to me whenever I touch it. It's an odd thing that which I have been taught to regard with disfavour as idolatrous, should in a time of loneliness and trouble be of help? Is it that there is something in the essence of sympathy and comfort? Sometime, if may be, I must examine this matter to try and make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. 
Tonight he may talk of himself if I turn the conversation that way. I must be very careful, however, not to awake his suspicion. Midnight. I've had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvania history, and he warmed up to the subject wonderfully. In his speaking of things and people, and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present at them all. This he afterwards explained by saying that to a boyard, the pride of his house and name is his own pride, and their glory is his glory, and their fate is his fate. Whenever he spoke of his house, he always said we, and spoke almost in the plural, like a king speaking. I wish I could put down all he said exactly as he said it to me. For to me, it was most fascinating. It seemed to have in it a whole history of the country. He grew excited as he spoke, and walked around the room, pulling his great white moustache, and grasping anything on which he laid his hand, as though he would crush it by main strength. One thing he said, which I shall put down as nearly as I can, for it tells in its way the story of his race. We Slesky's have a right to be proud, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races who fought as the lion fights for lordship. Here in the whirlpool of European races, the Ugric tribe bore down from the Iceland the fighting spirit which Thor and Woden gave them which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe. Aye, and of Asia and Africa too, for the people thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here too, when they came, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame. But the dying people held that in their veins ran the blood of those old witches, who expelled from Scythia had mated with the devils in the desert. Fools, fools, what devil or what witch was ever so great as Attila, whose blood is in these veins. He held up his arms. Is it a wonder that we were a conquering race, that we were proud when the Magar, the Lombard, the Avar, the Bolivar, or the Turk poured his thousands on our frontiers, we drove them back. Is it strange that when Arpad and his legions swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here when he reached the frontier, and that the Onfogalaus was completed there? And when the Hungarian flood swept eastward, the Sezekles were claimed as kindred by the victorious Magar, and to us for centuries was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkey land. Aye, more than that, Endless duty of the frontier guard, for as the Turks say, water sleeps and an enemy is sleepless. Who more gladly than we throughout the four nations received the bloody sword, but at its warlike call flock quicker to the standard of the king, when was redeemed after that great shame of my nation, the shame of Kosovo, when the flags of the Wallach and the Magar went down beneath the crescent. Who was it but one of my own race, who as Volvodi crossed the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground? This was a Dracula indeed. Woe was it that his own unworthy brother, when he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk and brought the shame of slavery on them. Was it not this Dracula indeed who inspired that the other of his race, who in a later age again and again brought his horses over the great river into Turkey land? who, when he was beaten back, came again and again and again, though he had to come himself. Bah! What could a peasants without a leader? Where ends the war without a brain and a heart to conduct it? Again, when after the Battle of Mohics, we threw off the Hungarian yoke, we of the Dracula blood were amongst their leaders, for our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Ah, young sir, the Sugelis! And the Dracula is their heart's blood, their brains and their swords, can boast a record that mushroom growths like the Habsburgs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over, blood is too precious a thing in these days of dishonourable peace, and the glories of the great races are in a tale that is told. It was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed, Mem, 
This diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, where everything has to break off at cockcrow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. 12th of May. Let me begin with facts. Bare, meagre facts. Verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences which will have to rest on my own observation, or my memory of them. Last evening, when the Count came from his room, he began by asking me questions on legal matters and on the doing of certain kinds of business. I had spent the day wearily over books and, simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some of the matters I had been examined in at Lincoln's Inn. There was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them down in sequence. The knowledge may somehow or sometime be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, and that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction, as only one could act at a time, and that a change would be certain to militate against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man to attend, say, to banking and another to look after shipping in case local help were needed in a place far from the home of the banking solicitor. I asked him to explain more fully so that I might not by any chance mislead him. So he said, I shall illustrate. Your friend and mine, Mr Peter Hawkins, and under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my place at London. Good. Now here let me say frankly, lest you should think it strange that I have sought the services of one so far off from London, instead of some one resident there. That my motive was no local interest might be served, save my wish only and that as one of London's residents might, perhaps, have some purpose of himself or friend to serve. I went thus afield to seek my agent, whose labours should be only to my interest. Now I suppose I, who have much affairs, wish to ship goods, say, to Newcastle, or Durham, or Harwich, or Dover. Might it not be that I could more and more ease be done by consigning to one in these ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy, but that we solicitors had a system of agency, one for the other, so that local work could be done locally by instruction from any solicitor, so that the client simply placing himself in the hands of one man could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself, is it not so? Of course, I replied. And such often done by men of business who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one person. Good, he said, and then went on to ask about the means of making consignments and the forms to be gone through and all sorts of difficulties which might arise, but by forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to him to the best of my ability and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor for there was nothing that he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country, and who did not evidently do much in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful. When he had satisfied himself on these points of which he had spoken, and I had verified all as well as I could by the books available, he suddenly stood up and said, Have you written since your first letter to our friend Mr Peter Hawkins, or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered I had not, but as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. Then write now, my young friend, he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder. Write to our friend and to any other, and say, if it would please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. You wish me to stay so long, I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much, nay, I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engage in that someone would come on his behalf, 
it was understood that my needs were only to be consulted. I have not stinted, it is not so. What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr Hawkins' interest, not mine. And I had to think of him, not myself. And beside, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner. That if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow and his mastery in the trouble of my face. For he began at once to use them, but in his own smooth, resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know you are well and that you look forward to getting home to them. Is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of note paper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest foreign post, and looking at them, and then at him, and noticing his quiet smile, with the sharp canine teeth, laying over the red underlip, I understood as well as if he had spoken that I should be careful what I wrote, for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only formal notes now, but to write fully to Mr Hawkins in secret, and also to Mina, for to her I could write in shorthand which would puzzle the Count if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat quiet reading a book, whilst the Count wrote several notes, referring as he wrote them to some books on his table. Then he took up my two and placed them with his own, and put by his writing materials, after which, the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in doing so, for under the circumstances, I felt that I should protect myself in every way I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number seven, the Crescent, Whitby, and another to her Leutner, Varna. The third was to Coates and Co. in London, and the fourth to Heron Klopstock in Belarus, Bankers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed. I was just about to look at them when I saw the door handle move. I sank back in my seat, having just had time to replace the letters as they had been and to resume my book before the Count. Holding still another letter in his hand, entered the room, took up the letters on the table, stamped them carefully, and turning to me, said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, Find all things as you wish. At the door he turned after a moment's pause and said, Let me advise you, my dear young friend. Nay, let me warn you with all seriousness. But should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many memories. And there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned. Should sleep now, or ever overcome you, or be like to do, in haste to your own chamber, or to these rooms, for your rest will then be safe. But if you be not careful in this respect, then he finished his speech in a gruesome way, for he motioned with his hands as if he were washing them. I quite understood. My only doubt was as to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural, horrible net of gloom mystery which seemed to be closing around me. Later, I endorse the last words written, but this time there is no doubt in question. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not. I place the crucifix over the head of my bed. I imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams, and there it shall remain. When he left me, I went to my room. After a little while, not hearing any sound, I came out and went up the stone stair to where I could look outwards to the south. There was some sense of freedom in the vast expanse, inaccessible though it was to me, and as compared with the narrow darkness of the courtyard, looking out on this, I felt that I was indeed imprisoned, and I seemed to want a breath of fresh air, though it were of the night. I'm beginning to feel this nocturnal existence tell on me. It is destroying my nerves. I start at my own shadow. I'm full of all sorts of horrible imaginings. 
God knows there is ground for my terrible fear in this accursed place. I look out over the beautiful expanse, bathed in soft yellow moonlight, till it was almost as light as day. In the soft light the distant hills became melted, and the shadows in the valleys and gorges of velvety blackness. The mere beauty seemed to cheer me. There was peace and comfort in every breath I drew. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me, somewhat to my left, for I imagined from the order of the rooms that the windows of the Count's own room would look out. The window at which I stood was tall and deep, stone mullion, and though weather-worn, was still complete. But it was evidently many a day's face had been there. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the neck and the movement of his back and arms. In any case, I could not mistake the hand which I had had so many opportunities of studying. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner. But my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over that dreadful abyss face down with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I could not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow. But I kept looking and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, worn clear of the mortar by the stress of years and thus using every projection and inequality moved downwards with considerable speed, just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this, or what manner of creature is in the semblance of man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, in awful fear, and there is no escape from me. I am encompassed about with terrors that I dare not think of. 15th of May. Once more I've seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion. He moved downwards in a sidelong way some hundred feet down and a good deal to the left. He vanished into some hole or window. When his head had disappeared I leaned out to try and see more, but without avail. The distance was too great to allow a proper angle of sight. I knew he had left the castle now and thought to use the opportunity to explore more than I had dared to do as yet. I went back to the room and taking a lamp, tried all the doors. They were all locked, as I had expected, and the locks were comparatively new. But I went down the stone stairs to the hall where I had entered originally. I found I could pull back the bolts easily and unhook the great chains, but the door was locked and the key was gone. That must be the key in the Count's room. I must watch should his door be unlocked so that I might get it and escape. I went on to make a thorough examination of the various stairs and passages and to try the doors that opened from them. One or two small rooms near the hall were open, but there was nothing to see in them except old furniture, dusty with age and moth-eaten. At last, however, I found one door at the top of the stairway, which, though it seemed to be locked, gave a little under pressure. I tried it harder and found that it was not really locked, but that the resistance came from the fact that the hinges had fallen somewhat and the heavy door rested on the floor. Here was an opportunity which I might not have again, so I exerted myself and with many efforts forced it back so that I could enter. I was now in a wing of the castle further to the right than the rooms I knew and a story lower down. From the windows I could see that the suites of rooms laying along to the south of the castle, the windows of the end room looking out both west and south. On the latter side, as well as to the former, there was a great precipice. The castle was built on the corner of a great rock, so that on three sides it was quite impregnable. And great windows were placed here, where sling or bow or culverin could not reach and consequently light and comfort impossible to a position which had to be guarded were secure. To the west was a great valley, rising far away great jagged mountain fastness, rising peak on peak 
a sheer rock studded with mountain ash and thorn, whose roots clung in cracks and crevices and crannies in the stone. This was evidently the portion of the castle occupied by the ladies in bygone days, for the furniture had more an air of comfort than any I had seen. The windows were curtainless, and the yellow moonlight flooding in through the diamond panes enabled one to see even colours, whilst it softened the wealth of dust which lay over all, and disguised in some measure the ravages of time and the moth. My lamp seemed to be of little effect in the brilliant moonlight, but I was glad to have it with me, for there was a dread loneliness in the place, which chilled my heart and made my nerves tremble. Still, it was better than living alone in the rooms which I had come to hate from the presence of the Count, and after trying a little to school my nerves, I found a soft quietude to come over me. Here I am, sitting at a little oak table, where in old times possibly some fair lady sat to pen. With much thought and many blushes, her ill-spelt love letter, and writing in my diary in shorthand, all that has happened since I closed it last. It is 19th century up to date with a vengeance. And yet, unless my senses deceive me, the old centuries had and have powers of their own, which mere modernity cannot kill. Later, the morning of the 16th of May, God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. Whilst I live on here, there is one thing to hope for, that I may not go mad, if indeed I be not mad already. If I be sane, then surely it is maddening to think of that all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place. The Count is the least dreadful to me, but to him alone I can look for safety, even though this be only whilst I can serve his purpose. Great God, merciful God, let me be calm, for out of that way lies madness indeed. I begin to get new lights on certain things which have puzzled me. Up to now I never quite knew what Shakespeare meant when he made Hamlet say, My tablets, quit my tablets, tis meet that I put it down, etc. For now feeling as though my own brain were unhinged, or as if the shock had come which must end its undoing, I turn to my diary for a repose. The habit of entering accurately must help to soothe me. The Count's mysterious warning frightened me at the time. It frightens me more now when I think of it, for in the future he has a fearful hold upon me. I shall fear no doubt what he may say. When I had written in my diary and fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket, I felt sleepy. The Count's warning came into my mind, but I took a pleasure in disobeying it. The sense of sleep was upon me, and with it the obstinacy which sleep brings as an outrider. The soft moonlight soothed, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom, which refreshed me. I determined not to turn tonight to the gloom-haunted rooms, but to sleep here, where old ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives whilst their gentle breasts were sad for their menfolk, away in the midst of remorseless wars. I drew a great couch out of its place near the corner, so that as I lay I could look at the lovely view to the east and south, and unthinking of, and uncaring for the dust, composed myself for sleep. Suppose I must have fallen asleep, I hope so, but I fear, for all that followed, was startlingly real. So real that now sitting here in the broad full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. The room was the same, not changed in any way since I came into it. I could see along the floor in the brilliant moonlight my own footsteps, marked, for I had disturbed the long accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women, ladies by their dress and manner, I thought at the time that I must be dreaming when I saw them, for, though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me and looked at me for some time, and then whispered together. Two were dark, and had high aquiline noses like the Count, great dark piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with great wavy masses of golden hair, 
and eyes like paled sapphires. I seemed somehow to know her face, to know it in connection with some dreamy fear. I could not recollect at the moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain. But it is the truth, they whispered together, and then they all three laughed. Such a silvery musical laugh. But as hard as though the sound never could have come through the softness of human lips. It was like the intolerable tingling of sweetness of water glasses when played on by a cunning hand. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other two urged her on. One said, go on. You are first and we shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. The other added, He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. I lay quiet, looking out under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me so I could feel the movement of her breath. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, and sent the same tingling through my nerves as her voice but with a bitter underlying, a sweet and bitter offensiveness, as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive. And as she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal. And I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongues that lapped the white sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head as her lips went down below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten on my throat. Then she paused. I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips and could feel the hot breath on my neck and the skin of my throat began to tingle as one's flesh does when the hand that is tickling approaches nearer and nearer. I could feel the soft shivering touch of the lips on the super sensitive skin of my throat and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing again. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with a beating heart. But at that instant another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count, and I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman, and with a giant's power drew it back, the blue eyes transformed with fury, the white teeth champing with rage, and the fair cheeks blazing red with passion. But the Count, never did I imagine such wrath and fury, even to the demons of the pit. His eyes were positively blazing. The red light in them was lurid as if the flames of hell blazed behind him. His face was deathly pale, and the lines of it were hard like drawn wires. Thick eyebrows that met at the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him, then motioned to the others as though he were beating them back. It was the same imperious gesture that I had seen used to the wolves in a voice which, though low and almost in a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and ring round the room, he said, How dare you touch him, any of you? How dare you cast your eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you all, this man belongs to me. Beware how you meddle with him, or you'll have to deal with me. The fair girl, with a laugh of rival coquetry, turned to answer him. You yourself never loved, you never loved. On this the other women joined, and such mirthless, hard, soulless laughter rang through the room it almost made me faint to hear. It seemed like the pleasure of fiends. Then the Count turned after looking at my face attentively and said in a soft whisper, Yes, too, I can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past. Is it not so? 
I know I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Now go, go, I must awaken him, for there is work to be done. Are we to have nothing tonight, said one of them with a low laugh. She pointed to the bag which she had thrown upon the floor, and which moved as though there was some living thing within it. For answer, he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. My ears did not deceive me. There was a gasp and a low wail as of a half-smothered child. The woman closed round while I was aghast with horror. But as I looked, they disappeared, and with them the dreadful bag. There was no door near them. They could not have passed me without my noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of the moonlight and pass out through the window, for I could see outside the dim, shadowy forms for a moment before they entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me. I sank down, unconscious. End of chapter 3connection with some dreamy fear to the room it almost made me faint to hear it seemed like the pleasure of fiends chapter four of dracula by bram stoker this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four jonathan harker's journal continued. I awoke in my own bed. If it be that I had not dreamt, the Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on the subject, but could not arrive at any unquestionable result. To be sure, there were certain small evidences, such that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which was not my habit. My watch was still unwound. And I am rigorously accustomed to wind it in the last thing before going to bed, and many such details. But these things are no proof, for they may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual, and from some cause or another I had certainly been much upset. I must watch for proof. Of one thing I am glad, it was that the Count carried me here and undressed me. He must have been hurried in his task. For my pockets are intact, I am sure this diary would have been a mystery to him, which he would not have booked. He would have taken or destroyed it, as I look around this room. Although it has been to me so full of fear, it is now a sort of sanctuary, for nothing can be more dreadful than those awful women who were, who are, waiting to suck my blood. 18th of May I've been down to look at that room again in daylight, for I must know the truth. When I got to the doorway at the top of the stairs, I found it closed. It had been so forcibly driven against the jam that part of the woodwork was splintered. I could see that the bolt of the lock had not been shot, but the door was fastened from the inside. I fear it was no dream, and I must act on this surmise. 19th of May. I am surely in the toil. Last night the Count asked me in the suavest tones to write three letters, one saying that my work here was nearly done and that I should start for home within a few days, another that I was starting on the next morning from the time of the letter, and the third that I had left the castle and arrived at Bistritz. I would fain have rebelled, but felt that in the present state of things it would be madness to quarrel openly with the Count, whilst I am so absolutely in his power, and to refuse would be to excite his suspicion and to arouse his anger. He knows that I know too much, and that I must not live, lest I be dangerous to him. My only chance is to prolong my opportunities. Something may occur which will give me a chance to escape. I saw in his eyes something of that gathering wrath which was manifest when he hurled that fair woman from him. He explained to me that the posts were few and uncertain, and that my writing now will ensure ease of mind to my friends. And he assured me with so much impressiveness that he would countermand the later letters, which would be held over at Bistritz until due time in case chance would admit of my prolonging my stay. 
that to oppose him would have been to create a new suspicion. I therefore pretended to fall in with his views and asked him what dates I should put on the letters. He calculated a minute and then said, the first should be the 12th of June, the second June the 19th, and the third June the 29th. I now know the span of my life. God help me. 28th of May. There is a chance of escape, or at any word, being able to send word home. A band of Sagani have come to the castle and are encamped in the courtyard. These Sagani are gypsies. I have notes of them in my book. They are peculiar to this part of the world, though allied to the ordinary gypsies all the world over. There are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania who are almost outside the law. They attach themselves as a rule to some great noble or boyar and call themselves by his name. They are fearless and without religion, save superstition, and they talk only their own varieties of the Romani tongue. I shall write some letters home and shall try to get them to have them posted. I have already spoken to them through my window to begin a quaint ship. They took their hats off and made obeisance and many signs, which, however, I could not understand any more than I could their spoken language. I have written the letters, mean as is in shorthand, and I simply asked Mr Hawkins to communicate with them. To her I have explained my situation, but without the horrors which I may only surmise. It would shock and frighten her to death were I to expose my heart to her. Should the letters not carry, then the Count shall not yet know my secret or the extent of my knowledge. I have given the letters. I threw them through the bars of my window with a gold piece and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed and then put them in his cap. I could do no more. I stole back to the study and began to read. As the Count did not come in, I have written here. The Count has come. He sat down beside me and said in his smoothest voice as he opened two letters, The Sizgani have given me these, of which, though I know not whence they come, I shall, of course, take care. See, he must have looked at it. One is from you and to my friend, Peter Hawkins. The other, here he caught sight of the strange symbols as he opened the envelope, and the dark look came into his face, and his eyes blazed wickedly. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not signed, well, so it cannot matter to us. And he calmly held the letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp until they were consumed. Then he went on. A letter to Hawkins that I shall of course send on, since it is yours. Your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, and unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you not cover it again? He held out the letter to me. With a courteous bow, handed me the green envelope. I could only redirect it and hand it to him in silence. When he went out of the room, I could hear the key turning softly. A minute later, I went over and tried it, and the door was locked. When an hour or two after, the Count came quietly into the room. His coming awakened me, for I had gone to sleep on the sofa. He was very courteous and very cheery in his manner, and seeing that I had been sleeping, he said, So, my friend, you are tired. Get to bed. There is the surest rest I may not have the pleasure to talk tonight since there are many labours to me. But you will sleep, I pray. I passed into my room and went to bed, and, strange to say, slept without dreaming. Despair has its own calms. 31st of May. This morning when I awoke, I thought I would provide myself with some paper and envelopes for my bag and keep them in my pocket so that I might write in case I should get an opportunity. But again a surprise, again a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone, and with it all my notes, my memoranda relating to railways and travel, 
my letter of credit, in fact, all that might be useful to me were I once outside the castle. I sat and pondered for a while, and then some thought appeared to me. And I made search of my portmanteau and in the wardrobe where I had placed my clothes. The suit in which I had travelled was gone. Also my overcoat and rug. I could find no trace of them anywhere. This looked like some new scheme of villainy. 17th of June. This morning, as I was sitting on the edge of my bed, cudgelling my brains, I heard without a cracking of whips and pounding and scraping of horses' feet up the rocky path beyond the courtyard. With joy, I hurried to the window and saw drive into the yard two great lighter wagons each drawn by eight sturdy horses, at the head of each pair, a Slovak with his wide hat, great nail-studded belt, dirty sheepskin and high boots. They also had their long staves in hand. I ran to the door, intending to descend and try and join them through the main hall. As I thought, that way might be open for them. Again a shock, my door was fastened on the outside. Then I ran to the window and cried to them. They looked up at me stupidly and pointed, but just then the hetman, or the Sagami, came out and seeing them pointing to my window, said something at which they laughed. Henceforth no echo of mine, no piteous cry or agonised entreaty would make them even look up at me. They resolutely turned away. The lighter wagons contained great square boxes with handles and thick rope. These were evidently empty by the ease with which the Slovaks handled them, and by their resonance as they were roughly moved. When they were all unloaded and packed in a great heap in one corner of the yard, the Slovaks were given some money by the Zagazni, and spitting on it for luck, lazily went to each horse's head. Shortly afterwards I heard the cracking of their whips die away, in the distance. 24th of June, before morning. Last night the Count left me early and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I darted up the winding stair and looked out of the window which opened south. I thought I would watch for the Count, for there was something going on. Sagani are quartered somewhere in the castle and are doing work of some kind, I know it, for now and then I hear a far away muffled sound as of matter and spade, and whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I'd been at the window somewhat less than half an hour when I saw something coming out of the Count's window. I drew back and watched carefully, and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find out he had on the suit of clothes which I had worn whilst travelling here, and slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb too. This then is his new scheme of evil, that he will allow others to see me, as they think, so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns or villages posting my own letters, and that any wickedness which he do shall by the local people be attributed to me. It makes me rage to think that this can go on, and whilst I am shut up here, a veritable prisoner, but without that protection of the law, which is even a criminal's right and consolation. I thought I would watch for the Count's return, and for a long time sat doggedly at the window. Then I began to notice there were some quaint little specks floating in the rays of the moonlight. They were like the tiniest grains of dust, so they whirled round and gathered in clusters in a nebulous sort of way. I watched them with a sense of soothing and a sort of calm stole over me. I leaned back in the embrasure in a more comfortable position so that I could enjoy more fully the aerial gamboling. Something made me start up. A low, piteous howling of dogs somewhere far below in the valley, which was hidden from my sight. Louder, it seemed to ring in my ears and the floating motes of dust to take new shapes to the sound as they danced in the moonlight. I felt myself struggling to awake to some call of my instincts. Nay, my very soul was struggling, for my half-remembered sensibilities 
was striving to answer the call. I was becoming hypnotised. Quicker and quicker danced the dust. The moonbeams seemed to quiver as they went by me in the mass of the gloom beyond. More and more they gathered till they seemed to take dim phantom shape. And then I started, broad awakened in full possession of my senses, and ran screaming from the place. The phantom shapes which were becoming gradually materialised from the moonbeams were those of three ghostly women to whom I was doomed. I fled and I felt somewhat safer in my own room where there was no moonlight and where the lamp was burning brightly. When a couple of hours had passed I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed. And then there was silence, deep awful silence which chilled me with a beating heart i tried the door but i was locked in my prison and could do nothing i sat down and simply cried as i sat i heard a sound in the courtyard without the agonized cry of a woman i rushed to the window and throwing it up peered out between the bars there indeed was a woman with a disheveled hair holding her hands over her heart as one distressed with running. She was leaning against the corner of the gateway when she saw my face at the window and threw herself forward and shouted in a voice laden with menace, Monster, give me my child. She threw herself on her knees and raising up her hands, cried the same words and tones which wrung my heart. Then she tore her hair and beat her breast and abandoned herself to all the violences of extravagant emotion. Finally, she threw herself forward, and though I could not see her, I could hear the beating of her naked hands against the door. Somewhere high overhead, probably on the tower, I heard the voice of the Count calling in his harsh metallic whisper. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. Four many minutes had passed, a pack of them poured like a pent-up dam when liberated through the wide entrance into the courtyard. There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. Before long they streamed away singly, licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew what had become of her child, and she was better dead. What shall I do? What can I do? How can I escape from this dreadful thing of night and gloom and fear? 25th of June, morning. No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and how dear to his heart and I the next morning can be. When the sun grew so high this morning that it struck the top of the great gateway opposite my window, the high spot which it touched seemed to me as if the dove from the ark had alighted there. My fear fell from me, as if it had been a vaporous garment which dissolved in the warmth. I must take action of some sort whilst the courage of the day is upon me. Last night one of my post-dated letters went to post, the first of that fatal series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from earth. Let me not think of it. Action! It has always been at night time that I have been molested or threatened or in some way in danger or in fear. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others wake? That he may be awake whilst they sleep? If only I could get into his room. But there is no possible way. The door is always locked. No way for me. Yes, there is a way if one dares to take it. Where his body is gone, why may not another body go? I have seen him myself crawl from his window. Why should I not imitate him and go in by his window? The chances are desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst, it can only be death. And a man's death is not a calf's, and the dreaded hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. Goodbye, Mina. If I fail, goodbye, my faithful friend and second father. Goodbye all, and last of all, Mina. Same day later, I have made the effort, and God helping me, 
have come safely back to this room. I must put down every detail in order. I went whilst my courage was fresh straight to the window on the south side and at once got out of the narrow ledge of stone which runs around the building on this side. The stones are big and roughly cut and the mortar has by process of time been washed away between them. I took off my boots and ventured out on the desperate way. I looked down once so as to make sure that a sudden glimpse of the awful depths would not overcome me but after that kept my eyes away from it. I knew pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window and made for it as well as I could having regard to the opportunities available. I did not feel dizzy, I suppose I was too excited and the time seemed ridiculously short till I found myself standing on the window sill and trying to raise up the sash. I was filled with agitation. However, when I bent down and slid feet foremost in through the window, then looked around for the Count, but with surprise and gladness made a discovery. The room was empty. It was barely furnished with odd things which seemed to have never been used. The furniture was something the same style as that in the south rooms, and was covered with dust. I looked for the key, but it was not in the lock, and I could not find it anywhere. The only thing I found was a great heap of gold in one corner. Gold of all kinds, Roman, British, Austrian and Hungarian and Greek and Turkish money, covered with a film of dust that had lain long in the ground. None of it that I noticed was less than 300 years old. There were also chains and ornaments, some jewelled, but all of them old and stained. At one corner of the room was a heavy door. I tried it, since I could not find the key to the room or the key to the outer door, which is the main object of my search. I must make further examination, or all my efforts would be in vain. It was open and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway, which went steeply down. I descended, minding carefully where I went, for the stairs were dark, being only lit by loopholes in the heavy masonry. At the bottom there was a dark tunnel-like passage, through which came a deathly sickly odour, the odour of old earth newly turned. As I went through the passage, the smell grew closer and heavier. At last I pulled open a heavy door which stood ajar and found myself in an old ruined chapel, which had evidently been used as a graveyard. The roof was broken and in two places were steps leading to vaults, but the ground had recently been dug over, and the earth placed in great wooden boxes, manifestly those which had been brought by the Slovak. There was nobody about, and I made a search for any further outlet, but there was none. Then I went over every inch of ground, so as not to lose a chance. I went down even into the vaults where the dim light struggled, although to do so was a dread to my very soul. Into two of these I went, but I saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. In the third, however, I made a discovery. There, in one of the great boxes, of which there were fifty in all, on a pile of newly dug earth, lay the Count. He was either dead or asleep. I could not say which, for his eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death. And the cheeks had warmth of life through all their pallor. The lips were as red as ever. But there was no sign of movement, no pulse, no breath, no beating in the heart. I bent over him and tried to find any sign of life. But in vain. He could not have lain there long, for the earthy smell would have passed away in a few hours. By the side of the box was its cover, pierced with holes here and there. I thought he might have the keys on him. But when I went to search, I saw the dead eyes, and in them, dead though they were, such a look of hate, though unconscious of me or my presence, that I fled from the place, and leaving the Count's room by the window, crawled up again the castle wall. Regaining my room, I threw myself panting upon the bed and tried to think. 29th of June. Today is the date of my last letter. And the Count has taken steps to prove that it was genuine. For again I saw him leave the castle by the same window 
and in my clothes. As he went down the wall, lizard fashion, wished I had a gun or some lethal weapon I might destroy him. But I fear that no weapon wrought alone by man's hand would have any effect on him. I dared not wait to see him return, for I feared to see those weird sisters. I came back to the library and read there till I fell asleep. I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me grimly as a man could look, as he said, Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. You return to your beautiful England, I to some work which may have such an end that we may never meet. Your letter home has been dispatched. Tomorrow I shall not be here, but all shall be ready for your journey. In the morning come the Zigani, who have some labours of their own here, and also come some Slovaks. When they have gone, my carriage shall come for you, and shall bear you to the Borgo Pass, to meet the diligence from Bukovina to Bistritz. And I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. I suspected him, and determined to test his sincerity. Sincerity, it seems, is like a profanation of the word to write it in connection with such a monster. So I asked him point blank, why may I not go tonight? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. He smiled, such a soft, smooth, diabolical smile, that I knew there was some trick behind his smoothness. He said, and your baggage. I do not care about it. I can send for it some other time. The Count stood up and said with a sweet courtesy which made me rub my eyes. It seemed so real. You English have a saying which is close to my heart. For its spirit is that which rules our boyars. Welcome the coming. Speed the parting guest. Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. Though sad I am at your going, and that you so suddenly desire it, come, with a stately gravity, he with the lamp preceded me down the stairs and along the hall. Suddenly he stopped. Hark! Close at hand came the howling of many wolves. It was almost as if the sound sprang up at the rising of his hand just as the music of a great orchestra seemed to leap under the baton of the conductor. After a pause of a moment, he proceeded his stately way to the door, drew back the ponderous bolts, unhooked the heavy chains and began to draw it open. To my intense astonishment, I saw that it was unlocked. Suspiciously, I looked all round. I could see no key of any kind. As the door began to open, the howling of the wolves without grew louder and angrier. Their red jaws with champing teeth and their blunt clawed feet as they leapt came in through the opening door. And I knew then that to struggle at that moment against the Count was useless. With such allies as these at his command I could do nothing. But still the door continued slowly to open and only the Count's body stood in the gap. Suddenly it struck me this might be the moment and means of my doom. I was to be given to the wolves, and at my own instigation. There was a diabolical wickedness in the idea, great enough for the Count, and as a last chance I cried out, Shut the door, I shall wait till morning. I covered my face with my hands to hide my tears of bitter disappointment. With one sweep of his powerful arm, the Count threw the door shut, and the great bolts clanged and echoed through the hall as they shot back into their places. In silence we returned to the library. After a minute or two I went to my own room. The last I saw of Count Dracula was his kissing his hand to me with a red light of triumph in his eyes, and with a smile that Judas in hell might be proud of. When I was in my room and about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly and listened. Unless my ears deceived me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back, back to your own place. Your time is not yet come. Wait, have patience. Tonight is mine. 
Tomorrow night it is yours. There was a low, sweet ripple of laughter, and in a rage I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I appeared, they all joined in a horrible laugh and ran away. I came back to my room, threw myself on my knees. It is then so near the end, tomorrow, tomorrow, Lord help me, and those to whom I am dear. 30th of June, morning. These may be the last words I ever write in this diary. I slept till just before the dawn, and when I woke, threw myself on my knees, for I determined that if death came, he should find me ready. At last I felt that subtle change in the air and knew that morning had come. Then come the welcome cock crow and I felt that I was safe. With a glad heart I opened my door and ran down to the hall. I had seen that the door was unlocked and no escape was before me. With hands that trembled with eagerness I unhooked the chains and drew back the massive bolts. But the door would not move. Despair seized me. I pulled and pulled at the door and shook it till, massive as it was, it rattled in its casement. I could see the bolt shot. It had been locked after I left the count. Then a wild desire took me to obtain that key at any risk, and I determined then to scale the wall again and gain the count's room. He might kill me, but death now seemed the happier choice of evils. Without a pause, I rushed up to the east window and scrambled down the wall as before into the council room. It was empty, but that was as I expected. I could not see a key anywhere, but the heaps of gold remained. I went through the door in the corner and down the winding stair, along the dark passage to the old chapel. I knew now well enough where to find the monster I sought. The great box was in the same place, close against the wall, but the lid was laid on it, not fastened down, but with the nails ready in their places to be hammered home. I knew I must reach the body for the key. So I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall. Then I saw something which filled my very soul with horror. There lay the Count, but looking as if his youth had been half renewed, for the white hair and moustache were charged with dark iron grey. The cheeks were fuller and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran over the chin and neck. Even the deep burning eyes seemed set amongst swollen flesh, for the lids and pouches underneath were bloated. It seemed as if the whole awful creature was simply gorged with blood. He lay like a filthy leech, exhausted with his repletion. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him, and every sense of me revolted at the contact, but I had to search or I was lost. The coming night might see my own body, a banquet in a similar way to those horrid three. I felt all over the body, but no sign could I find of the key. When I stopped and looked at the Count, there was a mocking smile on the bloated face, which seemed to drive me mad. This was the being I was helping to transfer to London where perhaps for centuries to come he might, amongst its teeming millions, satiate his lust for blood and create a new and ever-widening circle of semi-demons to batten on the helpless. The very thought drove me mad. A terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. There was no lethal weapon at hand, but I seized a shovel which a workman had been using to fill the cases and lifting it high, struck with the edge downward at the hateful face. But as I did so, the head turned, and the eyes fell full upon me, with all their blaze of basilisk horror. The sight seemed to paralyse me, and the shovel turned in my hand. I glanced from the face, merely making a deep gash above the forehead. The shovel fell from my hand across the box, and as I pulled away, the flange of the blade caught the edge of the lid, which fell over again and hid the horrid thing from my sight. The last glimpse I had was of the bloated face, blood-stained and fixed with a grin of malice, which would have held its own in the nethermost hell. I thought and thought what should be my next move, but my brain seemed on fire and waited with a despairing feeling growing over me. 
as I waited I heard in the distance a gypsy song, sung by merry voices coming closer. And through their song, the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips, the Sagani and the Slovaks, of whom the Count had spoken, were coming. With a last look round at the box which contained the vile body, I ran from the place and gained the Count's room, determined to rush out at the moment the door should be opened. With strained ears I listened, and heard downstairs the grinding of the key in the great lock, and the falling back of the heavy door. There must have been some other means of entry, or someone had a key for one of the locked rooms. Then there came the sound of many feet, tramping and dying away in some passage, which sent up a clanging echo. I turned to run down again towards the vault, where I might find the new entrance. But at the moment there seemed to come a violent puff of wind, and the door to the winding stair blew to with a shock that set the dust from the lintels flying. When I ran to push it open, I found that it was hopelessly fast. I was again a prisoner, and the net of doom was closing round me more closely. As I write, there is in the passage below a sound of many tramping feet, and the crash of weights being set down heavily. Doubtless the boxes with their freight of earth. There is a sound of hammering as the box is being nailed down. Now I can hear the heavy feet tramping again along the hall with many other idle feet coming behind them. The door is shut and the chains rattle. There is a grinding of the key in the lock. I can hear the key withdraw. Then another door opens and shuts. I hear the creaking of lock and bolt. Hark! In the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of whips, and the chorus of the Sagani as they pass into the distance. I am alone in the castle with these awful women. Pshaw, Mina is a woman. And there is naught in common. They are devils of the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle wall further than I have yet attempted. I shall take some of the gold with me, lest I want it later. May I find a way from this dreadful place. And then away for home, away to the quickest and nearest train, away from this cursed spot. Of this cursed land where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. At least God's mercy is better than those of these monsters, and the precipice is steep and high. At his foot a man may sleep as a man. Goodbye all, Mina. End of chapter four. Chapter 5 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Weston. 9th of May. My dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I've been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you and by the sea, where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the air. I've been working very hard lately because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies. I've been practising shorthand very assiduously. When we are married, I should be able to be useful to Jonathan. And if I can stenograph well enough, I can take down what he wants to say in this way and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practising very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he is keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I am with you, I shall keep in the diary the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sunday squeezed in a corner diaries, but a sort of journal which I can write in whenever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day if, if there is anything worth sharing, but it really is an exercise book. I shall try to do what I see lady journalists do, interviewing and writing descriptions and trying to remember conversations. I am told that with a little practice one can remember all that goes on, all that one hears said during a day. However we shall see, 
I will tell you of my little plans when we meet. I just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. It must be so nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we, I mean Jonathan and I, shall ever see them together. There's the ten o'clock bell ringing. Goodbye. Your loving Mina. Tell me all the news when you write. You have not told me anything for a long time. I heard rumours, and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. Letter, Lucy Weston to Mina Murray. 17 Chatham Street, Wednesday. My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote to you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There really is nothing to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go a good deal to the picture galleries, and for walks and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me at the last pop. Someone has evidently been telling tales. That was Mr. Homewood. He often comes to see us. And he and Mama get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago a man that would just do for you if you are not already engaged to Jonathan. He's an excellent party, being handsome, well off and of good birth. He is a doctor and really clever. Just fancy, he is only nine and twenty. He has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. Mr. Holmwood introduced him to me, and he called here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely imperturbable. I fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face, as if trying to read one's thoughts. He tries this on very much with me, but I flatter myself that he's got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do. And I can tell you that it is not a bad study and gives you more trouble than you can well fancy if you've never tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That is a slang again, but never mind. Arthur says that every day. There it is, all out, Mina. We have told all our secrets to each other since we were children. We have slept together, eaten together, laughed and cried together. And now, though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I am blushing as I write. For although I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words. But, oh, Mina, I love him. I love him, I love him. There, that does me good. I wish I were you, dear, sitting by the fire and dressing as we used to sit, and I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this even to you. I am afraid to stop, or should I tear up the letter? I don't really want to stop, for I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at once, and tell me all that you think about it. Mina, I must stop. Good night. Bless me in your prayers, and Mina, pray for my happiness. Lucy P.S. I need not tell you this is a secret. Good night again, L. Letter, Lucy Weston to Mina Murray, 24th of May. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you and have your sympathy. My dear, it never rains but it pours. How true the old proverbs are. Here am I, who shall be twenty in September, and yet I never had a proposal until today. Not a real proposal, and today I've had three. Just fancy three proposals in one day. Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly, for two of the poor fellows. Oh, Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself. And three proposals. But for goodness sake, don't tell any of the girls, or they would be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas and imagining themselves injured and slighted 
in their very first day at home. They did not get six at least. Some girls are so vain. You and I, Mina, dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soberly into old married women, can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you about the three. But you must keep it a secret, dear, from everyone except, of course, Jonathan. You will tell him, because I would if I were in your place. Certainly tell Arthur. A woman ought to tell her husband everything, don't you think so, dear? And I must be fair. Men like women, certainly their wives, to be quite as fair as they are. And women, I am afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him. Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man, with a strong jaw and a good forehead. He was very cool outwardly, but was nervous all the same. He had evidently been schooling himself as to all sorts of little things, and remembered them, but he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool. And then, when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with a lancet, in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Mina, very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, though he had known me so little, and what his life would be like with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him. But when he saw me cry, he said that he was a brute and would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off and asked if I could love him in time. When I shook my head, his hands trembled. And then, with some hesitation, he asked me if I cared already for anyone else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring my confidence from me, but only to know. Because if a woman's heart was free, a man might have hope. And then, Mina, I felt a sort of duty to tell him there was someone. I only told him that much, and then he stood up, and he looked very strong and very grave as he took both my hands in his, and said he hoped I would be happy and that if I ever wanted a friend, I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina, dear, I can't help crying, and you must excuse this letter for being all blotted. Being proposed to is all very nice and all that sort of thing. And isn't it all a happy thing when you have to see a poor fellow who you know loves you honestly going away and looking all broken? And to know that no matter what he may say at the moment, you're passing quite out of his life. My dear, I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy. Evening. Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off, so I can go on telling you about the day. Well, my dear, number two came after lunch. He's such a nice fellow, an American from Texas. He looks so young, so fresh, and it seems almost impossible that he's been to so many places and has had such adventures. I sympathised with Paul Desdemona when she had such a dangerous stream poured in her ear, even by a black man. I suppose that we women are such cowards that we think a man will save us from fears and we marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man and wanted to make a girl love me. No, I don't, for there was Mr Morris telling us his stories and Arthur never told any, and yet my dear, I am somewhat previous. Mr Quincy P. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. No, he doesn't, for Arthur tried twice to make a chance, and I help him in all I could. I'm not ashamed to say it now. I must tell you beforehand that Mr Morris doesn't always speak slang. That is to say, he never does so to strangers or before them. For he is really well educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out that it amused me to hear him talk American slang. And whenever I was present and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I'm afraid, my dear, he has to invent it all, for it fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I shall ever speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it, as I have never heard him use any as yet. Well, Mr Morris sat down beside me, and looked as happy and jolly as he could, but I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his and said ever so sweetly, Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixings on your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you'll go and join them, seven young women with the lamps when you quit. 
Won't you just hitch up alongside of me and let us go down to the long road together, driving in double harness? Well, he did look so good-humoured and so jolly that it didn't seem half so hard to refuse him as it did poor Dr Seward. So I said as lightly as I could that I did not know anything of hitching and I wasn't broken to harness at all yet. Then he said that he had spoken in a light manner and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so, so grave, so momentous an occasion for him, I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it. I couldn't help feeling a bit serious too. I know, Mina, you will think me a horrid flirt, though I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was number two in one day. And then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet. He looked so earnest over it that I shall never again think that a man must be playful always and never earnest, because he is merry at times. I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him, for suddenly he stopped and said with a sort of manly fervour that I could have loved him for had I been free, Lucy, you are an honest-hearted girl, I know. I should not be here speaking to you as I am now if I did not believe you. Clean grit, right through to the very depths of your soul. Tell me like one good fellow to another, is there anyone else you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again, but will be if you will let me a very faithful friend. My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here I was almost making fun of this great-hearted true gentleman. I burst into tears. I'm afraid, my dear, you will think this is a very sloppy letter in more ways than one. And I really felt very badly. Why can't they let a girl marry three men or as many as want her and save all this trouble? But this is heresy, and I must not say it. I am glad to say that though I was crying, I was unable to look into Mr Morris's brave eyes, and I told him out straight. Yes, there is someone I love, though he has not told me yet that he even loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, for quite a light came into his face, and he put out both his hands and took mine. I think I put them into his and said in a hearty way, That's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning than you being in time for any other girl in the world. Oh, cry, my dear, if it's for me. I'm a hard nut to crack. I'll take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness, well, he better look for it soon or he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend. And that's rarer than a lover. It's more unselfish anyhow. My dear, I'm going to have a pretty lonely walk between this and kingdom come. Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep out the darkness now and then. You can, you know, if you like. For that other good fellow, he must be a good fellow, my dear, and a fine fellow, or you could not love him. Hasn't spoken yet. That quite won me, Mina, for it was brave and sweet of him, and noble too, to a rival, wasn't it? And he so sad, so I leant over and kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I'm afraid I was blushing very much. He said, Little girl, hold your hand, and you have kissed me. If these things don't make us friends, nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and goodbye. He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, went straight out of the room without looking back, without a tear or a quiver or a pause. And I'm crying like a baby. Well, why must a man like that be made unhappy? when there are lots of girls about who would worship the very ground he trod on. I know I would if I were free, only I don't want to be free. My dear, this has quite upset me, and I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once, after telling you of it, and I don't wish to tell of the number three until it can be all happy. Ever your loving Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three. I needn't tell you of a number three, need I? Besides, it was all so confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room, for both his arms were round me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I've done to deserve it. I am not ungrateful to God for all his goodness to me in sending to me such a lover, such a husband and such a friend. Goodbye. Dr Seward's Diary Kept in Phonograph 
25th of May. Ebb tide and appetite today. Cannot eat, cannot rest, so diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went down among the patients. I picked out one who had afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint that I am determined to understand him as well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of this mystery. I questioned him more fully than I have ever done, with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucination. In my manner of doing it there was now I see something of cruelty. I seem to wish to keep him to the point of his madness, a thing which I avoid with the patience as I would the mouth of hell. Memo. Under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? Omnia, Romane, Venulia, Sunt. Hell has its price. Verb, sat. If there be anything between this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards, accurately. So I had better commence to do so. Therefore, R. M. Renfield, age 59. Sanguine temperament, great physical strength. Morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish. Possibly a dangerous man, probably dangerous if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is as secure an armour for their foes as for themselves. What I think of on this point is, when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal. When duty, cause, etc. is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only an accident or a series of accidents can balance it. Letter, Quincy P. Morris to the Honourable Arthur Homewood, 25th of May. My dear Art, we told yarns by the campfire in the prairies, and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marquesas, and drunk health on the shore of Titicassi. There are more yarns to be told, and other wounds to be healed, and other health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party, and that you are free. There will only be one other, our old pal in the career, Jack Seward. He's coming too, and we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup and drink the health of with all our hearts to the happiest man in the wide, wide world, who has won the noblest heart that God has made and the best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome and a loving greeting and a health as true as your own right mind. We shall both swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep a certain pair of eyes. Come, yours as ever and always, Quincy P. Morris. Telegram from Arthur Holmwood to Quincy P. Morris, 26th of May. Count me in every time. I bear messages which will make both your ears tingle. Art. End of chapter 5. Chapter 6 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Mina Murray's Journal. 24th of July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent in which they have rooms. This is such a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. A great viaduct runs across with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the high land on either side, you look right across it, 
unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red roofed, and seem piled up one over the other anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is the scene of part of Marmion, where the girl was built up in the wall. It is a most noble ruin of immense size and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This, to my mind, is the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town and has a full view of the harbour and all up the bay to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbour that part of the bank has fallen away and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place, part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the sandy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them through the churchyard and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here very often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book on my knee and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit up here and talk. The harbour lies below me, with on the far side one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea wall runs along outside of it. On the near side, the sea wall makes an elbow crooked inversely and its end too has a lighthouse. Between the two piers there is a narrow opening into the harbour which then suddenly widens. It's nice at high water but when the tide is out it shoals away to nothing. There is merely the stream of the Esk running between banks of sand with rocks here and there. Outside the harbour on this side there rises for about half a mile a great reef the sharp edge of which runs straight out from behind the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a boy with a bell, which swings in bad weather and sends a, a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He's coming this way. He's a funny old man. He must be awfully old, for his face is all gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he's nearly a hundred, that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very sceptical person. And when I asked him about the bells at sea and the white lady at the abbey, he said, very brusquely, I wouldn't fash myself about them, miss. Them strings will all be wore out. Mind, I don't say there never was, but I do say there wasn't in my time. They'd be all very well for comers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice long lady like you. Them feet folks from York and Leeds that'll always be eating cured errands and drinking tea and looking out to buy a cheap jet would creed ought. I wonder, miss, who'd be bothered telling lies to them, even the newspapers which is full of fool talk. I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from. So I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin when the clock struck six, whereupon he laboured to get up and said, I must gang again with home now, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like to be kept waiting when tea is ready, for it takes me time to crummy about the grease, for there be many of them, miss. I like belly timber, surely by the clock. He hobbled away and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature on the place. They lead from the town up to the church. There are hundreds of them. I do not know how many. And they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must have originally had something to do with the abbey. I shall go home too. Lucy went out visiting with her mother. And as they were only duty calls, I did not go. They will be home by this time. 1st of August. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy. 
We had a most interesting talk with my old friend and the two others who always come and join him. He's evidently Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything and downfaces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, then he bullies them and then takes their silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has just got a beautiful colour since she's been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming up and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people. I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of legend, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember and put it down. It'll be all fool talk, lock, stock and barrel. That's what it be, and no tells. These bands and wafts and burgos and bank guests and and bar guests and bogies, and all of them is only to set bairns and dizzy women a beldering. They be not but air blebs. They and old grims are signs of mornings be all invented by parsons and illsome buke bodies and railway touters to skeer and scun and halflings and to get folks to do something that they don't other incline to it. It makes me ireful to think of them. Why, it's them that's not content with printing lies on paper and preaching them out of pulpits does want to be cutting them on tombstones. Look here all around you, and what art ye will, all them stones yonder holding up their heads as well as they can out of their pride, is a cant simply tumbling down with where to lies wrote about them. Here lies the body, or sacred to the memory, wrote on all of them. Yet in nigh half of them, there be no bodies at all, and the memories of them being cared a pinch or a snuff about, much less sacred, lies all of them, nothing but lies of one kind or another. My God, but it'll be a queer scoldment on day of judgment when they come tumbling up with their death sarks, all grouped together, and trying to drag their tombstones with them to prove how good they was. Some of them trimming and dithering with their hands that doesn't and slippery, them lying in sea, but they can't even keep their grip of them. I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air, and the way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies, that he was showing off, so I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr Swales, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong. Yablins, there may be a poorish few not wrong, saving where they make out the people too good, for there be folk that do think a barn ball be like the sea, if only it be their own. The whole thing be only lies. Now look you here. You come here a stranger, and you see this Kirkgar. I nodded, for I thought it better to assent, though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on. And you can say that all these stones be about folk that apt here snog and snog. I assented again. Then that be just where the lie comes in. Well, there be scores of these lay beds to be tombed as old Dunn's backer box on Friday night. He nudged one of his companions and they all laughed. And my gog, how could they be otherwise? Look at that one. After Sabath, the beer bank, read it. I went over and read. Edward Spenlar, master mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andreas, April 1854, age 30. When I came back, Mr. Swales went on. Who brought him home, I wonder, to Apimir? Murdered off the coast of Andreas? And you concerted his body lay under? Why, well, I could name you a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above. He pointed northwards. Or where the currents may have drifted them. There be stains around us. You can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. This Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father, lost him the lively off Greenland in twenty. 
or Andrew Woodhouse drowned in the same seas in 1777, or John Paxton drowned off Cape Farewell a year later, or old John Rawlings, whose grandfather sailed with me, drowned in the Gulf of Finland in 50. Do you think that all these men will have to make a rush to whip me when the trumpet sounds? I have me other rhythms about it, I tell you that. When they got here, they'd be jumming and jostling one another. That way it'd be like a fight upon the ice in the old days, where we'd all be at one another from daylight to dark, and trying to tie up our cuts by the light of Aurora Borealis. This was evidently local pleasantry, but the old man cackled over it, and his cronies joined in with gusto. But, I said, surely you're not quite correct. Well, you start on the assumption that all the poor people or their spirits will have to take their tombstones with them on the Day of Judgment. Do you think that will be really necessary? Well, what else be their tombstones for? Answer me that, miss. To please their relatives, I suppose. To please their relatives, you suppose? He said this with intense scorn. How will it please their relatives to know that lies is wrought over them? and everybody in the place know that they be lies. He pointed to a stone at our feet, which had been laid down as a slab, on which the seat was rested, close to the edge of the cliff. Read the lies on that steam, he said. The letters were upside down to me from where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leant over and read. Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of a glorious resurrection, on July the 29th, 1873, hauling from the rocks at Kettle Ness, his tome was erected by his sorrowing mother to a dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. Swells, I don't see anything very funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You don't see aught funny, <laughs> but that's because you don't go on the sorrowing mother was a hellcat that hated him. He was a crooked, regular lamentor he was, and he hated her so that he committed suicide in order that she might get the insurance she put on his life. He blew neither the top of his head off with an old musket that they had for scaring crows with. Twan't for crows then, for it brought the clegs and the dopes to him. That's the way he fell off the rocks and so hopes of glorious resurrection. I've often heard him say myself that he hoped he'd go to hell for his mother was so pierced she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he didn't want to addle where she was. Now isn't that stone any red? He hammered it with his stick as he spoke. A pack of lies. And won't it make Gabriel cackle when Geordie comes panting up the priest with a tombstone balanced on his hump and asks to be took as evidence? I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation, as she said, rising up, Oh, why did you tell us of this? It's my favourite seat, and I cannot leave it. And now I must find, I must go sitting over the grave of a suicide. That won't harm you, my pretty, and it may make poor Geordie gladsome to have so trim a lass sitting on his lap. That won't hurt ye, why I've sat there often for nigh on twenty years past, and it hasn't done me no harm. Don't you fash about them as lies on thee. Well, that doesn't lie here either. It'll be time for ye to be getting scart when you see the tombstones all run away with and the place as bare as a stubble field. There's the clock and I must be going. A service to you, ladies. And off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat. She told me over and over again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heart sick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day I came up here alone, for I am very sad. There is no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the light scattered all over the town, sometimes in rows where the streets are, and sometimes singly. They run right up the Esk and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left, the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and the lambs are bleating in the fields away behind me. There is a clatter of donkeys' hooves up the paved road below.
The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz in good time. And further along the quay there is a Salvation Army meeting in a back street. Neither of the bands hears the other. But up here, I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr Seward's Diary 5th of June The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities, very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy and purpose. I wish I could get at what the object is of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not know yet. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious terms in it that I sometimes imagine he's only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment he did not break out into a fury as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment and said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said, that would do. I must watch him. 16th of June. He has turned his mind now to spiders and has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them with his flies and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished. Although he has had to use half his food in attracting more flies from outside his room. 1st of July. His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said he must clear out some of them at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced in this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted me much while with him, for when a horrid blowfly, bloated with some carrion food, buzzed into the room. He caught it, held it exultingly for a few moments between his finger and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment, of one I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, for he keeps a little notebook in which he's always jotting down something. Whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers, added up in batches, and then totals added in batches again, as though he were focusing some account, as the auditors put it. 8th of July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon. And then, oh, unconscious celebration, you will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days, so that I might notice if there were any change. Things remain as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. He's managed to get a sparrow and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple. Already the spiders have diminished, and those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies by tempting them with his food. 19th of July. We are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favour. A very, very great favour. And as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing. A kitten, a nice little sleek, playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity. But I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and the spiders. So I said I would see about it and asked him if he would not rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh yes, I would like a cat. I only ask for a kitten lest you should refuse me a cat. 
No one would accuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden fierce sidelong look which meant killing. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving to see how it will work out, then I shall know more. 10pm. I have visited him again and found him sitting in the corner brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended upon it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word and sat down, gnawing his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning early. 20th of July. Visited Renfield very early before the attendant went his round. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved, in the window and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again and beginning it cheerfully and with good grace. I looked around for his birds and, not seeing them, asked where they were. He replied without turning round that they had flown away. There are a few feathers about the room and on his pillow and a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went out and told the keeper to report to me if there was anything odd about him during the day. The attendant had just been to me and said that Grenfield had been very sick and was disgorging a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, Doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he just took and ate them raw. 11pm. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight enough to make him sleep, and took away his pocket book to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete, and the theory proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him, and call him Zoophagus, life-eating maniac. What he desires to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his latest step would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might have done if there were only a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at the results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect? The knowledge of the brain. Had I even the secret of one such mind? Did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared which Burton Sanderson's physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing. If only there was a sufficient cause. I must not think too much of this. Or I might be tempted, a good cause might turn the scale with me. Or may I not too be of an exceptional brain, congenitally? How well the man reasoned, lunatics always do with their own scope. I wonder how many lives he values a man. Or if at only one. Close the account most accurately. And today began a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me it seemed only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope, and I truly began a new record. So it will be until the great recorder sums me up and closes my ledger account, with a balance to profit or loss. Oh Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on happiness and work. If I only could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend there, a good unselfish cause to make me work, that would indeed be happiness. Mina Murray's Journal The 26th of July. I am anxious and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time. And there is also something about the shorthand symbols that make it a different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. 
I'd not heard from Jonathan for some time and was very concerned. But yesterday, dear Mr. Hawkins, who was always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking him if he had heard, and he said the enclosed had just been received, and it is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and he says that he's just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. And then to Lucy. Although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westenauer has got the idea that sleepwalkers always go out on roofs of houses and along edges of cliffs, and then get suddenly wakened and fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear, she is naturally anxious about Lucy. Lucy's father had the same habit, and he would get up in the night, dress himself and go out. But if he were not stopped, Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning her dresses and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathise with her, for I do the same, only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and I shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr Holmwood, he is the Honourable Arthur Holmwood, the only son of Lord Godalming is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town. For his father is not well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat on the churchyard and show him off the beauty of Whitby. I dare say the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. 27th of July. No news from Jonathan. I'm getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should I do not know. But I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I'm awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot that she cannot get cold. But still the anxiety and the perpetually being awakened is beginning to tell on me, and I'm getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Holmwood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She's lost that anemic look which she had. I pray it will last. 3rd of August. Another week gone, and no news from Jonathan. Not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he's not ill. He surely would have written. Look at the last letter of his, that somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him, yet it is in his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week. But there's an odd concentration about her, which I do not understand. Even in her sleep, she seems to be watching me. She tries the door and finding it locked goes about the room searching for the key. 6th of August. Another three days and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since the last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and when the fishermen say that we are in for a storm, I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a grey day, and the sun, as I write, is hidden in thick clouds, high over Kettle Ness. Everything is grey except the green grass, which seems like an emerald amongst it. Grey earthy rock, grey clouds, tinged with sunburst at the far edge, hang over the grey sea, into which the sand points stretch like grey fingers. The sea is tumbling over in the shallows, and the sandy flats with a roar, muffled in the sea mists drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a grey mist. All is vastness. The clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brule over the sea that sounds like some presage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, 
and see men like trees walking. The fishing boats are racing for home and rise and dip in the ground swell as they sweep into the harbour, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr Swales. He's making straight for me. I can see by the way that he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I've been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could see he was not at ease, so I took the poor old wrinkled hand in mine and asked him to speak fully. So he said, leaving his hand in mine, I'm afraid, my dearie, that I must have shot you by all the wicked things I've been saying about the dead and such like for weeks past. But I didn't mean them, and I want you to remember that when I'm gone, we old folks be daffled, and with one foot abaft the crook hole, do all together like to think of it. And we don't want to feel scart of it, and that's why I've took to making light of it, so that I cheer up my own heart of it. But Lord love ye, miss, I ain't afraid of dying, not a bit. Only I don't want to die if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand now, for I'll be old, and a hundred years is too much for any man to expect. I'm so nigh that the old man is ready, wet in his sigh. You see, I can't get out of the habit of caffing about it all at once. The shafts will wag as they used to. Some day soon the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't ye dole and greet, my dearie, for he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I'd not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only awaiting for something else than what we're doing, and death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content it's coming to me, my dearie, and coming quick. It may be coming while we be looking and wondering. Maybe it's in the wind over the sea that's bringing with it loss and wreck, and sore distress and sad hearts. Look, look, he cried suddenly. There was something in that wind and in the host beyond that sounds. And looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air, I feel it coming. Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes. He held up his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me and blessed me and said goodbye and hobbled off. It all touched me and upset me very much. I was glad when the Coast Guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me, as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. Can't make her out, he said. She's a Russian by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open or to put in here. Look, there again, she steered mightily strangely. Well, she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel. It changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow. End of chapter six. Chapter 7 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Cutting from the Daily Graph, 8th of August. Pasted in Mina Murray's journal. From a correspondent, Whitby. One greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as was ever known. The great body of holiday makers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Rig Mill, Runswick, Staithes, and the various trips in the neighbourhood of Whitby. The steamers Emma and Scarborough made trips up and down the coast and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and fro from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, and some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff churchyard, and from that commanding eminence, 
watch the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east, called attention to a sudden show of mare's tails high in the sky to the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in the mild degree which in barometrical language is ranked number two light breeze. The Coast Guard on duty at once made a report, and one old fisherman, who for more than half a century has kept watch on weather signs from the East Cliff, foretold in an emphatic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly coloured clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff of the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettle Ness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by myriad clouds of every sunset colour, flame purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses not large but of seemingly absolute blackness, in all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm will grace the RA and RI walls in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble, or his mule as they term, the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbour till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm. A sultry heat and that prevailing intensity which on the approach of thunder affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea. Even the coasting steamers which usually hung the shore so closely kept well to seaward. And but a few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sail set which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment while she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in face of her danger. Before the night shut down she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Shortly before ten o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleating of sheep in land or the barking of a dog in the town was distinctly heard, and the band on the pier with its lively French air was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. But a little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then without warning the tempest broke with a rapidity which at the time seemed incredible and even afterwards as is impossible to realise the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury each overtopping its fellow till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White crested waves beat madly on the level sands and rushed up the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spume-swept lanterns of the lighthouses, which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbour, the wind roared like thunder, and blew with such a force that it was difficult, even though strong men kept their feet, or clung with grim glass to the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire piers from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have been increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white wet clouds which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren with clammy hands of death. And many a one shuddered as the wreaths of sea mist swept by. At times the mist cleared and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lighting which now came back thick and fast, followed by such sudden peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. 
Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea running mountains high, through skywards with each wave, mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing boat, with a rag of sail running madly for shelter before the blast. Now and again the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird on the summit of the east cliff. The new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got into working order, and in the pauses of the inrushing mist swept with it the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, as when a fishing boat, with a gunnel under water, rushed into the harbour able by the guidance of the sheltering light so it's to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. By the guidance of the sheltering light to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. As each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on shore, a shout which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale and was then swept away in its rush. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sails set. Apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time backed to the east. There was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff as they realised the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered. And with the wind blowing from its present quarter, it would be quite impossible that she should fetch the entrance of the harbour. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that in their troughs the shallows of the shore were almost visible, and the schooner, with all sails set, was rushing with such speed that in the words of one old salt, she must fetch up somewhere if it was only in hell. Then came another rush of sea fog, greater than any hitherto, a mass of dank mist which seemed to close on all things like a grey pall and left available to men only the organ of hearing, for the roar of the tempest and the crash of the thunder and the booming of the mighty billows came through the damp oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbour mouth across the east pier where the shock was expected and men waited breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast and the remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast. And then Miravel Dictu, between two piers leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast with all sails set and gained the safety of the harbour. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse with drooping head which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on deck at all. A great awe came on all as they realised that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbour unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbour, pitched herself onto that accumulation of sand and gravel, washed by many tides and many storms, into the southeast corner of the pier, jutting under the east cliff, known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand heap. Every spar, rope and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below as if shot up by the concussion, and running forward jumped from the bow onto the sand, making straight for the steep cliff where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to the east pier, so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, thrust steams, or through stones as they call them in the Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has fallen away, disappeared into the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened, it so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tatewheel Pier. 
All those whose houses are in close proximity were either in bed or were out on the heights above. Thus the Coast Guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbour, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb on board. The men working the searchlight after scouring the entrance of the harbour without seeing anything then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The Coast Guard ran aft and then when he came beside the wheel bent over to examine it and recoiled at once as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity and quite a number of people began to run. It was a good way round from the West Cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier but your correspondent is a fairly good runner and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd whom the Coast Guard and police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck and was one of a small group who saw the dead seamen whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised or even awed well, how often can a, such a sight have been seen? The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being both around wrists and wheel, and all kept fast by the binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel and dragged him to and fro, so that the cords which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and the doctor, Surgeon J.M. Caffin, of 33 East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared after making the examination that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle of carefully corked empty, save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have tied up his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was the first on board may save some complications later on in the Admiralty Court, but Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage, which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues are wagging and one young law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statutes of Mortmain, since the tiller, as emblemship, is not proof of delegated possession. It is held in the dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman had been reverently removed from the place where he held his honourable watch and ward till death a steadfastness as noble as that of the young Casabianca, and placed in the mortuary to wait inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, and its fierceness is abating. Crowds are scattering homeward, and the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire wolds. I shall send in time for your next issue further details of the derelict ship which found her way so miraculously into harbour in the storm. Whitby, 9th of August. The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is a Russian from Varna and is called the Demeter. She is almost entirely in ballast of silver sand with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mould. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor Mr S. F. Billington of 17 The Crescent, who this morning went aboard and formally took possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship and paid all harbour dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days wonder, they are evidently determined that there should be no cause of after complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which had landed when the ship struck, and more than a few of the members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. 
To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way onto the moors, where it is still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later on it should in itself become a danger. For it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning a large dog, a half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant close to Tate Hill Pier, was found dead in the roadway opposite his master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly it had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away, and its belly was slit open as if with a savage claw. Later, by the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as to facts of missing men. The greatest interest, however, was with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest, and the more strange narrative than the two between them unfold. It has not been my lot to come across. As there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them, and accordingly send you a rescript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he got well into blue water, and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me, time being short. The log of the Demeter, Varna to Whitby. Written 18th July. Things so strange happening that I shall keep an accurate note henceforth till we land. On 6th of July we finished taking in cargo. Silver sand and boxes of earth. At noon set sail. East wind, fresh. Crew, five hands, two mates. Cook and myself, captain. On 11th of July at dawn entered Bosphorus. Boarded by Turkish customs officers. Bakshish, all correct. Underway at 4 p.m. On 12th of July, through Dardanelles, more custom officers and a flag boat guarding squadron, Bakshish again. Work of officers thorough but quick. Want us off soon. Dark passed into archipelago. On 13th of July, we passed Cape Matapan. Crew dissatisfied about something, seemed scared but would not speak out. On 14th of July, somewhat anxious about crew, men all steady, fellows who have sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with them that day and struck him. Expected a fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16th July, Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. Took larboard watch eight bells last night was relieved by Abuma. Did not go to bunk. Men more downcast than ever. All said they'd expected something of the kind, but would not say more than there was something aboard. Mate getting very impatient with them, feared some trouble ahead. On 17th of July yesterday, one of the men, Old Garden, came to my cabin and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deck house as there was a rainstorm when he saw a tall thin man who was not like any of the crew come up the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously but when he had got to bows found no one and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear and I am afraid the panic may spread. To allay it I shall today search the entire ship carefully from stem to stern. Later in the day I got together the whole crew, told them as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship, we would search from stem to stern. First the mate angry said it was folly to yield to such foolish ideas and would demoralise the men. Said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with the handspike. I let him take the helm while the rest began a thorough search. All keeping abreast with lanterns, we left no corner unsearched, and there were only the big wooden boxes, there were no odd corners where a man could hide. 
Men much relieved when search over, he went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 22nd of July. Rough weather the last three days, and all hands busy with the sails. No time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Mate cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praise men for work in bad weather. Past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well. 24th of July. There seems some doom over this ship. Already a hand short and entering the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead. Yet last night another man lost, disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. Men all in a panic of fear. Sent a round robin, asking to have double watch as they feared to be alone. Mate angry, fear there will be some trouble as either he or the men will do some violence. 28th of July, another tragedy. At a single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck he could find no one except steersman. Raised an outcry and all came on deck. Thorough search but no one found. And now without second mate and crew in a panic. Mate and I agree to go armed henceforth and wait for any sign of cause. 30th of July. Last night rejoiced, we are nearing England, weather fine, all sail set. Retired, worn out, slept soundly, awakened by mate telling me that both men of the watch steersmen are missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work the ship. August the 1st. Two days of fog, another sail sighted. I'd hoped when in the English Channel to be able to signal for help or get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails, I have to run before the wind. Dare not lower as could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting into some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralised than either of the men. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear, working stolidly and patiently with minds made up. They are Russian, he a Romanian. 2nd August, midnight. Woke up from a few minutes' sleep by hearing a cry, seemingly outside my port. I could see nothing in the fog, rushed on deck and ran against the mate. Tells me he heard a cry and ran, but no sign of the man on watch. One more gone. Lord help us. Mate says we must be past the Straits of Dover, as in a moment of fog lifting he saw North Foreland, just as he heard the man cry out. So we are now off in the North Sea. And only God can guide us in the fog, which seems to move with us, and God seems to have deserted us. 3rd of August. At midnight I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it found no one there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before it, there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. After a few minutes he rushed up on deck in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed and haggard. I greatly fear his reason had given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night I saw it, like a man tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows looking out. I crept up behind it and gave it my knife, but the knife went through it, empty as the air. As he spoke he took his knife and drove it savagely into space. Then he went on, but it is here, and I'll find it. It is in the hold, perhaps in one of those boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You work the helm. And with a warning look and his finger on his lip, he went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and a lantern, and go down the forward hatchway. He is mad, stark raving mad and it is no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes, they are invoiced as clay. And to pull them about is as harmless a thing as he could do. So here I stay and mind the helm and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait until the fog clears. Then if I can't steer into any harbour, with the wind that is, I shall cut down the sails and lie by and signal for help. It is nearly all over now, just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him. 
There came up the hatchway a sudden startled scream, which made my blood run cold, and up on the deck he came as if shot from a gun, a raging madman with his eyes rolling, his face convulsed with fear. Save me, save me, he cried, and then he looked round on the blanket of fog, his horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You'd better come too, Captain, before it's too late. He is there. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him. And that's all that is left. Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang on the bullock and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one. And now he has followed them himself. God help me. How am I to account for all those horrors when I get to port? When I get to port, will that ever be? Still fog which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is a sunrise because I am a sailor. Why else I know not? I dared not go below, dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed, and in the dimness of the night I saw it. Him. God forgive me. But the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in blue water. No man can object. But I am captain and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster. For I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail. And along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then by good wind or foul I shall save my soul. And my honour as a captain. I am growing weaker and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, maybe this bottle may be found. And those who find it may understand. If not, well, then all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the saints help a poor ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce and whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is now none to say. The folk here hold almost universally that the captain is simply a hero and he is to be given a public funeral. Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken with a train of boats up the Esk for a piece and then brought back to Tate Hill Pier and up the Abbey Steps for it is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the great dog, at which there is much mourning, for with public opinion in its present state, he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. Tomorrow we shall see the funeral, and so will end this one more mystery of the sea. Mina Murray's Journal, 8th of August. Lucy was very restless all night, and I too could not sleep. The storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly among the chimney pots, it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came, it seemed to be like a distant gun. Strangely enough, Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, each time I awoke in time, I managed to undress her without waking her, and got her back to bed. It's a very strange thing, this sleepwalking, for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there be any, disappears, and she yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning we both got up and went down to the harbour to see if anything had happened in the night. There were very few people about, and although the sun was bright and the air clear and fresh, the big grim looking waves that seemed dark themselves because the foam that topped them was like snow forced themselves in through the narrow mouth of the harbour like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow I felt glad that Jonathan was not on the sea last night but on land. But oh is he on land or sea? Where is he and how? I am getting fearfully anxious about him. If I only knew what to do and could do anything. 10th of August. The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. Every boat in the harbour seemed to be there, and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the churchyard. 
Lucy came with me, and we went early to our old seat, whilst the cortege of boats went up the river to the viaduct and came down again. We had a lovely view and saw the procession nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest quite near our seat, so that we stood on it when the time came and saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night was telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness. Or if there be, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause in that. Poor old Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat. His neck had been broken. He had evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that men said made them shudder. Poor dear old man. Perhaps he had seen death with his dying eyes. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels the influences more acutely than other people do. Just now she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed. Though I am, myself, very fond of animals, one of the men who came up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog is always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry nor heard the dog bark. During the service the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat, but kept a few yards off, barking and howling. His master spoke to it gently, and then harshly, and then angrily, but it would neither come nor cease to make a noise. It was in a sort of fury with its eyes savage, and all its hair bristling out like a cat's tail when puss is on the warpath. Finally the man too got angry, and jumped down and kicked the dog, and took it by the scruff of the neck, and half dragged and half threw it on the tombstone on which the seat is fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing became quiet and fell into a tremble. It did not try to get away, but crouched down, quivering and cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror, although I tried, though without effect, to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog, but looked at it in an agonised sort of way. I greatly fear she is too super-sensitive for nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this tonight, I am sure. The whole agglomeration of things, the ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads, the touching funeral, the dog, now furious and now in terror, will afford material for her dreams. I think it would be best for her to go to bed tired out physically, so I shall take her for a long walk by the cliffs to Robin Hood's Bay and back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleepwalking then. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight Mina Murray's Journal. Same day, eleven o'clock. Oh, but I am tired. If it were not that I had made my diary of duty, I should not open it tonight. We had such a lovely walk with Lucy. After a while, I was in gay spirits owing, I think, to some dear cows who came nosing towards us in a field close to the lighthouse and frightened the wits out of us. I believe we forgot everything except, of course, personal fear, and it seemed to wipe the slate clean and give us a fresh start. We had a capital severe tea at Robin Hood's Bay in a sweet little old-fashioned inn with a bow window right over the seaweed-covered rocks of the Strand. I believe we should have shot the new woman with our appetites. Men are more tolerant, bless them. Then we walked home with some or rather many stoppages to rest and with our hearts full of a constant dread of wild bulls. Lucy was really tired and we intended to creep off to bed as soon as we could. The young curate came in, however, and Mrs. Westerner asked him to stay for supper. Lucy and I had both a fight for it with the dusty miller. I knew it was a hard fight on my part, and I'm quite heroic. I think that some day the bishops must get together and see about bringing up a new class of curates who don't take supper, 
no matter how they may be pressed to, and who will know when girls are tired. Lucy is asleep and breathing softly. She has more colour in her cheeks than usual, and looks oh so sweet. If Mr. Holmwood fell in love with her, seeing her only in the drawing room, I wonder what he would say if he saw her now. Some of the new women writers will some day start an idea that men and women should be allowed to see each other asleep before proposing or accepting, but I suppose that the new woman wouldn't condescend in future to accept that she will do the proposing herself, and a nice job she will make of it too. There's some consolation in that. I'm so happy tonight because dear Lucy seems better. I really believe she has turned the corner and that we're over her troubles with dreaming. I should be quite happy if I only knew if Jonathan, God bless and keep him. 11th of August, 3am, diary again. No sleep now, so I may as well write. I'm too agitated to sleep. We had such an adventure, such agonising experiences. I fell asleep as soon as I'd closed my diary. Suddenly I became broad awake and sat up with a horrible sense of fear upon me from some feeling of emptiness around me. The room was dark, so I could not see Lucy's bed. I stole across and felt for her. The bed was empty. I lit a match and found she was not in the room. The door was shut, but not locked as I had left it. I feared to wake her mother, who has been more than usually ill lately. So I threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. As I was leaving the room, it struck me that the clothes she wore might give me some clue to her dreaming intention. Dressing gown with me now, dress outside. Dressing gown and dress were both in their places. Thank God, I said to myself, she cannot be far, she's only in her nightdress. I ran downstairs and looked in the sitting room. Not there. Then I looked in all the other open rooms of the house, with an ever-growing fear chilling my heart. I finally came to the hall door and found it open. It was not wide open. The catch of the lock had not caught. The people of the house are careful to lock the door every night, so I feared that Lucy must have gone out as she was. There was no time to think of what might happen. A vague, overmastering fear obscured all details. I took a big heavy shawl and ran out. The clock was striking one as I was in the crescent. There was not a soul in sight. I ran along the north terrace but could see no sign of the white figure which I expected. At the edge of the west cliff above the pier, I looked across the harbour to the east cliff in the hope, or fear, I don't know which, of seeing Lucy in our favourite seat. There was a bright full moon with heavy black driving clouds which threw the whole scene into a fleeting diorama of light and shade as they sailed across. For a moment or two I could see nothing as the shadow of a cloud obscured St Mary's Church and all around it. Then as the cloud passed I could see the ruins of the Abbey coming into view and as the edge of a narrow band of light sharp as a sword cut moved along the church and the churchyard became gradually visible. Whatever my expectation was, it was not disappointed, for there, on our favourite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. The coming of the cloud was just too quick for me to see much, but shadow shut down on light almost immediately, but it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat, where the white figure shone and bent over it. What it was, whether a man or beast, I could not tell. I did not wait to catch another glance, but flew down the steep steps to the pier, along by the fish market to the bridge, which was the only way to reach the east cliff. The town seemed as dead, for not a soul did I see. I rejoiced that it was so, for I wanted no witness to poor Lucy's condition. Time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled and my breath became laboured as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighted with lead, and as though every joint in my body were rusty. When I got almost to the top, I could see the seat and the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it, even through the spells of shadow. 
There was undoubtedly something long and black bending over the half-reclining white figure. I called in fright, Lucy, Lucy, and something raised a head, and from where I was I could see a white face and red gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer. I ran into the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered, the church was between me and the seat, and for a minute or so I lost sight of her. When I came in view again, the cloud had passed, and the moonlight struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy half reclining, with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone, and there was not a sign of any living thing about. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing, not softly as usual with her, but in long, heavy gasps as though striving to get her lungs full at every breath. As I came close, she put up her hand in her sleep and pulled the collar of her nightdress close around her throat. While she did so, there became a little shudder through her, as though she felt the cold. I flung the warm shawl over her and drew the edges tight round her neck, for I dreaded lest she should get some deadly chill from the night air, unclad as she was. I feared to wake her all at once, so in order to have my hands free that I might help her, I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety pin. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety and pinched or pricked her with it, for by and by when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again and moaned. When I had her carefully wrapped up, I put my shoes on her feet and then began very gently to wake her. At first she did not respond, but gradually she became more uneasy in her sleep, moaning and sighing occasionally. At last, as time was passing fast, and for many other reasons I wished to get her home at once, I shook her more forcibly, till finally she opened her eyes and awoke. She did not seem surprised to see me, as of course she did not realise all at once where she was. Lucy always wakes prettily, and even at such a time when her body must have been chilled with cold and her mind somewhat appalled at waking unclad in the churchyard at night, she did not lose her grace. She trembled a little and clung to me when I told her to come at once with me home. She rose without a word with the obedience of a child. As we passed along, the gravel hurt my feet. And Lucy noticed me wince. She stopped and wanted to insist upon my taking my shoes, but I could not. However, when we got to the pathway outside the churchyard, there was a puddle of water remaining from the storm. I daubed my feet with mud, using each foot in turn, so that as we went home, no one, in case we should meet anyone, should notice my bare feet. Fortune favoured us, and we got home without meeting a soul. Once we saw a man, who seemed not quite sober, passing along the street in front of us, but we hid in a door till he had disappeared, up an opening such as there are here, steep little closes, or winds as they call them in Scotland. My heart beat so loud all the time that sometimes I thought I should faint. I was filled with anxiety about Lucy, not only for her health, lest she should suffer from the exposure, but for her reputation in case the story should get wind. When we got in and had washed our feet and had said a prayer of thankfulness together, I tucked her into bed. Before falling asleep, she asked, even implored me, not to say a word to anyone, even her mother, about her sleepwalking adventure. I hesitated at first to promise, but on thinking of the state of her mother's health and how the knowledge of such a thing would fret her, and thinking too of how such a story might become distorted, nay, infallibly would, in case it should leak out. I thought it wiser to do so. I hope I did right. I have locked the door and the key is tied to my wrist, so perhaps I shall not be again disturbed. Lucy is sleeping soundly. The reflex of the dawn is high and far over the sea. Same day, noon. All goes well. Loosely set till I woke her and seemed not to have even changed her sight. The adventures of the night does not seem to have harmed her. On the contrary, it has benefited her, for she looks better this morning than she has done for weeks. 
I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety pin hurt her. Indeed, it might have been serious, for the skin of her throat was pierced. I must have pinched up a piece of loose skin and have transfixed it, for there are two little red points like pin pricks, and on the band of the nightdress was a drop of blood. When I apologised and was concerned about it, she laughed and petted me and said she did not even feel it. Fortunately, it cannot leave a scar as it is so tiny. Same day, night. We passed a happy day. The air was clear, the sun bright. There was a cool breeze. We took our lunch to Mulgrave Woods. Mrs. Weston are driving by the road and Lucy and I walking by the cliff path and joining her at the gate. I felt a little sad myself, for I could not feel but how absolutely happy it would have been had Jonathan been with me. But there I must only be patient. In the evening we strolled in the casino terrace and heard some good music by Spore and Mackenzie and went to bed early. Lucy seemed more restful than she has been for some time and fell asleep at once. I shall lock the door and secure the key the same as before, though I do not expect any trouble tonight. 12th of August my expectations were wrong, for twice during the night I was wakened by Lucy trying to get out. She seemed even in her sleep to be a little impatient at finding the door shut, and went back to bed under a sort of protest. I woke with the dawn and heard the birds chirping out of the window. Lucy woke too, and I was glad to see it was even better than on the previous morning. All of her old gaiety of manner seemed to have come back. She came and snuggled in beside me, told me all about Arthur. I told her how anxious I was about Jonathan, and she tried to comfort me. Well, she succeeded somewhat, for though sympathy can't alter facts, it can help to make them more bearable. 13th of August. Another quiet day, and to bed with the key on my wrist as before. Again I woke in the night and found Lucy sitting up in bed, still asleep, pointing to the window. I got up quietly, and pulling aside the blind, looked out. It was brilliant moonlight, and the soft effect of the light over the sea and sky merged together in one great silent mystery. It was beautiful beyond words. Between me and the moonlight flitted a great bat, coming and going in great whirling circles. Once or twice it came quite close, but was, I suppose, frightened at seeing me, and flitted away across the harbour towards the abbey. When I came back from the window, Lucy had lain down again and was sleeping peacefully. She did not stir again all night. 14th of August On the East Cliff, reading and writing all day, Lucy seems to have become as much in love with the spot as I am. And it is hard to get her away from it when it is time to come home for lunch or tea or dinner. This afternoon she made a funny remark. We were coming home for dinner and just come to the top of the steps up from the West Pier and stopped to look at the view, as we generally do. The setting sun lay low down in the sky, it was just dropping behind Kettle Ness. The red light was thrown over the east cliff and the old abbey seemed to bathe everything in beautiful rosy glow. We were silent for a while and suddenly Lucy murmured, as if to herself, his red eyes again. They are just the same. Such an odd expression, coming a propos of nothing, that it quite startled me. I slewed round a little so as to see Lucy, well, without seeming to stare at her, and saw that she was quite in a half-dreamy state, with an odd look on her face that I could not quite make out. So I said nothing but followed her eyes. She appeared to be looking over at our own seat, whereupon was a dark figure seated alone, I was a little startled myself, for it seemed for an instant as if the stranger had great eyes like burning flames, but a second look dispelled the illusion. The red sunlight was shining in the windows of St Mary's Church beyond the seat, and as the sun clipped there was just sufficient to change the refraction and recollection to make it appear as if the light moved. I called Lucy's attention to the peculiar effect, and she became herself with a start. But she looked sad all the same. It may have been that she was thinking of that terrible night up there. We never refer to it, 
so I said nothing. We went home to dinner. Lucy had a headache and went away to bed. I saw her asleep and went out for a little stroll myself. I walked along the cliffs to the west and was full of sweet sadness, for I was thinking of Jonathan. When coming home, it was then bright moonlight, so bright that through the front of our part of the crescent was in shadow. Everything could be well seen. I threw a glance up at our window and saw Lucy's head leaning out. I thought that perhaps she was looking out for me, so I opened my handkerchief and waved it. She did not notice or make any movement whatever. Just then the moonlight crept round an angle of the building and the light fell on the window. There distinctly was Lucy with her head lying up against the side of the window sill and her eyes shut. She was fast asleep and by her, seated on the window sill, there was something that looked like a good sized bird. I was afraid she might get a chill, so I ran upstairs, but as I came into the room, she was moving back to her bed, fast asleep, and breathing heavily. She was holding her hand to her throat, as though to protect it from cold. I did not wake her, but tucked her up warmly. I have taken care that the door is locked and the window securely fastened. She looks so sweet as she sleeps, but she is paler than is her wont. There is a drawn, haggard look under her eyes which I do not like. I fear she is fretting about something. I wish I could find out what it is. 15th of August. Rose later than usual. Lucy was languid and tired and slept on after we had been called. We had a happy surprise at breakfast. Arthur's father is better and wants the marriage to come off soon. Lucy is full of quiet joy, and her mother is glad and sorry at once. Later on in the day she told me the cause. She is grieved to lose Lucy as her very own, but she is rejoiced that she is soon to have someone to protect her. Poor dear sweet lady, she confided to me that she has got her death warrant. She has not told Lucy, and made me promise secrecy. Her doctor told her that within a few months at most she must die, for her heart is weakening. At any time, even now, a sudden shock would be almost sure to kill her. Ah, we were wise to keep from her the affair of the dreadful night of Lucy's sleepwalking. 17th of August No diary for two whole days. I have not had the heart to write. Some sort of shadowy pall seems to be coming over our happiness. No news from Jonathan, and Lucy seems to be growing weaker, whilst her mother's eyes are numbering to a close. I do not understand Lucy's fading away as she is doing. She eats well, she sleeps well, and enjoys the fresh air. But all the time, the roses in her cheeks are fading, and she gets weaker and more languid day by day. At night I hear her gasping as if for air. I keep the key of our door always fastened to my wrist at night. But she gets up and walks around the room and sits at the open window. Last night I found her leaning out when I woke up. And when I tried to wake her, I could not. She was in a faint. When I managed to restore her, she was as weak as water and cried silently between long, painful struggles for breath. When I asked her how she came to be at the window, she shook her head and turned away. I trust her feeling ill may not be from that unlucky prick of the safety pin. I looked at her throat just now as she lay asleep, and the tiny wounds seem not to have healed. They are still open, and if anything, larger than before. The edges of them are faintly white. They are like little white dots with red centres. Unless they heal within a day or two, I shall insist on the doctor seeing about them. Letter, Samuel F. Billington and Son, Solicitors, Whitby to Messrs. Carter, Patterson and Co. London, 17th of August. Dear Sirs, Herewith, please receive invoice of goods sent by Great Northern Railway. Same are to be delivered at Carfax, near Purfleet, immediately on receipt at Good Station, King's Cross. The house is at present empty, but in close please find all keys, all of which are labelled. 
You will please deposit the boxes, 50 in number, which form the consignment of the partially ruined building forming part of the house and marked A on a rough diagram enclosed. Your agent will easily recognise the locality as it is the ancient chapel of the mansion. The goods leave by the train at 9.30 tonight and will be due at King's Cross at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. As our client wishes the delivery made as soon as possible, we shall be obliged by your having teams ready at King's Cross at the time named and forthwith conveying the goods to the destination. In order to obviate any delays possible through any routine requirements payment in your departments, we enclose a check here with of £10, receipt of which please acknowledge. Should the charge be less than this amount, you can return balance. If greater, we shall at once send a check for the difference on hearing from you. You are to leave the keys on coming away in the main hall of the house, where the proprietor may get them on his entering the house by means of his duplicate key. Pray do not take us as exceeding the bounds of business courtesy, impressing you in all ways to use the utmost expedition. We are, dear sirs, faithfully yours, Samuel F. Billington and Son. Letter Messrs. Carter and Patterson Co., London, to Messrs. Billington and Son, Whitby. 21st of August Dear Sirs, we beg to acknowledge £10 received and return the cheque for £1.17 shillings and ninepence, amount of overplus as shown in receipted account herewith. Goods are delivered in exact accordance with instructions and keys left in parcel in main hall as directed. We are, dear Sirs, yours respectfully, Pro Carter, Patterson & Co. Mina Murray's Journal 18th of August. I'm happy today and writing, sitting on the seat in the churchyard. Lucy is ever so much better. Last night she slept well at night and did not disturb me once. The roses seem to be coming back into her cheeks, though she is still sadly pale and wan looking. If she were in any way anemic, I could understand it, but she is not. She is in gay spirits and full of life and cheerfulness. All the morbid reticence seems to have passed from her, and she has just reminded me, as if I need any reminding, of that night and that it was here, on this very seat, I found her asleep. As she told me, she tapped playfully with the heel of a boot on the stone slab and said, My poor little feet didn't make much noise. I dare say that poor old Mr Swales would have told me that it was because I didn't want to wake up Geordie. As she was in such a communicative humour, I asked her if she had dreamed at all that night. Before she answered, that sweet puckered look came into her forehead, which Arthur, I call him Arthur from her habit, says he loves, and indeed I don't wonder that he does. She went on in a half-dreaming kind of way as if trying to recall it to herself. I didn't quite dream, but it all seemed to be real. I only wanted it to be here in this spot. I don't know why, for I was afraid of something. I don't know what I remember, though I suppose I was asleep passing through the streets and over the bridge. A fish leapt as I went by, and I leaned over to look at it, and I heard a lot of dogs howling. The whole town seemed as if it must be full of dogs all howling at once. And I went up the steps, and I had a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes, just as we saw in the tunnel and something very sweet and very bitter all around me at once. And then I seemed sinking into green water, and there was a singing in my ears as I heard that it was to drowning men, and then everything seemed passing away from me. My soul seemed to go out from my body and float around in the air. I seemed to remember that once the West Lighthouse was right under me, there was a sort of agonising feeling as if I were in an earthquake and I came back and found you shaking my body. I saw you do it before I felt you. She began to laugh. It seemed a little uncanny to me, and I listened to her breathlessly. I did not quite like it, and I thought it better not to keep her mind on the subject. So we drifted on to other subjects, and Lucy was like her old self again. 
When we got home, the fresh breeze had braced her up, and her pale cheeks were really more rosy. Her mother rejoiced when she saw her, and we all spent a very happy evening together. 19th August Joy, joy, joy. Well, not at all joy at last news of Jonathan. The dear fellow has been ill, and that's why he did not write. I am not afraid to think or say it now that I know. Mr Hawkins sent me on the letter and wrote himself, oh so kindly. I am to leave in the morning and go over to Jonathan and to help to nurse him if necessary and bring him home. Mr Hawkins says it would not be a bad thing if we were to be married out there. I have cried over the good sister's letters until I can feel it wet against my bosom where it lies. It is of Jonathan and must be next my heart for he is in my heart. My journey is all mapped out and my luggage ready. I am only taking one change of dress. Lucy will bring my trunk to London and keep it till I send for it. For it may be that I, I must write no more. I must keep it to say to Jonathan, my husband, the letter that he has seen and touched must comfort me till we meet. Letter, Sister Agatha, Hospital of St. Joseph and Steen Mary, Budapest, to Miss Wilhelmina Murray, 12th of August. Dear Madam, I write by desire of Mr. Jonathan Harker, who is himself not strong enough to write, although progressing well, thanks to God and St. Joseph and St. Mary. He has been under our care for near six weeks, suffering from a violent brain fever. He wishes me to convey his love and to say that by this post I write for him to Mr. Peter Hawkins, Exeter, to say with all his dutiful respects that he is sorry for his delay and that all of his work is completed. He will require some few weeks rest in our sanitarium in the hills, but will then return. He wishes me to say that he has not sufficient money with him and that he would like to pay for his staying here so that others who need shall not be wanting for help. Believe me, yours with sympathy and all blessings, Sister Agatha. P.S. My patient being asleep, I open this to let you know something more. He has told me about you and that you are shortly to be his wife. All blessings to you both. He has had some fearful shock, so says our doctor, and his delirium, his ravings have been dreadful, of wolves and poison, of blood, of ghosts and demons. And I fear to say that be careful with him, and I fear to say of what. Be careful with him always, that there may be nothing to excite him of this kind for a long time to come. The traces of such an illness do not lightly die away. We should have written long ago, but we knew nothing of his friend, and there was on him nothing that anyone could understand. He came in the train from Klosenberg, and the guard was told by the station master but he rushed into the station shouting for a ticket for home. Seeming from his violent demeanour that he was English, they gave him a ticket for the furthest station on the way thither that the train reached. Be assured he is well cared for. He has won all our hearts by his sweetness and gentleness. He is truly getting on well and I have no doubt will in a few weeks be all himself. But be careful of him for safety's sake. There are, I pray, God and St. Joseph and St. Mary, many, many happy years for you both. Dr. Seward's Diary, 19th of August. Strange and sudden change in Renfield last night. About eight o'clock he began to get excited and sniff about, as a dog does when setting. The attendant was struck by his manner, and knowing my interest in him, encouraged him to talk. He is usually respectful to the attendant, and at times servile. But tonight the man tells me he was quite haughty, would not condescend to talk with him at all. All he would say was, I don't want to talk to you, you don't count now, the master is at hand. The attendant thinks it's some sudden form of religious mania which has seized him. If so, we must look out for squalls, for a strong man with a homicidal and religious mania at once, might be dangerous. The combination is a dreadful one. At nine o'clock I visited him myself. 
His attitude to me was the same as that to the attendant. In his sublime self-feeling, the difference between myself and the attendant seemed to him as nothing. It looks like a religious mania, and he will soon think that he himself is God. These infinitesimal distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being. How these madmen give themselves away. The real God taketh heed lest a sparrow fall. But the God created from human vanity sees no difference between an eagle and a sparrow. Oh, if men only knew. For half an hour or more, Renfield kept getting excited in a greater and greater degree. I did not pretend to be watching him, but I kept strict observation all the same. All at once that shifty look came into his eyes, which we always see when a madman has seized an idea, and with it the shifty movement of the head and back, which asylum attendants come to know so well. He became quite quiet. I went to sat on the edge of his bed resignedly, and looked into space with lacklustre eyes. I thought I would find out if his apathy were real or only assumed, and tried to lead him to talk of his pets, a theme which had never failed to excite his attention. At first he made no reply, but at length said, testily, bother them all, I don't care a pin about them. What, I said? You don't mean to tell me you don't care about spiders? Spiders are at present his hobby, and the notebook is filling up with columns of small figures. To this he answered enigmatically, The bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride. But when the bride draweth nigh, then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled. He would not explain himself, but remained obstinately seated on his bed all the time I remained with him. I'm weary tonight and low in spirits. I cannot but think of Lucy and how different things might have been. If I don't sleep at once, Chloral, the modern Morpheus, c 2 hc dot h 2 must be careful not to let it grow into a habit, nor shall I take none tonight. I have thought of Lucy and I shall not dishonour her by mixing the two. If need be, tonight shall be sleepless. Later. Glad I made the resolution. Glad that I kept to it. I had lain tossing about and had heard the clock strike only once. When the night watchman came to me, sent up from my ward, to say that Renfield had escaped. I threw on my clothes, ran down at once. My patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about. Those ideas of his might work out dangerously with strangers. The attendant was waiting for him. He said he had seen him not ten minutes before, seemingly asleep in his bed, when he had threw the observation trap in the door. His attention was called by the sound of the window being wrenched out. He ran back and saw his feet disappear through the window, and had at once sent up for me. He was only in his night gear and cannot be far off. The attendant thought it would be more useful to watch where he should go than to follow him, as he might lose sight of him whilst getting out of the building by the door. He is a bulky man and couldn't get through the window. I am thin, so with his aid I got out, but feet foremost, and, as we were only a few feet above ground, landed unhurt. The attendant told me the patient had gone to the left and had taken a straight line, so I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of trees, I saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house. I ran back at once and told the watchman to get three or four men immediately and follow me into the grounds of Carfax. In our case, our friend might be dangerous. I got a ladder myself and crossing the wall, dropped down on the other side. I could see Renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house, so I ran after him. On the far side of the house I found him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. He was talking apparently to someone, but I was afraid to go near enough to hear what he was saying, lest I might frighten him and he should run off. Chasing an errant swarm of bees is nothing to following a naked lunatic when the fit of escaping is upon him. After a few minutes, however, I could see that he did not take note of anything around him. 
and so ventured to draw near to him, the more so as my men had now crossed the wall and were closing him in. I am here to do your bidding, master. I am your slave, and you will reward me, for I shall be faithful. I have worshipped you long and far off, but now you are near, I await your commands. And you will not pass me by, will you, dear master, in your distribution of good things? He is a selfish old beggar anyhow. He thinks that of the loaves and fishes, even when he believes he is a real presence. His manias make a startling combination. When we closed in on him, he fought like a tiger. He is immensely strong, for he was more like a wild beast than a man. I never saw a lunatic in such a paroxysm of rage before, and hope I shall not again. It is a mercy that we have found out his strength and his danger in good time. With strength and determination like his, he might have done wild work before he was caged. He is safe now at any rate. Jack Shepherd himself couldn't get free from the straight waistcoat that keeps him restrained, and he's chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries at times are awful, but the silences that follow are more deadly still, for he means murder in every turn and movement. Just now he spoke coherent words for the first time. I shall be patient, Master. It is coming, coming, coming. So I took the hint and came too. I was too excited to sleep, but this diary has quieted me, and I feel I shall get some sleep tonight. End of chapter 8《ดราคูลาบายบรัมสโตเกอร์》《ดิสลิบริบอกซ์》《รีคอร์ดิ้งอยู่ในพับลิกโดเมนชั่นไนน์ข้อหนึ่งเลขหนึ่งมีนา
I saw that amongst them was his notebook, and was going to ask him to let me look at it, for I knew then I might find some clue to his trouble. But I supposed he must have seen my wish in my eyes, for he sent me over to the window saying he wanted to be quite alone for a moment. Then he called me back, and when I came he had his hand over the notebook, and he said to me very solemnly, Wilhelmina, I knew then that he was in deadly earnest, for he has never called me by that name since he asked me to marry him. You know, my dear, my ideas of the trust between husband and wife, there should be no secret, no concealment. I have had a great shock, and when I try to think of what it is I feel, my head spins round. And I do not know if it was all real or the dreaming of a madman. You know I have had brain fever, and that it is to be mad. The secret is here, and I do not want to know it. I want to take up my life here with our marriage. For, my dear, we have decided to be married as soon as the formalities are complete. Are you willing, Wilhelmina, to share my ignorance? Here is the book. Take it and keep it. Read it, if you will. But never let me know, unless indeed some solemn duty should come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, sane or mad, recorded here. He fell back exhausted, and I put the book under his pillow and kissed him, having asked Sister Agatha to beg the superior to let our wedding be this afternoon, and I am waiting her reply. She has come and told me that the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. We are to be married in an hour, or as soon after as Jonathan awakes. Lucy, the time has come and gone. I feel very solemn, but very happy. Jonathan woke a little after the hour and was all ready and he sat up in bed propped up with pillows. He answered his I will firmly and strongly. I could hardly speak. My heart was so full that even those words seemed to choke me. The dear sisters were so kind. Please God, I shall never forget them, nor the grave and sweet responsibilities I have taken upon me. I must tell you of my wedding present. When the chaplain and the sisters had left me alone with my husband, oh Lucy, it is the first time I have written the words my husband, left me alone with my husband, I took the book from under his pillow and wrapped it up in white paper and tied it with a little bit of pale blue ribbon which was round my neck and sealed it over the knot with sealing wax. And for my seal I used my wedding ring and I kissed it and showed it to my husband and told him that I would keep it so, and then it would be an outward and visible sign for us all our lives that we trusted each other, that I would never open it unless it were for his own dear sake, or for the sake of some stern duty. And he took my hand in his, and oh Lucy, it was the first time he took his wife's hand, and said that it was the dearest thing in all the wide world, and that he would go through all that past again, win it if need be. The poor dear meant to have said a part of the past, but he cannot think of time yet, and I shall not wonder if at first he mixes up not only the month, but the year. Well, my dear, what could I say? I could only tell him that I was the happiest woman in all the wide world, and that nothing to give him except myself, my life and my trust, and that with these went my love and duty for all the days of my life. And my dear, when he kissed me and drew me to him with his poor weak hands, it was like a very solemn pledge between us. Lucy, dear, do you know why I tell you all this? It's not only because it's all sweet to me, but because you have been and are very dear to me. It was my privilege to be your friend and guide when you came to the schoolroom to prepare for the world of life. I want you to see now and with the eyes of a very happy wife with the duty has led me so that in your own married life you too may be happy as I am. My dear, please almighty God, your life may be all promises. A long day of sunshine with no harsh wind, no forgetting duty, no distrust. I must not wish you no pain, for that can never be. But I do hope that you'll always be as happy as I am now. Goodbye, my dear. I shall post this at once and perhaps write you very soon again. I must stop for Jonathan is waking. I must attend to my husband, your ever-loving Mina Harker.
Letter to Lucy Westenra from Mina Harker. Whitby, 30th of August. My dearest Mina, oceans of love, millions of kisses. May you soon be in your own home with your husband. I wish you could be coming home soon enough to stay with us here. The strong air would soon restore Jonathan, as it has quite restored me. I have an appetite like a cormorant, full of life and sleep well. You'd be glad to know that I've quite given up walking in my sleep. I think I've not stirred out of my bed for a week. That is, when I once got into it at night. Arthur says I'm getting fat. By the way, I forgot to tell you that Arthur is here. We have such walks and drives and rides and rowing and tennis and fishing together. And I love him more than ever. He tells me that he loves me more, but I doubt that. For at first he told me that he couldn't love me more than he did. But this is nonsense. There he is calling to me, so no more just at present. From your loving Lucy. P.S. Mother sends her love. She seems better, poor dear. P.P.S. We are to be married on the 28th of September. Dr. Seward's diary. 20th of August. The case of Renfield grows even more interesting. He has now so far quieted that there are spells of cessation from his passion. For the first week after his attack, he is perpetually violent. Then one night as the moon rose, he grew quiet, kept murmuring to himself, Now I can wait, now I can wait. The attendant came to tell me, so I ran down at once to have a look at him. He was still in the straight waistcoat and in the padded room. But the suffused look had gone from his face. His eyes had something of their old pleading, I might almost say cringing softness. I was satisfied with his present condition and directed him to be relieved. The attendants hesitated, but finally carried out my wishes without protest. It was a strange thing that the patient had humour enough to see their distrust. For coming close to me, he said in a whisper, all the while looking furtively at them, Think I could hurt you? Fancy me hurting you, the fools. It was soothing somehow to feelings to find myself disassociated, even in the mind of this poor madman from the others. But all the same, I do not follow his thought. Am I to take it that I have anything in common with him, so that we are, as it were, stand together? Or has he to gain from me some good so stupendous that my well-being is needful to him? I must find out later on. Tonight he will not speak. Even the offer of a kitten, or even of a full-grown cat, will not tempt him. He will only say, I don't take any stock in cats. I have more to think of now. I can wait. I can wait. After a while I left him. The attendant tells me that he was quiet until just before dawn, and that he began to get uneasy. He had then violent, until at last he fell into a paroxysm, which exhausted him so that he swooned into a sort of coma. Three nights has the same thing happened, violent all day, then quiet from moonrise to sunrise. Wish I could get some clue to the cause. It would almost seem as if there was some influence which came and went. Happy thought. We shall have tonight place sane wits against mad ones. He escaped before without our help. Tonight he shall escape with it. We should give him a chance and have the men ready to follow, in case they are required. 23rd of August. The unexpected always happens. A well Disraeli new life. Our bird, when he found the cage open, would not fly. So all our subtle arrangements were for naught. At any rate, we have proved one thing. That the spells of quietness last a reasonable time. We shall in future be able to ease his bonds for a few hours each day. I've given orders to the night attendant merely to shut him up in the padded room, when once he is quiet, until an hour before sunrise, the poor soul's body will enjoy the relief, even if his mind cannot appreciate it. Hark! The unexpected again, I am called. The patient has once more escaped. Later, another night adventure. Renfield artfully waited until the attendant was entering the room to inspect. Then he dashed out past him and flew down the passage. I sent word for the attendants to follow. Again he went into the grounds of the deserted house. 
and we found him in the same place, pressed against the old chapel door. When he saw me, he became furious, and had not the attendant seized him in time, he would have tried to kill me. As we were holding him, a strange thing happened. He suddenly redoubled his efforts, and then, as suddenly, grew calm. I looked round instinctively, but could see nothing. Then I caught the patient's eye and followed it, but could trace nothing as it looked into the moonlit sky, except a big bat, which was flapping its silent and ghostly way to the west. Bats usually wheel and flit about, but this one seemed to go straight on, as if he knew where he was bound for, or had some intention of his own. The patient grew calmer every instant, and presently said, You needn't tie me, I should go quietly. Without trouble we came back to the house. I felt there was something ominous in his calm, and shall not forget this night. Lucy Westerner's Diary Hellingham, 24th of August. I must imitate Mina and keep writing things down. Then we can have long talks when we do meet. I wonder when it will be. I wish she were with me again, for I feel her so unhappy. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I was at Whitby. Perhaps it is the change of air, or getting home again. It is all dark and horrid to me, for I can remember nothing. But I am full of vague fear, and I feel so weak and worn out. When Arthur came to lunch, he looked quite grieved when he saw me. I hadn't the spirit to try to be cheerful. I wonder if I could sleep in Mother's room tonight. I shall make an excuse and try. 25th of August. Another bad night. Mother did not seem to take to my proposal. She seems not too well herself. And doubtless she fears to worry me. I tried to keep awake and succeeded for a while. But when the clock struck twelve, it waked me from a doze. So I must have been falling asleep. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window, but I did not mind it. And as I remember no more, I suppose I must have fallen asleep. More bad dreams. I wish I could remember them. This morning I am horribly weak. My face is ghastly pale and my throat pains me. It must be something wrong with my lungs, for I don't ever seem to be able to get air enough. I shall try to cheer up when Arthur comes, or else I know he will be miserable to see me so. Letter Arthur Holmwood to Dr. Seward Albemarle Hotel, 31st of August My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favour. Lucy is ill, that is, she has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. I have asked her if there is any cause. I do not dare to ask her mother, for to disturb the poor lady's mind about her daughter in her present state of health would be fatal. Mrs. Western has confided to me that her doom is spoken, disease of the heart. Though poor Lucy doesn't know it yet, I am sure there is something preying on my dear girl's mind. I am almost distracted when I think of her, so look at her gives me a pang. I told her I should ask you to see her, and though she demurred at first, I know why, old fellow, she finally consented. It will be a painful task for you, I know, old friend, but it is for her sake and I must not hesitate to ask, or you to act. You are to come to lunch at Hillingham tomorrow, two o'clock, so as not to arouse any suspicion in Mrs. Westenra, and after lunch Lucy will take an opportunity of being alone with you. I shall come in for tea, and we can go away together. I am filled with anxiety. I want to consult with you alone as soon as I can, after you have seen her. Do not fail, Arthur. Telegram, Arthur Holmwood to Seward, 1st of September. I'm summoned to see my father who is worse. I'm writing. Write me fully by tonight's post to ring my me if necessary. Letter from Dr. Seward to Arthur Holmwood, 2nd of September. My dear old fellow, with regard to Miss Westerner's health, I hasten to let you know at once that in my opinion there is not any functional disturbance or any malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with her appearance. She is woefully different from what she was when I saw her last. Of course, you must bear in mind that I did not have a full opportunity of examination 
such as I should wish. Our very friendship makes a little difficulty which not even medical science or custom can bridge over. I'd better tell you exactly what happened, leaving you to draw, in a measure, your own conclusions. I shall then say what I have done and propose doing. I found Miss Westenhouse in seemingly gay spirits. Her mother was present and in a few seconds I made up my mind that she was trying all she knew to mislead her mother and prevent her from being anxious. I have no doubt she guesses, if she does not know, what need of caution is there. We lunched alone, and as we all exerted ourselves to be cheerful, we got on as some kind of reward for our labours, some real cheerfulness amongst us. Then Miss Weston and I went to lie down, and Lucy was left with me. We went into her boudoir, and till we got there her gaiety remained, for the servants were coming and going. As soon as the door was closed, however, the mask fell from her face, and she sank down into a chair with a great sigh, and hid her eyes with her hand. When I saw that her high spirits had failed, I at once took advantage of her reactions to make a diagnosis. She said to me very sweetly, I cannot tell you how I loathe talking about myself. I reminded her that a doctor's confidence was sacred. That you were grievously anxious about her. She caught on to my meaning at once and settled the matter in a word. Tell Arthur everything you choose. I do not care for myself, but all for him. I am quite free. I could easily see that she is somewhat bloodless, but I could not see the usual anemia signs. And by chance I was actually able to test the quality of her blood. For an opening a window which was stiff, a cord gave way, and she cut her hand slightly with broken glass. It was a slight matter in itself, but it gave me an evident chance. So I secured a few drops of her blood and have analysed them. The qualitative analysis gives quite a normal condition, and shows, I should infer, in itself a vigorous state of health. In other physical matters, I was quite satisfied that there is no need for anxiety. But as there must be some cause somewhere, I have come to the conclusion that it must be something mental. She complains of difficulty in breathing, satisfactorily at times, and of heavy lethargic sleep, with dreams that frighten her, but regarding which she can remember nothing. She says that as a child she used to walk in her sleep, and that when it whipped me the habit came back, and that once she walked out in the night and went to East Cliff when Miss Murray found her. But she assures me that of late the habit has not returned. I am in doubt, and so have done the best thing I know of. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I have asked him to come over, and as you told me that all things are to be at your charge, I have mentioned to him who you are and your relation is to Miss Westerner. This, my dear fellow, is in obedience to your wishes, for I am only too proud and happy to do anything I can for her. Van Helsing would, I know, do anything for me, for a personal reason, so no matter on what ground he comes, we must accept his wishes. He is a seemingly arbitrary man, and this is because he knows what he's talking about better than anyone else. He is a philosopher and a metaphysician one of the most advanced scientists of his day, and he has, I believe, an absolutely open mind. This with an iron nerve, a temper of the ice brook, and an indomitable resolution, self-command and toleration exalted from virtues to blessing, and the kindliest and truest heart that beats. These form his equipment for the noble work that he is doing for mankind, work both in theory and practice, for his views are as wide as his all-embracing sympathy. I tell you these facts that you may know why I have such a confidence in him. I've asked him to come at once. I shall see Miss Weston out tomorrow again. She is to meet me at the store so that I may not alarm her mother by too early a repetition of my call. Yours always, John Seward. Letter. Abraham Van Helsing, MDD, PhD. Lit, etc., 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 to Dr. Seward. 
2nd of September. My good friend, when I have received your letter, I am already coming to see you. But by good fortune, I can leave just at once without wrong to any of those who have trusted me. Were fortune other than it were for bad for those who I have trusted. For I come to my friend when he called me to aid those he holds dear. Tell your friend that when you suck from my wound so swiftly the poison of the gangrene from that knife in our other friend, too nervous, let slip. You did more for him when he wants my aids and you call for them than all his great fortune could do. But it is a pleasure added to do for him, your friend, as it is to you that I come. Have then rooms for me at the Great Eastern Hotel, that I may be near at hand. And please, it so, arrange that we may see the young lady not too late on tomorrow, for it is likely that I may have to return here that night. But if need be, I shall come again in three days, and stay longer if it must. Till then, goodbye, my friend John. Van Helsing. Letter to Dr. Seward, Honourable Arthur Homewood. 3rd of September. My dear Art, Van Helsing has come and gone. He came on with me to Hillingham and found that by Lucy's discretion her mother was lunching out, so that we were alone with her. Van Helsing made a very careful examination of the patient. He used to report to me and I shall advise you for, of course, I was not present all the time. He is, I fear, much concerned, but says he must think. When I told him of our friendship, how you trust me in the matter, he said, you must tell him all you think. Tell him what I think. If you can guess it, you will. Nay, I'm not jesting. There is no jest but life and death, perhaps more. I asked what he meant by that, for he was very serious. This was when we had come back to town, and he was having a cup of tea before starting on his return to Amsterdam. He would not give me any further clue. You must not be angry with me, Art, because his very reticence means that all of his brains are working for her good. He will speak plainly enough when the time comes, be sure. So I told him I would simply write an account of our visit, just as if I were doing a descriptive special in the article for the Daily Telegraph. He seemed not to notice, but remarked that the smuts of London were not quite so bad as they used to be when he was a student here. I am to get his report tomorrow, if he can possibly make it. In any case, I am to have a letter. Well, as to the visit, Lucy was more cheerful than on the day I first saw her and certainly looked better. She had lost something of the ghastly look that so upset you, and her breathing was normal. She was very sweet to the Professor, as she always is, and tried to make him feel at ease, though I could see that the poor girl was making a hard struggle for it. For I believe Van Helsing saw it too, for I saw the quick look under his bushy eyebrows that I knew of old. And he began to chat of all things except ourselves and diseases. And with such an infinite geniality that I could see poor Lucy's pretense of animation merge into reality. Then, without any seeming change, he brought the conversation gently round to his visit and suavely said, My dear young miss, I have the so great pleasure because you are so much beloved. That is much, my dear, ever were there that which I do not see. They told me you were down in the spirit and that you were ghastly pale. To them I say poof. And he snapped his fingers and went on. But you and I shall show them how wrong they are. How can he? And pointed at me with the same look and gesture as that with which once pointed me out of his class. On, or rather after, a particular occasion which he never fails to remind me of. Know anything of a young ladies? He has his madams to play with and to bring them back to happiness and to choose those that love them. It is much to do, but oh, oh, there are rewards that we can bestow such happiness. The young ladies, he has no wife or, nor daughter, 
and the young do not tell themselves to the young, but to the old like me, who have known so many sorrows and the causes of them. So, my dear, we will send him away to smoke the cigarette in the garden, while you and I have a little talk all to ourselves. I took the hint and strolled about. Presently the Professor came to the window and called me in. He looked grave, but said, I have made a careful examination, but there is no functional cause. With you I agree that there has been much blood lost. It has been, but it is not. But the conditions of her are in no way anemic. I have asked her to send me her maid, that I may ask just one or two questions. That so I may not chance miss nothing. I know well what she will say. And yet there is a cause. There's always a cause for everything. I must go back home and think. You must send me the telegram every day. And if there be cause, I shall come again. The disease, for not to be all, well, is a disease. Interests me. And the sweet young dear, she interests me too. She charmed me, and for her, if not for you or disease, I come. As I tell you, he would not say a word more, even when we were alone. And so now, Art, you know all I know. I shall keep a stern watch. I trust your poor father is rallying. It must be a terrible thing to you, my dear old fellow, to be placed in such a position between two people who are both so dear to you. I know your idea of duty to your father and your right to stick to it. But if need be, I shall send you word to come at once to Lucy, so do not be over-anxious unless you hear from me. Dr Seward's Diary, 4th of September. Suffagius patient still keeps up our interest in him. There's only one outburst, and that was yesterday at an unusual time. Just before the stroke of noon, he began to grow restless, the attendant knew the symptoms and at once summoned aid. Fortunately, the men came at a run and were just in time, for at the stroke of noon he became so violent that it took all their strength to hold him. In about five minutes, however, he began to get more and more quiet and finally sank into a sort of melancholy, in which state he has remained up to now. The attendant tells me that his screams, whilst in the paroxysm, were really appalling. I found my hands full when I got in, attending to some of the other patients, who were frightened by him. Indeed, I can understand the effect, for the sounds disturbed even me, though I was some distance away. It is now after the dinner hour of the asylum, and as yet my patient sits in the corner brooding, with a dull, sullen, woebegone look on his face, which seems rather to indicate than to show something directly. I cannot quite understand it. Later, another change in my patient. At five o'clock, I looked in on him and found him seemingly happy and contented as he used to be. He was catching flies and eating them and was keeping note of his capture by making nail marks on the edge of the door between the ridges of padding. When he saw me, he came over and apologised for his bad conduct and asked me in a very humble, cringing way not to be led back to his own room and have his notebook again. I thought it well to humour him. So he's back in his room with the window open. He has the sugar of his tea spread out on the windowsill and is reaping quite a harvest of flies. He is not now eating them, but putting them into a box as of old and is already examining the corners of his room to find a spider. I tried to get him to talk about the past few days, for any clue to his thoughts would be of immense help to me, but he would not rise. For a moment or two he looked very sad and said in a sort of faraway voice, as though saying it rather to himself than to me, all over, all over, he has deserted me, no hope for me now unless I do it for myself. Then, suddenly turning to me in a resolute way, he said, Doctor, won't you be very good to me and let me have a little more sugar? I think it would be good for me. And the flies, I said. Yes, the flies like it too. And I like the flies, therefore I like it. 
and there are people who know so little as to think that madmen do not argue. I procured him a double supply and left him as happy a man as I suppose any in the world. I wish I could fathom his mind. Midnight. Another change in him. I had been to see Miss Westerner, who I found much better, and had just returned and was standing at our own gate looking at the sunset, when once more I heard him yelling, as his room is on this side of the house. I could hear it better than in the morning. It was a shock to me to turn from the wonderful smoky beauty of a sunset over London, with its lurid lights and inky shadows, and all the marvellous tints that come on foul clouds, as even on foul water to realise all the grim sternness of my own cold stone building, with its wealth of breathing misery, and my own desolate heart to endure it all. I reached him just as the sun was going down, and from his window saw the red disc sink. As it sank, he became less and less frenzied, and just as it dipped, he slid from the hands that held him, an inert mass on the floor. It's wonderful, however, what intellectual recuperative power lunatics have for within a few minutes he stood up quite calmly looked around him signalled to the attendants not to hold him for i was anxious to see what he would do he went straight over to the window and brushed out the crumbs of sugar then he took his fly box and emptied it outside and threw away the box and he shut the window and crossing over sat down on the bed all this surprised me so i asked him are you going to keep flies any more no, said he, I'm sick of all that rubbish. He certainly is a wonderfully interesting study. I wish I could get some glimpse of his mind, or of the cause of his sudden passion. Stop, there may be a clue after all. If we can find out why today his paroxysms came on at high noon and at sunset, can it be that there is a malign influence of the sun, periods which affect certain natures, as at times the moon does others? We shall see. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 4th of September. Patient still better today. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 5th of September. Patient greatly improved. Good appetite. Sleeps naturally. Good spirits. Colour coming back. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 6th of September. Terrible change for the worse. Come at once. Do not lose an hour. I hold over telegram to Holmwood till I have seen you. End of chapter 9Letter, Dr. Seward, to the Honourable Arthur Holmwood, 6th of September. My dear Art, my news today is not so good. Lucy this morning had gone back a bit. There is, however, one good thing which has arisen from it. Mrs. Westenra was naturally anxious concerning Lucy and has consulted me professionally about her. I took advantage of the opportunity and told her that my old master, Van Helsing, the great specialist, was coming to stay with me, and that I would put her in his charge conjointly with myself. So now we can come and go without alarming her unduly. For a shock to her would mean sudden death, and this, in Lucy's weak condition, might be disastrous to her. We are hedged in with difficulties, all of us, my poor old fellow, but please God we shall come through them all right. If any need, I shall write so that if you do not hear from me, take it for granted that I am simply waiting for news in haste. Yours ever, John Seward. Dr. Seward's Diary, 7th of September. The first thing Van Helsing said to me when we met at Liverpool Street was, Have you said anything to our young friend, the lover of her? No, I said. I waited until I had seen you. As I said in my telegram, I wrote him a letter simply telling him that you were coming as Miss Westenra was not so well and that I should let him know if need be. 
Right, my friend, he said. Quite right. Does he not know you as yet? Perhaps he shall never know. I pray so. But if he be needed, then he shall know all. And my good friend John, let me caution you. All men are mad in some way or the other. And inasmuch as you deal discreetly with your madmen, so you deal with God's madmen too, the rest of the world. You tell not your madmen what you do, nor why you do it. You tell them not what you think, so you shall keep knowledge in its place, where it may rest, where it may gather its kind around it, and breed. You and I shall keep as yet what we know here and here. He touched me on the heart and on the forehead, and touched himself the same way too. I have for myself thoughts at the present. Later I shall unfold to you. Why not now, I asked. It may do some good. We may arrive at some decision. He stopped and looked at me and said, My friend John, when the corn is grown, even before it is ripened, while the milk of its mother earth is in him, and the sunshine has not yet begun to paint him with his gold, the husbandman, he pull the ear and rub him between his rough hands and blow away the green chaff and say to you, Look, he's good corn. He will make a good crop when the time comes. I did not see the application and told him so. For reply, he reached over and took my ear in his hand and pulled it playfully, as he used long ago to do at lectures, and said, The good husbandman tell you so, then because he knows, but not till then, that you do not find the good husbandman dig up his planted corn to see if he grow. That is for the children who play at husbandry, and not for those who take it as of the work of their life. See you now, friend John. I have sown my corn, and nature has her work to do in making it sprout, if he sprout at all. There's some promise, and I wait till the ear begins to swell. He broke off, for he evidently saw that I understood, and he went on very gravely. You were always a careful student, and your casebook was ever more full than the rest. You were only student then, now you are master. I trust that good habit have not failed. Remember, my friend, that knowledge is stronger than memory, and we should not trust the weaker. Even if you have not kept the good practice, let me tell you that this case of our dear miss is one that may be, mind I say may be, of such interest to us and others, that all the rest may not make him kick the beam, as your people say. And take good note of it, nothing is too small. I counsel you, put down in record even your doubts and surmises. Hereafter it may be of interest to you to see how true you guess. We learn from failure, not from success. When I describe Lucy's symptoms, the same as before, but infinitely more marked, he looked very grave, but said nothing. He took with him a bag in which were many instruments and drugs the ghastly paraphernalia of our beneficial trade, as he once called it in one of his lectures, the equipment of a professor of the healing craft. When we were shown in, Mrs. Westenrahm met us. She was alarmed, but not nearly so much as I expected to find her. Nature, in one of her beneficent moods, has ordained that even death has some antidote to its own terrors. Here, in a case where any shock may prove fatal, Matters are so ordered that from some cause or other, the thing's not personal, even the terrible change in her daughter, to whom she is so attached, do not seem to reach her. It's something like why Dame Nature gathers round a foreign body an envelope of some insensitive tissue which can protect from evil that which it would otherwise harm by contact. If this be an ordered selfishness, then we should pause before we condemn any one for the voice of egoism, for there may be deeper root for its causes than we have knowledge of. I used my knowledge of this place of spiritual pathology and laid down a rule that she should not be present with Lucy or think of her illness more than was absolutely required. She assented readily, so readily that I saw again the hand of nature fighting for life. Van Helsing and I were shown up to Lucy's room. If I was shocked when I saw her yesterday, I was horrified when I saw her today. She was ghastly, chalkily pale. The red seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums. 
and the bones of her face stood out prominently. Her breathing was painful to see or hear. Van Helsing's face grew set as marble, and his eyebrows converged till they almost touched over his nose. Lucy lay motionless and did not seem to have the strength to speak. So for a while we were all silent. Then Van Helsing beckoned to me, and we went gently out of the room. The instant we had closed the door, he stepped quickly along the passage to the next door, which was open. Then he pulled me quickly in with him and closed the door. My God, he said, this is dreadful. There is no time to be lost. She will die for sheer want of blood, to keep the heart's action as it should be. There must be a transfusion of blood at once. Is it you or me? I am younger and stronger, Professor. It must be me. Then get ready at once. I will bring up my bag. I am prepared. I went downstairs with him. As we were going, there was a knock on the hall door. When we reached the hall, the maid had just opened the door, and Arthur was stepping quickly in. He rushed up to me, saying in an eager whisper, Jack, I was so anxious. I read between the lines of your letter and have been in agony. Dad was better, so I ran down here to see for myself. Is not that gentleman Dr. Van Helsing? I am so thankful to you, sir, for coming. When first the professor's eye had lit upon him, he had been angry at his interruption at such a time. But now as he took his stalwart proportions and recognised the strong and young manhood which seemed to emanate from him, his eyes gleamed. Without a pause, he said to him gravely as he held out his hand, Sir, you have come in time. You are the lover of our dear miss. She is bad, very, very bad. Nay, my child, do not go on like that, for he suddenly grew pale and sat down in a chair, almost fainting. You are to help her. You can do more than any that live, and your courage is your best help. What can I do? asked Arthur hoarsely. Tell me and I shall do it. My life is hers and I'd give the last drop of my blood in my body for her. The Professor has a strongly humorous side. and I could see from old knowledge detect a trace of its origin in his answer. My young sir, I do not ask so much as that. Not the last. What shall I do? There was fire in his eyes and his open nostril quivered with intent. Van Helsing slapped him on the shoulder. Come, he said, you're a man, and it is a man we want. You're better than me, better than my friend John. Arthur looked bewildered, and the professor went on, by explaining in a kindly way, Young Miss is bad, very bad. She wants blood, and blood she must have or die. My friend John and I have consulted, and we are about to perform what we call a transfusion of blood to transfer from full veins of one to the empty veins which pine for him. John was to give his blood, and he is the more young and strong than me. Here Arthur took my hand and wrung it hard in silence. But now you are here, you are more good than us, old or young, who toil much in the world of thought. Our nerves are not so calm, and our blood not so bright than yours. Arthur turned to him and said, if you only knew how gladly I would die for her, you would understand. He stopped with a sort of choke in his voice. Good boy, said Van Helsing. In the not so far off, you will be happy that you have done all for her you love. Come now and be silent. You shall kiss her once before it's done. But then you must go, and you must leave at my side. Say no word to Madame. You know how it is with her. There must be no shock. Any knowledge of this would be one. Come. We all went up to Lucy's room. Arthur, by direction, remained outside. Lucy turned her head and looked at us, but said nothing. She was not asleep, but she was simply too weak to make the effort. Her eyes spoke to us. That was all. Van Helsing took some things from his bag and laid them on a little table out of sight. Then he mixed a narcotic. Coming over to the bed, he said cheerily, now, little miss, here is your medicine. Drink it off like a good child. See, I lift you so, so that to swallow is easy. Yes, she had made the effort with success. It astonished me how long it took the drug to act. This, in fact, marked the extent of her weakness. The time seemed endless until sleep began to flicker in her eyelids. At last, however, the narcotic began to manifest 
its potency, and she fell into a deep sleep. When the professor was satisfied, he called Arthur into the room and bade him strip off his coat. And he added, you may take that one little kiss whilst I bring over the table. Friend John helped to me. So neither of us looked whilst he bent over her. And Helsing, turning to me, said, He is so young and strong of blood, so pure, that we need not defibrillate it. Then with a swiftness, but with the absolute method, Van Helsing performed the operation. As the transfusion went on, something like life seemed to come back to poor Lucy's cheeks. And through Arthur's growing pallor, the joy of his face seemed absolutely to shine. After a bit, I began to grow anxious, for the loss of blood was telling on Arthur, strong man as he was. It gave me an idea of what a terrible strain Lucy's system must have undergone. But what weakened Arthur only partially restored her. But the professor's face was set, and he stood watch in hand, and with his eyes fixed now on the patient and now on Arthur, I could hear my own heart beat. Presently he said in a soft voice, do not stir an instant. It is enough. You attend to him. I will look to her. When all was over, I could see how much Arthur was weakened. I dressed the wound and took his arm to bring him away. When Van Helsing spoke without turning round, the man seems to have eyes in the back of his head. The brave lover, I think, deserve another kiss, which he shall have presently. And as he had now finished his operation, he adjusted the pillow to the patient's head. As he did so, the narrow black velvet band, which she seems always to wear round her throat, buckled with an old diamond's buckle, which her lover had given her, was dragged a little up and showed a red mark on her throat. Arthur did not notice it, but I could hear the deep hiss of indrawn breath, which is one of Van Helsing's ways of betraying emotion. He said nothing at the moment, but turned to me, saying, Now take down our brave young lover, give him of the port wine, and let him lie down a while. He must then go home and rest, sleep much and eat much, that he may be recruited of what he has so given to his love. He must not stay here. Hold a moment. I may take it, sir, that you are anxious of result. Then bring it with you that in all ways the operation is successful. You have saved her life this time, and you can go home and rest easy in mind. All that can be is. I shall tell her all when she is well. She shall love you none the less for what you have done. Goodbye. When Arthur had gone, I went back to the room. Lucy was sleeping gently, but her breathing was stronger. I could see the counterpane moving as her breast heaved by the bedside and Van Helsing looking at her intently. The velvet band again covered the red mark. I asked the professor in a whisper, What do you make of that mark on her throat? What do you make of it? I've not examined it yet, I answered. And then and there proceeded to loose the band, just over the external jugular vein. There were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome looking, and there was no sign of disease, but the edges were white and worn looking, as if by some trituration. It at once occurred to me that this wound, or whatever it was, might be the means of that manifest loss of blood. But I abandoned the idea as soon as formed, for such a thing could not be. The whole bed would have drenched to a scarlet with the blood which the girl must have lost to leave such a pallor as she had before the transfusion. Well, said Van Helsing. Well, said I, I can make nothing of it. The professor stood up. I must go back to Amsterdam tonight, he said. There are books and things there which I want. You must remain here all the night, and you must not let your sight pass from her. Shall I have a nurse, I asked. We are the best nurses, you and I. You keep watch all night, see that she is well fed, and that nothing disturbs her. You must not sleep all the night. Later on we can sleep, you and I. I shall be back as soon as possible, and then we may begin. May begin, I said. What on earth do you mean? We shall see, he answered as he hurried out. He came back a moment later and put his head inside the door and said with a warning finger held up, 
Remember, she is your charge. If you leave her and harm befall, you shall not sleep easy hereafter. Dr. Seward's Diary Continued 8th of September I sat up all night with Lucy. The opiate worked itself off towards dusk, and she waked naturally. She looked a different being from what she had been before the operation. Her spirits even were good, and she was filled with a happy vivacity. But I could see evidences of what the absolute prostration which she had undergone. When I told Mrs. Westenar that Dr. Van Helsing had directed that I should sit up with her, she almost pooh-poohed the idea, pointing out her daughter's renewed strength and excellent spirits. I was firm, however, and made preparations for my long vigil. When I made a prepared her for the night, I came in, having in the meantime had supper, and took a seat by the bedside. She did not in any way make objection, but looked at me gratefully whenever I caught her eye. After a long spell, she seemed sinking off to sleep, but with an effort seemed to pull herself together and shook it off. This was repeated several times, with greater effort and with shorter pauses as time moved on. It was apparent that she did not want to sleep, so I tackled the subject at once. You do not want to go to sleep? No, I am afraid. Afraid to go to sleep? Why so? It is the boon we all crave for. Ah, not if you were like me. If sleep was to you a presage of horror. A presage of horror? What on earth do you mean? I don't know. I don't know. It's what is so terrible. All this weakness comes to me in sleep until I dread the very thought. But, my dear girl, you may sleep tonight. I am here watching you, and I can promise that nothing will happen. Oh, I can trust you. I seized the opportunity and said, I promise you that if I see any evidence of bad dreams, I will wake you at once. You will? Oh, will you really? How good you are to me, then I will sleep. And almost at the word, she gave a deep sigh of relief and sank back asleep. All night long I watched by her. She never stirred, slept on and on in a deep, tranquil, life-saving, health-giving sleep. Her lips were slightly parted, and her breast rose and fell with the regularity of a pendulum. There was a smile on her face, and it was evident that no bad dreams had come to disturb her peace of mind. In the early morning her maid came, and I left her in her care, and took myself back home, for I was anxious about many things. I sent a short wire to Van Helsing and to Arthur, telling him of the excellent result of the operation. My own work, with its manifold arrears, took me all day to clear off. It was dark when I was able to inquire about my suffagious patient. The report was good. He had been quite quiet for the past day and night. A telegram came from Van Helsing at Amsterdam, whilst I was at dinner, suggesting that I should be at Hillingham tonight, as it might be well to be at hand, and stating that he was leaving by night mail and would join me early in the morning. 9th of September. I was pretty tired and worn out when I got to Hillingham. For two nights I had hardly had a wink of sleep, and my brain was beginning to feel that numbness which marks cerebral exhaustion. Lucy was up and in cheerful spirits. When she shook hands with me, she looked sharply at my face and said, No sitting up tonight for you. You're worn out. I'm quite well again. Indeed I am. If there is to be any sitting up, it is I who will sit up with you. I would not argue the point, but went on and had my supper. Lucy came with me, and enlivened by her charming presence, I made an excellent meal and had a couple of glasses of the more than excellent port. Then Lucy took me upstairs and showed me a room next to her own, where a cosy fire was burning. Now, she said, you must stay here. I shall leave this door open and my door too. You can lie on the sofa, for I know that nothing would induce any of you doctors to go to bed whilst there's a patient above the horizon. If I want anything, I shall call out and you can come to me at once. I could not but acquiesce, for I was dog-tired and could not have sat up had I tried. So on her renewing her promise to call me if she should want anything, I lay on the sofa and forgot all about everything. 
Lucy Westenra's Diary, 9th of September. I feel so happy tonight. I've been so miserably weak that to be able to think and move about is like feeling sunshine after a long spell of east wind out of a steel sky. Somehow Arthur feels very close to me. I seem to feel his presence warm about me. I suppose it is that sickness and weakness are selfish things and turn our inner eyes and our sympathy on ourselves, whilst health and strength give love rain. And, in thought and feeling, he can wander where he wills. I know where my thoughts are, if only Arthur knew. My dear, dear, your ears must tingle as you sleep, as mine do waking. Oh, the blissful rest of last night, how I slept with that dear, good Dr. Seward watching me. And tonight I shall not fear to sleep, since she is close at hand and within call. Thank everybody for being so good to me. Thank God. Good night, Arthur. Dr. Seward's Diary, 10th of September. I was conscious of the professor's hand on my head, started awake and all in a second. That is one of the things that we learn in an asylum, at any rate. And how is our patient? Well, when I left her, or rather when she left me, I answered, come, let us see, he said. And together we went into the room. The blind was down, and I went over to raise it gently, whilst Van Helsing stepped with his soft cat-like tread over to the bed. As I raised the blind and the morning sunlight fell into the room, I heard the Professor's low hiss of inspiration, and knowing its rarity, a deadly fear shot through my heart. As I passed over, he moved back, and his exclamation of horror, got in Himmel, needed no enforcement from this agonised face. He raised his hand and pointed to the bed, and his iron face was drawn and ashen white. I felt my knees begin to tremble. There on the bed, seemingly in a swoon, lay poor Lucy, more horribly white and wan-looking than ever. Even the lips were white, and the gums seemed to have shrunken back from the teeth, as we sometimes see in a corpse, after a prolonged illness. Van Helsing raised his foot to stamp in anger, but the instinct of his life and all the long years of habit stood to him, and he put it down again softly. Quick, he said, bring the brandy. I flew to the dining room and returned with the decanter. He wetted the poor white lips with it, and together we rubbed the palms and wrist and heart. He felt her heart, and after a few moments of agonising suspense, said, it's not too late. It beats, though but feebly. All our work is undone. We must begin again. There is no young Arthur here now. I have to call upon yourself this time, friend John. As he spoke, he was dipping into his bag and producing the instruments for the transfusion. I had taken up my coat and rolled up my shirt sleeve. There is no possibility of an opiate at present and no need of one. And so, without a moment's delay, we began the operation. After a time, it did not seem a short time either, for the draining away of one's blood, no matter how willingly it be given, is a terrible feeling. Van Helsing held up a warning finger. Do not stir, he said, but I fear with growing strength she may wake, and that would make danger, oh, so much danger. But I shall precaution take. I shall give hypodermic injection of morphia. He proceeded then swiftly and deftly to carry out his intent. The effect on Lucy was not bad, for the faint seemed to merge subtly into the narcotic sleep. It was with a feeling of personal pride that I could see a faint tinge of colour steal back into the pallid cheeks and lips. No man knows, till he experiences it, what it is to feel his own lifeblood drawn away into the veins of a woman he loves. The Professor watched me critically. That will do, he said. Already I remonstrated. He took a great deal more than art, to which he smiled, a sad sort of smile, as he replied. He is a lover, her fiancé. You have work, much work to do. For her, for others, and the present will suffice. When we stopped the operation, he attended to Lucy, whilst I applied digital pressure to my own incision. I lay down whilst I waited his leisure to attend to me, for I felt faint and a little sick. By and by he bound up my wound and sent me downstairs to get a glass of wine for myself. As I was leaving the room he came after me and half whispered, 
mind nothing must be said of this if our young lover should turn up unexpected as before no word to him no. would at once frighten him and in jealous him too there must be none so when i came back he looked at me carefully and said you are not much the worse go into the room and lie on your sofa and rest a while then have much breakfast and come to it to me i followed out his orders for i knew how right and wise they were i had done my part and now my next duty was to keep up my strength i felt very weak and in the weakness lost something of the amazement at what had occurred i fell asleep on the sofa however wondering over and over how lucy had made such a retrograde movement and how she could have been drained of so much blood with no sign anywhere to show for it i think i must have continued my wonder in my dreams sleeping and waking my thoughts always came back to the little punchers in her throat and the ragged exhausted appearance of their edges tiny though they were lucy slept well into the day when she woke she was fairly well and strong though not nearly so much so as the day before when van helsing had seen her he went out for a walk leaving me in charge with the strict injunctions that i was not to leave her for a moment i could hear his voice in the hall asking the way to the nearest telegraph office lucy chatted with me freely and seemed quite unconscious that anything had happened i tried to keep her amused and interested when her mother came to see her she did not seem to notice any change whatever but said to me gratefully we owe you so much dr seward for all you have done but you really must now take care not to overwork yourself you're looking pale yourself but you want a wife to nurse and look after you a bit that you do as she spoke lucy turned crimson though it was only momentarily for her poor wasted veins could not stand for long such an unwanted drain to the head reaction came in the excessive pallor as she turned her imploring eyes upon me i smiled and nodded and laid my finger on my lips with a sigh she sank back amid her pillows van helsing returned in a couple of hours and presently said to me now you go home and eat much and drink enough make yourself strong i stay here tonight i shall sit up with little miss myself you and i must watch the case and we must have none other to know i have grave reasons do not ask them think what you will do not fear to think even the most not probable good night in the hall two of the maids came to me and asked if they or either of them might not sit up with miss lucy they implored me to let them and when i said it was dr van helsing's wish that neither he nor i should sit up they asked me quite piteously to intercede with the foreign gentleman i was much touched by their kindness perhaps it is because i am weak at present and perhaps it was on lucy's account that their devotion was manifested over and over again i've seen similar instances of women's kindness i got back here in time for a late dinner went my rounds all well and set this down whilst waiting for sleep it is coming 11th of september this afternoon i went over to hillingham found van helsing in excellent spirits and lucy much better shortly after i had arrived a big parcel from a board came from the professor he opened it with much impressment assumed of course and showed a great bundle of white flowers these are for you miss lucy for me oh dr van helsing yes my dear but not for you to play with these are medicines here lucy made a wry face nay but sure they're not to take in a, a decoction or in nauseous form so you need not snub that so charming nose oh, i shall point out to my friend arthur what woes he may have to endear in seeing so much beauty that he so loves so much distort aha uh -huh, my pretty miss that i bring you the so nice nose all straight again this is medicinal but you do not know how i put him in your window and make a pretty wreath and hang him round your neck so that you sleep well oh yes like like the lotus flower make your trouble forgotten it smells so like the waters of leaf and of that fountain of youth that the conquistadors sought for in the floridas and find him all too late while he was speaking lucy had been examining the flowers and smelling them 
Now she threw them down, saying with half laughter and half disgust, Oh, Professor, I believe you are only putting up a joke on me. Why, well, these flowers are only common garlic. To my surprise, Van Helsing rose up and said with all his sternness, his iron jaw set and his bushy eyebrows meeting, No trifling with me. I never jest. There is a grim purpose in all I do, and I warn you that you do not thwart me. Take care for the sake of others, if not your own. Then seeing poor Lucy scared, as she might well be, he went on more gently. Oh, little miss, my dear, do not fear me. I only do for your good. But there is much virtue to you in those so common flowers. See, I place them myself in your room. I make myself the wreath that you are to wear. But hush, no telling to others what makes so inquisitive questions. You must obey, and silence is a part of obedience. And obedience is to bring you strong and well into loving arms that wait for you. Now sit still a while. Come with me, friend John, and you shall help me deck the room with my garlic, which is all the way from Harlem, where my friend Vanderpool lays herb in his glass houses all the year. I had to telegraph yesterday, or there would not have been here. We went into the room, taking the flowers with us. The professor's actions were certainly odd, and not to be found in any pharmacopoeia that I have ever heard of. First he fastened up the windows and latched them securely. Next, taking a handful of the flowers, he rubbed them all over the sashes, as though to ensure that every whiff of air that might get in would be laden with the garlic smell. Then, with the wisp, he rubbed all over the jamb of the door, above, below, and each side, and rounded the fireplace to do the same way. It all seemed grotesque to me, and presently I said, well, Professor, I know you always have a reason for what you do, but this certainly puzzles me. It is well we have no sceptic here, or he would say you were working some spell to keep out an evil spirit. Perhaps I am, he answered quietly, as he began to make the wreath which Lucy was to wear round her neck. We then waited, whilst Lucy made her toilet for the night, and when she was in bed he came back to himself, fixed the wreath of garlic around her neck. The last words he said to her were, Take care that you do not disturb it, and even if the room feel close, do not tonight open the window or the door. I promise, said Lucy, and thank you both a thousand times for all your kindness to me. And what have I done to be blessed by such friends? As we left the house in my fly, which was waiting, Van Helsing said, Tonight I can sleep in peace, and sleep I want. Two nights of travel much reading in the day between much anxiety on the day to follow and a night to sit up without to wink. Tomorrow in the morning early you call for me and we come together to see our pretty miss. So much more strong for my spell which I have work. Oh. He seemed so confident that I, remembering my own confidence two nights before and with the baneful result, felt awe and vague terror. It must have been my weakness that made me hesitate to tell it to my friend, but I felt it all the more, like unshed tears. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Lucy Westenra's Diary. 12th of September. How good they all are to me. I quite love that dear Dr. Van Helsing. I wonder why he was so anxious about those flowers. It positively frightened me. He was so fierce. And yet he must have been right, for I feel comfort from them already. Somehow I do not dread being alone tonight, so I can go to sleep without fear. I shall not mind any flapping outside the window. Oh, the terrible struggle that I have had against sleep so often of late. Pain of sleeplessness, or the pain of fear of sleep, with such unknown horrors as it has been for me. How blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Well, here I am tonight, hoping for sleep, 
and lying like Ophelia in the play, with virgin crants and maiden strewments. I never liked garlic before, but tonight it is delightful. There's peace in its smell. I feel sleep coming already. Good night, everybody. Dr. Seward's Diary, 13th of September. I called at the Berkeley and found Van Helsing as usual up to time. The carriage ordered from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let it all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. It was a lovely morning, and the bright sunshine and all the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like the completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colours, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Mrs. Westenmark coming out of the morning room. She is always an early riser. She greeted us warmly and said, You'll be glad to know that Lucy is better. The dear child is still asleep. I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in, lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, Aha! I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working. To which she answered, You must not take all that credit to yourself, Doctor. Lucy's state this morning was in part due to me. Well, how do you mean, ma'am? asked the Professor. Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly, so soundly that even my coming did not wake her. But the room was awfully stuffy, and all those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere. And she actually had a bunch of them round her neck. I feared that a heavy odour would be too much for the dear child in her weak state, so I took them all away and opened up a bit of the window to let in a little fresh air. You will be pleased with her, I am sure. She moved off into her boudoir, where she usually breakfasted early. As she, as she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen grey. Had he been able to retain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present, for he knew her state, and how mischievous a shock would be. He actually smiled on her as he held open the door for her to pass into her room. But the instant she had disappeared, he pulled me suddenly and forcibly into the dining room and closed the door. For the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in a sort of mute despair and beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally, he sat down on a chair and putting his hands before his face, began to sob with loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. And he raised his arms again as though appealing to the whole universe. God, 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 he said, what have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset? Is there fate amongst us still, sent down from the pagan world of old, that such things must be in such a way? The poor mother, all unknowing and for all the best, she think, does such a thing as lose her daughter, body and soul? And we must not tell her. We must not even warn her, or she die, and then both die. Oh, how we are beset. How are all the powers of the devil against us? Suddenly he jumped to his feet. Come, he said, come, we must see and act. Devils or no devils, or all the devils at once. It matters not, we fight him all the same. He went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. Once again I drew up the blind while Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time he did not start as he looked upon the poor face with the same awful waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured with that hissing inspiration of his which meant so much. Without a word he went and locked the door and began to set out the little table of instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognised the necessity, began to take off my coat, but he stopped me with a warning hand. No, he said, today you must operate, I shall provide, you are weakened already. As he spoke he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again the operation, again the narcotic, again some return of colour to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched while Van Helsing recruited himself and rested. Presently he took an opportunity of telling Mrs. Weston that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him, that the flowers were of a medicinal value and that the breathing of their odour was part of the system of cure. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next and would send me word when to come. 
After another hour, Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright, and seemingly not the much worse for her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean, I'm beginning to wonder, if my long habit of the life amongst the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain? Lucy Westenra's Diary 17th of September Four days and nights of peace. I am getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It's as if I had passed through some long nightmare and had just awakened to see the beautiful sunshine and feel the fresh air of the morning around me. I have a dim half-remembrance of long anxious times, of waiting and fearing darkness, in which it was not even the pain of hope to make present distress more poignant. And then long spells of oblivion, the rising back to the life as a diver coming up through a great press of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to frighten me out of my wits, the flapping against the windows, and the distant voices which seemed so close to me, the harsh sounds that came from I know not where, and commanded me to do I know not what. All have ceased. I go to bed now without any fear of sleep. I do not even try to keep awake. I've grown quite fond of the garlic, and a box full arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight Dr. Van Helsing is going away, and he has to be for a day in Amsterdam. And I need not be watchful. I am well enough to be left alone. Thank God for Mother's sake and dear Arthur's, and for all our friends who have been so kind. I shall not even feel the change, for last night Dr. Van Helsing slept in his chair a lot of the time. I found him asleep twice when I awoke, but I did not fear to go to sleep again although the boughs or bats or something flapped most angrily against the window panes. The Pall Mall Gazette, 18th of September. The Escaped Wolf. Perilous adventure of our interviewer. Interview with the keeper in the zoological gardens. After many inquiries and almost as many refusals, perpetually using the words Pall Mall Gazette as a sort of talisman, I managed to find the keeper of the section of the zoological gardens in which the wolf department is included. Thomas Builder lives in one of the cottages in the enclosure behind the elephant house. I was just sitting down to his tea when I found him. Thomas and his wife are hospitable folk, elderly and without children, and if the specimen I enjoyed of their hospitality be of the average kind, their lives must be pretty comfortable. The keeper would not enter on what he called business till supper was over and we were all satisfied. And when the table was cleared and he had lit his pipe, he said, Now, sir, you don't ask me what you want. You'll excuse me refusing to talk of professional subjects for meals. I give the wolves and the jackals and the hyenas all of our section of tea before I begin to ask some questions. How do you mean, ask some questions? I queried, wishful to get him into a talkative humour. Hitting them over the head with a pole is one way. Scratching their ears is another. When gents is flush and wants a bit of a show-off to their gals, I don't mind so much at the first. And it's eating with a pole before I chucks in their dinner. But I wait till they've had their sherry and coffee, so to speak, before I tries it on with the ear scratching. Mind you, he added philosophically, there's a deal of the same in nature as there's in them their animals. Here's you a-coming and asking me questions about my business, and I, that grumpy, like that only for your blooming half a quid, I'd seen you blowed first, for I'd answer, not even when you asked me sarcastic, like if I'd like to ask the superintendent if you might ask me questions. Without offence, I did tell you to go to hell. You did, and when you said you'd report me for you using obscene language, that was hitting me over the head, but the half quid made that all right. I weren't a going to fight, so I waited for the food and did with my owl, as the wolves and lions and tigers does. But Lord love you, aren't now that old woman has stuck a chunk of her tea cake in me and rinsed me out with her blooming old teapot. I've lit up, you may scratch my ears for all you're worth, and you won't even get a growl out of me. Drive along with your questions. I know where you're coming at, that ear escape wolf. Exactly, I want you to give him your view of it. Just tell me how it happened. And when I know the facts, I'll get you to say what you consider was the cause of it. And how do you think the whole affair will end? All right, Governor. This is here is about to be the whole story, that their wolf is what we call Bersica. He was one of three grey ones that come from Norway to Jamrax. 
which we bought him off four years ago. He was a nice, well-behaved wolf that never gave no trouble to talk of. I'm more surprised at him for wanting to get out or any other animal in the place. But there, you can't trust wolves no more nor women. Don't you mind him, sir, broke in Mrs. Tom with a cheery laugh. He's got mind the animal so long that blessed if he ain't like an old wolf itself. But there ain't no harm in him. Well, sir, I was about two hours after feeding yesterday when I first heard my disturbance. I was making up a litter in the monkey house for a young puma, which is ill. When I heard the yelping and howling, I came away straight. There was a bear sicker a tearing like a mad thing at the bars, as if he wanted to get out. There wasn't much people about that day, and close at hand was only one man. A tall, thin chap with a hooked nose and a pointed beard with a few white hairs running through it. He had a hard, cold look and red eyes. I took a sort of mislike to him, for it seemed as if it was him as that was irritated at. He had white kid gloves on his hands, and he had pointed at the animals to me and says, Keeper, these wolves seem to be upset at something. Maybe it's you, says I, for I did not like the airs he gave himself. He didn't get angry, as I hoped he would, but he smiled, a kind of insolent smile, with a mouth full of white sharp teeth. Oh no, they wouldn't like me, he says. Oh yes, they would, says I, in an imitation of him. They always likes a bone or two to clean their teeth with about tea time, which you has a bag full. Well, it was an odd thing, but when the animal sees us talking, they lay down, and when I went over to Bersica, he let me stroke his ears, same as ever. That there man come over and blessed if he didn't put his hand and stroke the old wolf's ears too. Take care, says I, Bersica is quick. Never mind, he says, I'm used to him. Are you in the business yourself, says I, taking off me hat for a man what trades in wolves and etc. is a good friend to keep us. No, says he, not exactly in the business, but I have made pets of several. And that he lifts his hat as polite as a lord and walks away. Old Bursica kept a looking after him till he was out of sight and went and lay down in a corner and wouldn't come about the whole evening. Well, last night, as soon as the moon was up, the wolves here all began howling. There was nothing for them to howl at and there was no one near except some someone that was evidently a-calling, the dog somewhere out in the back of the gardings in the park road. Once or twice I went up to see that all was all right and it was. Then the howling stopped just before 12 o'clock. I just took a look around before turning in, bust me. When I came opposite to old Bersica's cage, I could see the rails broken and twisted about and the cage empty. And that's all I know for certain. Did anyone else see anything? One of our gardeners was a coming home about that time from Armony when he sees a big grey dog coming out through the garden edges. At least so he says, but I don't give it for myself. Or well, if he did, he never said a word about it to his missus when he got home. It was only after the escape of the wolf where it was made known. We'd all been up all night a hunting of the park for Bersica, and he remembered seeing anything. My own belief was that the harmony had got into his head. Now, Mr Builder, can you account for any way for the escape of the wolf? Well, sir, he said with a suspicious sort of modesty. I think I can, but I don't know as how you'd be satisfied with the theory. Certainly I shall, if a man like you who knows the animals from experience... Can't hazard a good guess at any rate. Who is even to try? Well then, sir, I can't for it this way. It seems to me that that here wolf escaped simply because he wanted to get out. From the hearty way that both Thomas and his wife laughed at the joke, I could see that it had done service before, that the whole explanation was simply an elaborate sell. I couldn't cope in bandinage with a worthy Thomas, but I thought I knew a surer way to his heart, so I said, now, Mr. Builder, we'll consider that first half-sovereign worked off, and this brother of his is waiting to be claimed upon when you told me what you think will happen. What you are, sir, he said briskly. Oh, you excuse me, I know for a chaffing of ye, but the old woman here winked at me, which was as much as telling me to go on. Well, I never, said the old lady. My opinion is this, that that here wolf is a hiding somewheres. The gardener, what didn't remember, said he was at a galloping northward faster than a horse could go. But I don't believe it. But you see, sir, wolves don't gallop no more than dogs does. They're not being built that way. Wolves is fine things in a storybook. I dare say when they get in packs, 
It does be chivvy and something. It's more a fear than they is. They can make a devil of a noise and chop it up, whatever it is. But Lord bless you, in real life a wolf is only a low creature. Not half so clever or so bold as a good dog. And not half a quarter so much a fight in him. This one ain't been used for fighting, nor even to provide him for himself. And more like he's somewhere around the park a hiding and shivering of, if he thinks at all, wondering where he is going to get his next breakfast from. Or maybe he's got down some area as in a coal cellar. My eye won't some cook get a rum start when she sees his green eyes a shining at her out of the dark. If he can't get food, he's bound to look for it. And mayhap he may chance to light upon a butcher in time. If he doesn't and some nursemaid goes a walking off with a soldier, leaving of the infant in the perambulator, well, I shouldn't be surprised if the census is one babby the less. That's all. I was handing him the half sovereign when something came bobbing up against the window and Mr. Builder's face doubled its natural length with surprise. Well, God bless me, he said. If there ain't old Berserker come back by himself. He went to the door and opened it. A most unnecessary proceeding, it seemed to me. I've always thought that a wild animal never looks so well as when some obstacle of pronounced durability is between us. A personal experience has intensified rather than diminish that idea. After all, however, there is nothing like a custom, for neither Builder nor his wife thought any more of the wolf than I should of a dog. The animal itself was peaceful and well-behaved, as that father of all pictured wolves, Red Riding Hood's quondam friend, whilst moving her confidence in masquerade. The whole scene was an unutterable mixture of comedy and pathos. The wicked wolf for that half day had paralysed London and set all the children of the town shivering in their shoes. Was there in a sort of penitent mood and was received and petted like a sort of vulpine prodigal son? Old Builder examined him all over with the most tender solicitude and when he had finished with his penitent said, There, I knew the poor old chap would get into some kind of trouble. Didn't I say it all along? Here his head's all cut and full of broken glass. He's been a-getting over some blooming wall or other. It's a shame that people are allowed to tap their walls with broken bottles. This here's what comes of it. Come on, Berserker. He took the wolf and locked him up in a cage, with a piece of meat that satisfied in quantity, at any rate, the elementary conditions of the fatted calf, and went off to report. I came off, too, to report the only exclusive information that is given today regarding the strange escapade at the zoo. Dr. Seward's Diary, 17th of September. I was engaged after dinner in my study, posting up my books, which, through press of other work and the many visits to Lucy, had fallen sadly into arrear. Suddenly the door was burst open and in rushed my patient, with his face distorted with passion. I was thunderstruck. Such a thing as a patient, getting of his own accord into the superintendent's study, is almost unknown. Without an instant's pause, he made straight at me. He had a dinner knife in his hand, and as I saw he was dangerous, I tried to keep the table between us. He was too quick, too strong for me. However, before I could get my balance, he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. Before he could strike again, however, I got in my right and he was sprawling on his back on the floor. My wrist bled fiercely, and quite a little pool trickled onto the carpet. I saw that my friend was not intent on further effort and occupied myself binding up my wrist, keeping a wary eye on the prostrate figure all the time. When the attendants rushed in and we turned our attention to him, his employment positively sickened me. He was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up like a dog, the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured and, to my surprise, went with the attendants quite placidly simply repeating over and over again, The blood is the life. The blood is the life. I cannot afford to lose blood just at present. I have lost too much of it for my physical good. But then the prolonged strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible face is telling even on me. I'm overexcited and weary, and I need rest. Rest, rest. Happily Van Helsing has not summoned me so I need not forgo my sleep tonight. 
I could not well do without it. Telegram, Van Helsing, Antwerp to Seward, Carfax. Sent to Carfax, Sussex, as no county given. Delivered late by 22 hours. 17th of December. Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight, if not watching all the time frequently. Visit and see that flowers are placed. Very important. Do not fail. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Dr. Seward's Diary, 18th of September. Just off for train to London, the arrival of Van Helsing's telegram filled me with dismay. A whole night lost, and I knew by bitter experience what might happen in the night. Of course it is possible that all may be well, but what may have happened? Surely there is some horrible doom hanging over us. Every possible accident should thwart us in all we try to do. I shall take this cylinder with me, and then I can complete my entry on Lucy's phonograph. Memorandum left by Lucy Westenra. 17th of September, night. I write this and leave it to be seen, so that no one may by any chances get into trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I am dying of weakness and have barely strength to write, but it must be done if I die in the doing. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the flowers were placed as Dr. Van Helsing directed, and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which had begun after that sleep walking on the cliff at Whitby when Mina saved me, and which now I know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, and Dr. Van Helsing said he would be, so that I might have called him. I tried to go to sleep, but could not. Then there came to me the old fear of sleep, and I determined to keep awake. Perversely, sleep would try to come then when I did not want it to. So, as I feared to be alone, I opened my door and called out, Is there anybody there? There was no answer. I was afraid to wake Mother and closed my door again. Then, outside in the shrubbery, I heard the sort of howl like a dog's, but more fierce and deeper. I went to the window and looked out and could see nothing except a big bat, which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. So I went back to bed again, but determined not to go to sleep. Presently the door opened and Mother looked in. Seeing my moving that I was not asleep, came in and sat by me. She said to me even more sweetly and softly than her wont, I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were all right. I feared she might catch cold sitting there, so I asked her to come and sleep with me. So she came into bed and lay down beside me. She did not take off her dressing gown, for she said she would only stay a while and then go back to her own bed. As she lay there in my arms, and I in hers, the flapping and buffeting came to the window again. She was startled and a little frightened, and cried out, What is that? I tried to pacify her, and at last succeeded, and she lay quiet. I could hear her poor dear heart still beating terribly. After a while there was a low howl again out in the shrubbery, and shortly after that there was a crash at the window, and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window blind drew back, and the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes there was a head of a gaunt grey wolf. Mother cried out in fright and struggled up into a sitting posture, clutched wildly at anything that would help her. Amongst other things, she clutched at the wreath of flowers that Van Helsing had insisted my wearing round my neck, tore it away from me. For a second or two, she sat up, pointing at the wolf, and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat, and she fell over, as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. The room and all around seemed to spin round. I kept my eyes fixed on the window, but the wolf drew his head back, and a whole myriad of little specks seemed to come blowing in through the broken window, wheeling and circling round like a pillar of dust, when there is a sign moon in the desert. I tried to stir, but there was some spell upon me, and dear mother's poor body, which seemed to grow cold already, for her dear heart had ceased to beat, weighted me down. And I remembered no more for a while. The time did not seem long, but very, very awful, till I recovered consciousness again. Somewhere near a passing bell was tolling. The dogs all round the neighbourhood were howling. And in our shrubbery, seemingly just outside, 
a nightingale was singing. I was dazed and stupid with pain and terror and weakness. The sound of the nightingale seemed like the voice of my dead mother, come back to comfort me. The sound seems to awaken the maids too. I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them and they came in. When they saw what had happened and what it was that lay over me on the bed, they screamed out. The wind rushed in through the broken window and the door slammed too. They lifted off the body of my dear mother and laid her covered up with a sheet on the bed after I had got up. They were all so frightened and nervous that I directed them to go to the dining room and each have a glass of wine. The door flew open for an instant and closed again. The maid shrieked and then went in a body to the dining room. As I laid what flowers I had on my dear mother's breast, when they were there I remembered what Dr Van Helsing had told me, but I didn't like to remove them, and besides I would have some of the servants to sit up with me now. I was surprised that the maids had not come back. I called them but got no answer, so I went to the dining room to look for them. My heart sunk when I saw what had happened. All four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer acrid smell about it. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelt of laudanum, and looking on the sideboard, I found the bottle which Mother's doctor uses for her, or did use, was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I'm back in the room with Mother. I cannot leave her, and I'm alone, save for the sleeping servants whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead, I dare not go out now, for I can hear the low howl of the wolf through the broken window. The air seems full of specks floating and circling from the draught from the window, and the lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God shield me from harm this night. I shall hide this paper in my breast where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother gone, it is time that I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur. If I should not survive this night, God keep you and God help me. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. Dr. Seward's Diary, 18th of September. I drove at once to Hillingham and arrived early, keeping my cab at the gate. I went up to the avenue alone. I knocked gently and rang as quietly as possible, for I feared to disturb Lucy or her mother and hoped to only bring a servant to the door. After a while, finding no response, I knocked and rang again. Still no answer. I cursed the laziness of the servants, that they should lie abed at such an hour, for it was now ten o'clock, and so rang and knocked again, but more impatiently, but still without response. Hitherto I blamed only the servants, but now a terrible fear began to assail me. Was this a desolation, another link in the chain of doom, which seemed to be drawing tight around us? Was it indeed a house of death to which I had come too late? I knew the minutes, even seconds, of delay might mean hours of danger to Lucy, if she had again one of those frightful relapses, and I went round the house to try if I could find by chance an entry anywhere. I could find no means of ingress, every window and door was fastened and locked, and I returned baffled to the porch. As I did so, I heard the rapid pit pat of a swiftly driven horse's feet. They stopped at the gate and a few seconds later I met Van Helsing running up the avenue. When he saw me he gasped out. It was you. I just arrived. How is she? Are we too late? Did she not get my telegram? I answered as quickly and coherently as I could that I'd only got his telegram early in the morning and had not lost a minute in coming here and that I could not make anyone in the house hear me. He paused and raised his hat as he said solemnly, And I fear we are too late. God's will be done. With his usual recuperative energy, he went on, If there be no way to open to get in, we must make one. Time is all in all to us now. 
We went round to the back of the house, where there was a kitchen window. The Professor took a small surgical saw from his case, and handing it to him, he pointed to the iron bars which guarded the window. I attacked them at once, and had very soon cut through three of them. Then, with a long, thin knife, we pushed back the fastening of the sashes, and opened the window. I helped the Professor in, and followed him. There was no one in the kitchen, or in the servants' rooms which were close at hand. We tried all the rooms as we went along, and in the dining room, dimly lit by rays of light through the shutters, found four servant women lying on the floor. There was no need to think them dead, for the stertorous breathing and the acrid smell of laudanum in the room left no doubt as to their condition. Van Helsing and I looked at each other as we moved away. He said, can we attend to them later? Then we ascended to Lucy's room. For an instant or two we paused at the door to listen, but there was no sound that we could hear. With white faces and trembling hands, we opened the door gently and entered the room. How shall I describe what we saw? On the bed lay two women, Lucy and her mother. The latter lay furthest in, and she was covered with a white sheet the edge of which had been blown back by the draught through the broken window, showing the drawn white face with a look of terror fixed upon it. By her side lay Lucy, with a face white and still more drawn. The flowers which had been round her neck we found upon her mother's bosom, and her throat was bare, showing the two little wounds which we had noticed before, but looking horribly white and mangled. Without a word, the Professor bent over the bed, his head almost touching poor Lucy's breast, and he gave a quick turn of his head, as of one who listens, and leaping to his feet, cried out to me, It's not yet too late. Quick, quick, bring the brandy. I flew downstairs and returned with it, taking care to smell and taste it, lest it too were drugged like the decanter of sherry, which I found on the table. The maids were still breathing, but more restlessly. I fancied that the narcotic was wearing off. I did not stay to make sure, but returned to Van Helsing. He rubbed the brandy as on other occasions on her lips, on her gums and her wrists to the palms of her hands. He said to me, I can do this all that can be at the present. You go and wake those maids, flick them in the face with a wet towel and flick them hard. Make them get heat and fire and warm bath. The poor soul is nearly as cold as that beside her. She will need to be heated before we can do anything more. I went at once and found little difficulty in waking three of the women. The fourth was only a young girl, and the drug had evidently affected her more strongly. So I lifted her off the sofa and let her sleep. The others were dazed at first, but as remembrance came back to them, they cried and sobbed in a hysterical manner. I was stern with them, however, and would not let them talk. I told them that one life was bad enough to lose, that if they delayed, they would sacrifice Miss Lucy. But sobbing and crying, they went about their way, half clad as they were, and prepared to fire and water. Fortunately, the kitchen and boiler fires were still alive. There was no lack of hot water. We got a bath and carried Lucy out as she was and placed her in it. While we were busy chafing her limbs, there was a knock at the hall door. One of the maids ran off, hurried on some more clothes and opened it. Then she returned and whispered to us, there was a gentleman who had come with a message from Mr Holmwood. I bade her simply tell him that he must wait, for we could see no one now. She went away with the message and engrossed with her work, I clean forgot all about him. I never saw in all my experience a professor work in such a deadly earnest. I knew, as he knew, that it was a stand-up fight with death, and in a pause told him so. He answered me in a way which I did not understand with the sternest look that his face could wear. If that were all, I would stop here where we are now and let her fade away into peace, for I see no light in life over her horizon. He went on with his work with, if possible, renewed and more frenzied vigour. Presently, we both began to be conscious that the heat was beginning to have some effect. Lucy's heart beat a trifle more audibly to the stethoscope and her lungs had a perceptible movement. Van Helsing's face almost beamed, 
as we lifted her from the bath and rolled her in a hot sheet to dry her. He said to me, the first gain is ours, check to the king. He took Lucy into another room which by now had been prepared and laid her in bed and forced a few drops of brandy down her throat. I noticed that Van Helsing tied a soft silk handkerchief round her throat. She was still unconscious and was still quite as bad as, if not worse than, we had ever seen her. Van Helsing called in one of the women and told her to stay with her and not to take her eyes off her until we returned, and then beckoned me out of the room. We must consult as to what is to be done, he said as we descended the stairs. In the hall, he opened the dining room door and we passed in. He closed the door carefully behind him. The shutters had been opened, but the blinds were already drawn with that obedience to the etiquette of death which British women of the lower classes always rigidly observes. The room was therefore dimly dark. It was, however, light enough for our purposes, and Helsing's sternness was somewhat relieved by a look of perplexity. He was evidently torturing his mind about something, so I waited for an instant and he spoke. What are we to do now? Where are we to turn for help? We must have another transfusion of blood, and that soon, or the poor girl's life won't be worth an hour's purchase. You're exhausted. I'm exhausted too. I fear to trust these women, even if they would have courage to submit. What are we to do for someone who will open his veins for us? What's the matter with me, anyhow? The voice came from the sofa across the room, and its tones brought relief and joy to my heart for they were those of Quincy Morris. Van Helsing startled angrily at the first sound, but his face softened and a glad look came into his eyes. I cried out, Quincy Morris, and rushed towards him with outstretched hands. What brought you here, I cried as our hands met. I guess art is the cause. He handed me a telegram. Have not heard from Seward for three days, and am terribly anxious. Cannot leave. Father's still in same condition. Send me word how Lucy is. Do not delay. Homeward. I think I came just in the nick of time. You know, you only have to tell me what to do. Van Helsing strode forward and took his hand, looking at him straight in the eyes as he said, A brave man's blood is the best thing on this earth when a woman is in trouble. You're a man and no mistake. Well, the devil may work against us, but for all he's worth, God sends us men when we want them. Once again, we went through that ghastly operation. I've not the heart to go through with the details. Lucy had got a terrible shock, and it told on her more than before. Although plenty of blood went into her veins, her body did not respond to the treatment as well as on other occasions. Her struggle back into life was something frightful to see and hear. However, the action of both heart and lungs improved. And Van Helsing made a subcutaneous injection of morphia, as before, and with good effect. Her faint became a profound slumber. The professor watched whilst I went downstairs with Quincy Morris, and sent one of the maids to pay off one of the cabmen who were waiting. I left Quincy lying down after having a glass of wine, and told the cook to get ready a good breakfast. Then a thought struck me and I went back into the room where Lucy now was. When I came softly in, I found Van Helsing with a sheet or two of notepaper in his hand. He'd evidently read it and was thinking it over as he sat with his hand to his brow. There was a look of grim satisfaction in his face, as of one who had had a doubt solved. He handed me the paper and saying only, it dropped from Lucy's breast when we carried her to the bath. When I had read it, I stood looking at the professor, and after a pause asked him, God's name, what does all this mean? Was she, or is she mad, or what sort of horrible danger is it? I was so bewildered that I did not know what to say more. Van Helsing put in his hand and took the paper, saying, Do not trouble about it now. Forget it for the present. You shall know and understand it all in good time, but it will be later. And now, what is it that you came to me to say? This brought me back to fact, and I was all myself again. I came to speak about the certificate of death. 
If we do not act properly and wisely, there may be an inquest, and that paper would have to be produced. I am in hopes that we need have no inquest, for if we had, it would surely kill poor Lucy, if nothing else did. I know, and you know, that and the other doctor who attended her knows, that Mrs. Westenra had disease of the heart, and we can certify that she died of it. Let us put up the certificate at once, and I shall take it myself to the registrar and go on to the undertaker. Good, oh, my friend John, well thought of. Truly, Miss Lucy, if she be sad in the foes that beset her, is at least happy in the friends that love her. One, two, three, all open their veins for her. Besides, one old man, Ah, yes, I know, friend John, I'm not blind. I love you all the more for it. Now go. In the hall I met Quincy Morris with a telegram for Arthur, telling him that Mr. Weston Ra was dead, and that Lucy also had been ill, but was now getting on better. And that Van Helsing and I were with her. I told him where I was going, and hurried me out, but as I was going, said, When you come back, Jack, I may have two words with you, or to ourselves. I nodded in reply and went out. I found no difficulty about the registration and arranged with the local undertaker to come up in the evening to measure for the coffin and make arrangements. When I got back, Quincy was waiting for me. I told him I would see him as soon as I knew about Lucy. I went up to her room. She was still sleeping and the professor seemingly had not moved from his seat at her side. From his putting his finger to his lips, I gathered he expected her to wake before long and was afraid of forestalling nature. So I went down to Quincy and took him into the breakfast room where the blinds were not drawn down and which was a little more cheerful or rather less cheerless than the other rooms. When we were alone, he said to me, Jack Seward, I don't want to shove myself in anywhere where I ain't no right to be. But this is no ordinary case. You know that I love that girl, and I wanted to marry her. But although that's all past and gone, I can't help feeling anxious about her all the same. What is it that's wrong with her? The Dutchman, and a fine old fellow he is, I can see that, said the time you two came in the room that you must have another transfusion of blood. And you, both you and he were exhausted. And I know well off that you medical men speak in camera and that a man must not expect to know what they consult about in private. But this is no common matter, and whatever it is, I've done my part. Is that not so? That is so, I said, and he went on. I take it that both you and Van Helsing have done already what I did today. Is that not so? That's so. And I guess Art was in it too. When I saw him four days ago down at his own place, he looked queer. I've not seen anything pulled down so quick. Since I was on the pampas and had a mare that I was fond of go grass and all in a night. One of those big bats they call vampires who had got at her in the night. And what with his gorge and all the veins left open, there wasn't enough blood in her to let her stand up. I had to put a bullet through her as she lay. Jack, if you may tell me without betraying confidence, Arthur was the first. Is that not so? As he spoke, the poor fellow looked terribly anxious. He was in a torture of suspense regarding the woman he loved, and his utter ignorance of the terrible mystery which seemed to surround her intensified his pain. His very heart was bleeding, and it took all the manhood of him, and there was a royal lot of it too, to keep him from breaking down. I paused before answering, for I felt that I must not betray anything which the Professor wished kept secret. But already he knew so much and guessed so much, there could be no reason for not answering, so I answered in the same phrase. That's so. And how long has this been going on? About ten days. Ten days. Then I guess Jack Seward and that poor pretty creature that we all love has had put into her veins within that time the blood of four strong men. Man alive, a whole body wouldn't hold it. Then coming close to me, he spoke in a fierce half-whisper. What took it out? I shook my head. That, I said, is the crux. Van Helsing is simply frantic about it, and I am at my wit's end. I can't even hazard a guess. There's been a series of little circumstances which have thrown out all our calculations as to Lucy being 
properly watched. But these shall not occur again. Here we stay until all be well or ill. Quincy held out his hand. Count me in, he said. You and the Dutchman will tell me what to do, and I'll do it. When she woke late in the afternoon, Lucy's first movement was to feel in her breast, and to my surprise, produce the paper which Van Helsing had given me to read. The careful professor had replaced it where it had come from. Lest on waking she should be alarmed, her eye then lit on Van Helsing, and on me too, and gladly. And she gave a look around the room, and seeing where she was, shuddered. She gave a loud cry and put her poor thin hands before her pale face. We both understood what that meant, that she had realised to the full her mother's death. So we tried what we could to comfort her. Doubtless sympathy had eased her somewhat, but she was very low in thought and spirit, and wept silently and weakly for a long time. We told her that either or both of us would now remain with her all the time. And that seemed to comfort her. Towards dusk she fell into a doze. Here a very odd thing occurred. Whilst still asleep she took the paper from her breast and tore it in two. Van Helsing stepped over and took the pieces from her. At the same time, however, she went on with the action of tearing, as though the material was still in her hands. Finally she lifted her hands and opened them as though scattering the fragments.